Okay, so I think we are we are ready to start. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this joint uh, patients and consumer working party and healthcare professionals working party joint meeting. Um, thank you very much for your contribution over the last two days. It has uh, been very, very useful for us, and I hope it also was a useful discussion for everyone. I think um, the feedback we are receiving so far is that it, it has been indeed a, a useful discussion, and uh, we are happy for that because it's something that we have put a lot of effort. So uh, <clears throat> um, maybe before we openly we, we open the meeting, we need to, to go through the health and safety uh, uh, warnings and uh, most of you have already seen the, the slideshow and the, the, um, the announcement on that there was the slide that was on the screen. Uh, so thanks to play attention to the specific eva evacuation plan from this door, from this floor. Um, also maybe just uh, housekeeping notes, uh, we remind everyone that you have to sign the reimbursement uh, attendance sheet, otherwise it's not possible to process. Um, and as you know, I think you are familiarized, but we are using WebEx. We have half of the, part a, a bit over the, the participation is physically present here, but around 29, 30 people are connected online. Um, so we try as much as possible to make uh, participation as interactive, and I think has been quite successful in previous cases. So we encourage colleagues, of course, you can use the chat, but we encourage as much as possible to intervene and to speak. And for those who are online, we encourage as much as possible that you use your camera. And uh, I think it's, it's much more interactive and we put all participants at the same level. Um, so you can raise your button, you can raise your hand, and we will be giving you the floor uh, equally as to compare to the participants in the room. Um, for those who are in the room, please, when you speak, use the microphone, otherwise the people online cannot hear you. We will record as usual the meeting, but this is just for, uh, for summary purposes and to ensure that we have a good record of discussions. And we will publish all the presentations afterwards on the website so that everyone has access to them. And I think without any delay, we proceed to adopt the agenda. So I would like to ask whether there is any additional topic that anyone would like to, uh, to add. If not, we consider the agenda closed. And um, I think it's my pleasure because I think it's the first time that we can welcome both co-chairs of the PCWP and the healthcare professionals. We have Rosa with us, but uh, it's the first time that we have Marco uh, co-chairing with us and um, uh, we, are, we are very happy that we managed to nominate and have everything in place for this new mandate. Um, before I give the floor to them, just uh, to welcome uh, our new member of the team. You may be aware that uh, Kaisa has now joined EMA and is going to be working with us. So we are very, very happy to have Kaisa with us. I'm sure you are also happy that we will continue collaborating with her in a different manner. Kaisa will be supporting interaction with healthcare professionals, but also interaction across a joint interaction patient healthcare professionals in many activities. And um, so I'm sure you welcome that as well. Uh, yeah, and as a consequence of that, uh, Kaisa was the PCWP observer in the healthcare professional working party. So uh, this is now vacant and uh, maybe what we will ask, and we will add this to the post-meeting notes, we will, we will ask a volunteer of the PCWP to become observers to the healthcare professional working party. So uh, anyone who would like to express their interest, please let us know. We will make a note in the post-meeting. Yeah. Excellent. And, and then finally, you, we have also put um, some extra copies. We managed to get some extra copies of the SIOMS guidance on patient engagement that uh, last time we brought, and I think uh, there, there were some colleagues that uh, were asking for additional copies. So we have put some additional copies and you are free to take one. And even if you want to take some and disseminate within your organizations, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, and I think with this, 
I'm going to give the floor to Marco and Rosa to give uh, preliminary remarks before we start uh, the agenda. So please, maybe Marco. So thank you very much. Um, please bear with me as it, this is the first time, but thank you for your trust in, in my co-chair abilities. And I'm looking forward to this day. So I warmly welcome everybody that uh, took the opportunity to be here in person. I'm looking forward to chat chatting with you also during the breaks. And a warm welcome to everybody who is with us online. So our expectations for this meeting today are very high because we had two days of extremely important uh, uh, meeting with, with a lot of ideas. So we are looking forward to, to repeat that kind of a process today. Thank you very much. Finally, I'm not alone anymore. Yeah, welcome, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's um, it's a pleasure uh, to me also to be uh, here and to, to have all of us together in the same room. And of course, uh, welcome to uh, colleagues that are following online. I think that uh, the experience that we had uh, in the past two days with the meeting, the hybrid meeting, uh, the hybrid workshop showed that uh, we can balance to have a um, good interaction between the uh, who is following online and who is in the room so i do not uh, need to encourage anybody because this is a very uh, lively group but uh, this is our time to speak up uh, make comments provide feedback uh, there is a very rich uh, um, agenda and i suggest that we just uh, start with it thank you very much Rosa and Marco, and uh, yeah, we will. We have divided the agenda, and uh, we will. I will start sharing the first part, and um, and this follows a request and some discussion we have had. Uh, you you may be aware that um, uh, there has been some reorganization of the way that the EMA working parties are functioning, and um, this is expected to really address better the the, the current needs in the in the uh, and 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 to be a bit more efficient. And this follows also uh, after COVID where uh, many of the activities of the working party and many of, for example, guidance, et cetera, were, let's say, um, deprioritized in order to, to mobilize resources for more critical activities. So I think it's very timely to give uh, you an overview of how this reorganization has been proposed, how this is going to be working, and also explore uh, more elements of visibility and getting access to what's going on in terms of uh, the activities of the working parties, but also how patients and healthcare professionals and stakeholders in general can contribute to the work of the different uh, working parties. So um, we have with us uh, the key colleagues working on, on key working parties and also on the overall organization. And it's my pleasure first to, to welcome Alberto Gagnan, Alberto uh, is the Head of Committees and Quality Assurance Department at EMA, and he will be giving uh, first an introduction, and then afterwards we'll go to, to other colleagues which will present a specific working parties. So I understand we have Alberto online. Welcome, Alberto. Uh, hello, good morning. Thanks, Juan. Good morning, everybody. So uh, I'm going to introduce the new working party model that uh, have been established in the European Medicines Agency in the last two years. So if we go to the next slide. This, yeah. So in this introduction, I'm going to provide uh, a background on the, the basis to reorganize our working party model. I'm going to explain this new model, and I'm going also to to give um, an explanation of how all the experts of the European Union and is uh, are interlinked together, and how is the the interaction with the existing functions that we have for training on on our network. So if we go to the next slide. In, in the last two years, the European Medicines Agency has revised the working party, how they are run and how they are structured. And uh, this comes from some recommendations provided by our management board, who proposed to have a new strategic oversight of our working parties model which uh, is uh, mainly based on five domains, uh, which are the quality, non-clinical, methodology, clinical and veterinary domains, which are the main uh, governance structure of, uh, of the model. 
these uh, domains are heavily supported by the chairs of the working parties, chairs of uh, SACs, which I will explain shortly, and uh, also with a very active role as well of the chairs of the of the um, uh, committees, the CHMP, the CBMP, and also the scientific advice working party as supportive structure. They, these working parties received the direction from these uh, committees and the scientific advice working party. And if we go to the next slide, the model is mainly based on the, the preparation of uh, strategic plans provided on a three year rolling basis, which are prepared at domain level, which uh, are closely linked with uh, the strategy of the European Medic Medicines Regulatory Network and also the, our regulatory science strategy, so that we have a full alignment of the overall strategy into the, the operational and tactical and strategic um, uh, role of the working parties. So the, the work plans should also not only cover the work that the working parties are doing, but also uh, embed the unstructured offering of training and uh, stakeholder engagement at the domain level in line with these priorities and in line with this working plan. So this system not only coordinates the work, but also how the network is going to be trained and how there is going to be an, a formal engagement with uh, st stakeholders on an, a structured manner so that we can better embed the input from, from stakeholders, not only at operational level, but also at a strategic level. If we can go to the next slide. What are the main benefits of this new model? Uh, as I mentioned, one of the main changes is the, the new domain governance, which is designed to deliver uh, strategic, tactical and operational goals that uh, are mainly based at the domain level, but are also later translated to yearly work, uh, work plans for the working parties. It is a system that is agile and uh, future proofed because it's a system that is mainly based on expertise, but allows flexibility to adapt uh, the working party models and creation of new structures linked to the evolution of uh, science, new methodologies and uh, development of products or any new emerging scientific or regulatory needs. Uh, it also uh, wants to have a structured way of uh, managing interactions with relevant stakeholders, mainly industry, uh, learning societies, universities, and uh, wants to include and make the best use of, uh, of uh, expertise through integrating all the European experts in the different disciplines on a domain in what we call the ESEX, the European Specialized Expert Communities, where we can have an optimal flow of information on the on and the management of knowledge through training and through through dissemination of, of information. I will further explain more details in, in the next slides of this concept. So what is the, the new structure of, the, of this working party operational model? If we go to the next slide, these five domains that uh, I explained uh, lay from the CHMP with also quite uh, active input of the scientific advice working party or the CBMP uh, committees. Uh, both committees also have an interaction and in order to ensure alignment on priorities or by the scientific coordination board, which is a group that uh, includes all head of committees of the European Medicines Agency and have regular meetings. And uh, these five domains, as I mentioned, are based on the experts that belong to the European specialized expert communities. If we go to the next slide, the architecture of the new model is uh, based on different types of, uh, of working parties. As I mentioned, we have the, the domain, which is mainly linked to governance. We have uh, 
one type of uh, of work working parties which are called the operational expert groups which uh, i will further provide details afterwards but the, their main wor work will be on on product related uh, matters so this uh, structure of operational expert groups are temporary groups that uh, will have to to address certain product related matters the the model is mainly sustained by the working parties which uh, really are the responsible for for uh, drafting guidelines uh, and also to to constitute certain groups that are called drafting groups which are mainly uh, structures that will be working on a specific guideline and as i mentioned the they are all substantiated from the communities where the training and knowledge uh, setting is uh, taking place which are the the sx so if we go to the next slide the working parties are based on the principle on the best expertise available expertise and expertise that have a commitment to work on the the, the working party so are mainly experts with high profile with proven uh, expertise and experience in, in beyond the regulatory work and that uh, really have the, the time to work in in the delivery of the working party plan the nomination of members of the working parties uh, are mainly based on the needs that are required for for the working party and they are appointed by the committee members so there is a, a review of membership on a routine basis and uh, the working parties uh, uh, are chaired by by the chair of the working parties who have uh, a key role in the domain governance because they are the the ones responsible to drive the strategic component of the working party and they are the the liaison with uh, any engagement with uh, stakeholders industry or 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 with the, the network if we go to the next slide operational expert groups are uh, mainly uh, temporary expert groups that provide scientific advice mainly on operational core business they are normally constituted on an as needed basis and they are uh, appointed by the EMA committees or the scientific advice working party upon request this uh, you may know the, the in the in the clinical domain you may have heard about this the sac the scientific advisory group so scientific advisory group will be are part of these operational expert groups they are groups that uh, normally address certain questions certain scientific questions that are provided by chmp scientific advice working party or uh, cbmp in the case of veterinary products and uh, they can be uh, put in any phase of the life cycle of a medicinal product in order to address a specific question. Other types of operational expert groups, for example, could be more, uh, could be um, groups provided on a more long the temporary basis to, in order to address certain, certain needs, certain product uh, needs. And one example of uh, an operational expert group is the nitrosamines expert group that uh, was constituted in order to address all the, the evaluation of nitrosamines in, in the medicinal products. So the expertise is uh, of these operational expert groups come from the ESEX and uh, can include also academic input as needed. And as I mentioned, these operational expert groups and temporary basis groups that are uh, appointed by the CHMP members with the and the, the working parties. If we go to the next slide, another type of uh, groups in the model and the temporary drafting groups these structures i primarily constituted for the purpose of drafting a guideline so normally these are volunteers that uh, have uh, uh, 
um, our volunteer is supplemented with uh, academic expertise, multidisciplinary expertise from the Essex, and uh, they are normally led by one coordinator, normally a working party member or a committee member that will will lead this group that uh, is mainly uh, constituted to work on a specific guideline. The approval of these temporary drafting groups is done by the working party and at domain level, and there is an, a reporting on the scientific progress and at certain milestone to the domain and also to the working parties. Normally, the, the temporary drafting groups meet normally virtually, and the frequency is uh, flexible according to the timelines and duration needed for the preparation of the of the um, guideline. And um, members are belong to the Essex and um, are appointed by the working party. If we go to the next slide. So here is the overview of uh, the new operating model and uh, the working parties. So as I mentioned, from depending on uh, based uh, from the CHMP, we have four domains, quality, non-clinical, methodological and clinical. Quality is constituted for by the quality working party, biologics working party and biosimilar working party. And there are at the moment two operational expert groups, one the quality innovation group and the formulation expert group. The non-clinical domain is mainly constituted by the non-clinical working party and the joint three R's that uh, you will receive more information in the next uh, presentations. And we have uh, an, an operational expert group on nitrosamines currently constituted. Methodology working party, so methodology domain, sorry, which mainly is composed by the methodology working party and some operational expert groups on biostatistics, modeling and simulation and the clinical uh, domain, which uh, is composed by uh, by seven working parties on the different therapeutic disciplines and uh, the ad hoc scientific advisory group uh, to address product uh, related matters. So this is the main the main constitution of the of the new working party model uh, pending from the CHMP. If we go to the next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, the European Specialized Expert Community is the, the community with all experts uh, belonging to a domain with uh, a specific knowledge on a given area. So these communities are constituted by experts from the national competent authorities, experts from the CHMP, from SACS, academic organization that are willing to contribute to our regulatory si system. And the membership is by appointment by the, the committee, by nomination by the committees through the national competent authorities. And there is a confidential agreement that needs to be signed by all members in order to respect the, the, conf the confidentiality of uh, all the information that is being shared and all experts are included into an expert database that uh, the agency hosts. We go to the next slide. So the, the Essex um, have uh, uh, the Essex mainly have a, a big component of uh, knowledge sharing and training and uh, so the, uh, there is an agile system that strengthens these two aspects. So the DSEC uh, work very closely with the European Network Training Center, which uh, will is in charge to provide the support to deliver all the training plans to the network. And uh, for the expectation is that, for example, for every new guideline that is developed, it will have an own training plan so that all the 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 new concepts or new new information, new documents are really uh, pro are really uh, reached to to all experts, and there is a wide understanding on on the, on any new new document and uh, also the Essex is a platform to communicate and to raise awareness through any any work plans or any any important relevant matter also Essex intends to to promote the publication of guidelines on the or in editorials at the 
public um, at public uh, journals in order to reach a specific audience beyond what it is uh, intended with the with the guidelines and one of the SX that have already been activated and uh, has been piloted is in the oncology domain which uh, has been constituted uh, last year so i think this is if we go to the next slide um, I'm open for any immediate question that we can have uh, now at this level or, or later during the, the panel discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto. Very clear. And I think it, it gives a, a good overview of how things have been adapted. And, and, and as you say, it portrays a more agile uh, system. I would propose that we go through the different presentations and then we have an overall Q&A because it may be more... Uh, uh, we will have all the elements and then maybe uh, we will now make a focus on, on a specific working parties uh, that we have highlighted because of the major interest at this moment uh, and I think uh, we can start even if it was highlighted in your presentation that scientific working party scientific advice working party has been out of the reorganization is a moment is a good moment to have an update on their activities and we have with us uh, Jordanis Gravinis who is the head of scientific advice and who will give an update. Thank you, Jordanis. Thank you, Juan. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here um, and present to you the uh, uh, Scientific Advice Working Party um, and its interactions with other working parties in the new uh, model of the Working Party uh, reorganization. If I can have the presentation, please. So um, I had planned to cover three topics. I think I may not have the time to go through all three of them, but I guess the third topic will be about, uh, I guess the topic of, of this, or one of the topics for, for discussion. So let's see how I go through the first two, which is an introduction to the Scientific Advice Working Party and its main tasks, and then how it actually interacts now with the, uh, the working parties and other committees are, are, are also of the, of the agency. So the Scientific Advice Working Party is uh, actually, it's, it's the only working party, uh, to the best of my understanding, that's uh, actually um, foreseen in the legislation so far. It's a standing working party of the Committee uh, for Medicinal Products for Human Use, the CHMP. There is a, a Scientific Advice Working Party in the VET uh, area as well. And its sole remedy is uh, that to provide scientific advice. Um, although we call it a working party, it functions a bit like a committee, so uh, it actually meets on a monthly basis, 11 times a year, because there's a month of holidays, as we all know, every year. And it's a relatively large working party, consists of 72 members uh, and alternates all together. Uh, they are nominated based on expertise uh, needs of the working party uh, and includes representatives from uh, other EMA committees like the Pediatric Committee, the um, um, committee for Orphan Medicinal Products, the, PD, the um, uh, Committee of Advanced Therapies, and also the uh, Pharmacovigilance and Risk Assessment uh, Committee. Uh, it's not, the uh, representation is not based on kind of national, uh, there's no national representation in, in the committee. And uh, to exemplify this, I, I show here, uh, you know, the, the different EU countries, uh, or EEA actually uh, countries, and their representation in, in the working party um, and, uh, you know, most notably, I would say uh, the, the Balkan and like a lot of the Eastern European countries are actually not uh, represented. Of course, you know, the nomination is open to all EU member states, but then also, uh, you know, we ask for, depending on the, um, the types of requests that, uh, that we see and the types of expertise that we need, uh, we ask for people to be nominated that have specific expertise in therapeutic areas, in other disciplines, uh, you know, uh, methodology, uh, quality, non-clinical, and so on and so forth. Now, the uh, working party has uh, three main tasks. Uh, I guess the, the, the majority is the provision of scientific advice and protocol assistance. We're handling something around 70 uh, requests per month. Um, a second uh, important task is the uh, provision of qualification advice or qualification opinion. Uh, this is a much lower volume uh, procedure. We have uh, around three uh, submissions or procedures starting every month, but these are procedures that take longer, so they come on the agenda, uh, you know, multiple times. And, you know, we have around five topics of this, of this type every month. Finally, and in more recent years, uh, the SOP has been also tasked with the assessment of prime eligibility requests, and they form a draft recommendation to the CAT, if we're talking about an ATMP or the CHMP, uh, as to whether a product that comes for a, for a prime eligibility should be granted the designation or not. 
And in the next slides, I'm going to explain a little bit. I, I um, understand that you know the majority of you uh, already know what all of this uh, means and what what these, these tasks are. But let me, uh, you know, just for the uh, occasional people who may not be so familiar. So what is scientific advice? It's a regulatory advice on, uh, to drug developers on how to, um, you know, uh, develop the drugs in the most optimal way in order to support eventually the positive benefit risk and the authorization <laughs> of the medicine. Um, it covers any aspect of drug development from the quality to the non-clinical studies uh, and all the way to the clinical studies. It can include uh, questions on methodology. Uh, and it could, could also include questions on regulatory strategy as to the type of marketing authorization what one might be looking to to achieve, um, uh, you know, ways to develop special types of products like generics, hybrids, biosimilars. And it could also extend into the post-authorization life cycle, not just the initial uh, authorization of the drug, but also uh, in, in the post-authorization uh, space. Scientific advice is prospective in nature, so the focus is on the development strategy, the development plan. No, it's not the pre-assessment of the data, and it's delivered in the form of specific questions uh, that uh, need to be answered. Protocol assistance is uh, very similar to scientific advice. It's just scientific advice on orphan medicinal products or products uh, intended for rare diseases. And in addition to some fee uh, um, reductions or exemptions that uh, it implies, uh, it can also include uh, questions on what we call significant benefits. So in order for an orphan product to be authorized, it, it needs to not just show a positive benefit risk, but it also needs to, to show that it adds something to the existing uh, therapeutic landscape in that disease, so that we call significant benefit. And of course, companies need to have a plan as to how to demonstrate, how to show the significant benefit at the time of authorization, and they can come with uh, questions on this plan uh, to us. Qualification of novel methodologies is a very different animal. It's not lo no longer a product work. Uh, uh, it's about uh, developing methodologies that can be used uh, in drug development. And uh, the types of methodologies are quite diverse. It started initially as a qualification of biomarkers that you can use to uh, I don't know, uh, enrich your pa patient population or predict toxicity, uh, but then quickly move to uh, surrogate end, uh, clinical endpoints, also uh, clinical outcome assessments like patient and caregiver reported outcomes. Uh, and in more recent years, a patient and disease registry, so even data sets that are, are being qualified. Uh, and since a couple of years, we're also discussing a, a lot of digital endpoints and use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in, in different types of, of uh, you know, methodologies like this. And qualification is really a regulatory acceptability of a method to be used in, in drug development. That's what it means, qualification. Uh, and it also differs from scientific advice because um, companies can come during the course of, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, designing how to, 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 to qualify their methodology, so we give them advice, or they can actually eventually come with the, uh, the data to support such qualification and actually get an opinion, as we say, qualification opinion, which means that this methodology can then be used without needing to be, to be validated any longer. Finally, a prime designation. So uh, uh, the prime scheme is a, is a scheme that is intended for uh, medicines that um, address uh, unmet medical needs and that have hold promise to uh, provide a major public health interest, so uh, effectively uh, game changers. Um, it's a designation that uh, uh, can be requested. Um, it's being assessed uh, initially by the SOP. The SOP formulates a recommendation towards the CAT or the CGMP, depending on the nature of the product. Uh, but eventually, it's the CGMP that decides whether the designation should be given or not. What uh, once once given the designation, it implies that there's a enhanced uh, regulatory and scientific uh, support. Uh, so there's an early uh, rapporteur appointment, and also there's uh, support uh, through primarily scientific advice. Uh, and of course, the plan is to optimize the development in order for these medicines that hold, uh, you know, promise to effectively um, come to the market as, as quickly as, as possible, or at least that's the hope. Now, switching gears a bit to discuss uh, the uh, the SOP interactions with other working parties. So, as I mentioned before, uh, um, scientific advice can uh, um, include questions on every single aspect or any single aspect of, of drug development. And therefore, uh, it's often um, important or necessary for um, uh, other 
uh, not just working parties, but even committees of the EMA to be involved and to provide peer review support uh, in uh, formulating, uh, the, you know, the, the advice. Now, the level of, of uh, engagement of each committee or working party differs depending on the type of, um, uh, of re request, the types of questions. And uh, now, because the working party, the scientific advice working party has primarily a clinical and methodological focus and, and expertise, uh, any uh, questions on uh, pharmaceutical quality uh, are actually uh, delegated to the biologics working party or the uh, quality working party, the core team of the quality working party. Uh, so these are uh, always discussed at, at these, uh, you know, working parties. Similarly, for matters of significant benefit, the answers are actually formulated by the, the uh, Committee of um, Orphan Medicinal Products, the COMP, okay? So the SOP doesn't discuss this. Uh, then there's a number of uh, other things where uh, other committees and, uh, well, not working parties, but operational uh, um, expert groups are uh, systematically being involved. So the PDCO for pediatric aspects, the CAT for ATMPs, the PRAC for post-authorization safety studies, um, and also uh, statistical questions are referred to the biostatistics operational group, uh, group and uh, modeling and simulation questions to the modeling and simulation operational expert group of the methodology working party. Now, in other cases, the involvement is more ad hoc. So uh, um, pediatric developments where there is no uh, already agreed pediatric investigation plan can be uh, referred to the PDCO, but not always. That's because uh, we actually have quite a few um, uh, um, requests that uh, pertain to pediatric aspects every month, and it's a lot to uh, you know refer all of this to the PDCO. So you know this is a this is a very intense interaction um, between the two bodies that uh, you know we're always trying to uh, you know optimize. And uh, so currently uh, you know uh, we only ad hoc refer you know such cases. Then uh, non-clinical questions may occasionally uh, be referred to the non-clinical working party. Pharmacokinetics questions occasionally to the, uh, well, it used to be the PK working party. I guess now it's the methodology directly. Okay, methodology working party. And then other more kind of uh, specific uh, and rare, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, questions are referred to, to even uh, groups that are actually not, uh, no longer uh, working parties or operational expert groups, but other, other types of, of groups. And I think I've exhausted my 10 minutes, so I'm actually not going to go through the, uh, the last part, which is patient and healthcare uh, professional involvement in scientific advice. This is well established, but we can discuss this, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordanis. Um, very clear, and indeed we can discuss on the Q&A, and I think, yeah, maybe, maybe it's... I was thinking while you were presenting, I think um, scientific advice maybe has been adapting so well to the needs that maybe that's one of the reasons it was left out of the reorganization because it's really, um, and, and I think we have to also acknowledge maybe the, the, the role that it played during the pandemic as well. So maybe we can we can discuss in the Q&A. And then we can go now to, to introduce uh, one of the working parties which has been highlighted and, and which is... Uh, indeed becoming very relevant, which is uh, the Methodology Working Party. And we have with us um, Andrew Thompson, who is leading it. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Um, can I have the slide deck, please? Thanks. Um, so you'll have seen um, many of these concepts introduced already regarding ESEC and OEGs and, and Working Party's reorganization. And I'll give a, a bit of context to how that fits into the methodology domain. So as you know, it's been reorganized into five domains, the methodology domain there at the bottom, reporting into CHMP PROM and PsychoBo. And I think the, I think the main difference really between the methodology domain and, and the other ones primarily as part of the reorganization is that we've only ended up with one working party, with the methodology working party, and most of the other domains have multiple working parties. And we've taken existing ones and, and stuck them together, as you'll see in the forthcoming slides. So in this bigger picture, we have, you know, we have the management board, we have the psycho bear and the committees overseeing that, and then the domains, and as I said, the methodology domain. And within that, the methodology working party. And we have a lot of temporary drafting groups uh, already constituted and foreseen, and, and a couple of uh, somewhat permanent OEGs, as uh, Alberto mentioned in his presentation, and indeed uh, setting up the temporary ones as well. Underpinning this is the, the ESEC 
and then underpinning all of this as well are the you know the the, the wider regulatory network and academia to to fill in the the expertise we need in the ESEC to deliver the work of the working parties to deliver the work plan at the domain level etc cetera, etc cetera. so it is very much a uh, a pyramidical structure having said that though um this is a very complicated, but also uh, what we think is probably the most simple way of describing what happened in the methodology domain. Uh, we've been around all of the committees and this uh, diagram, as it's known as the flower, has been tweaked multiple times. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it. Um, and I think the, the key aspect we have here is that everyone doesn't need to do everything. And that's what we did before in the old structures with the working parties. We'd have a meeting, there'd be some products, there'd be some guidance, there'd be some stuff on training, and everyone would join and we'd check everyone's conflicts of interests. And maybe people weren't actually interested in everything we were talking about. They're only there for one or two points of the agenda. So the idea is we have these different structures um, that can deliver the work plan that consists of guidance and of uh, products and, and of training. And we have at the, the centre of this MWP, which is hub. And we have currently 21 people on MWP. We have 25 spaces. We're actually going to probably fill another one of these because we've taken on some, some more competence in the, in the last few weeks. So it, it's, that's the kind of size we're looking at. And all of the groups that we have uh, are supposed to have a linking pin. So the blue circles, if you like, are the, in the middle. You have MWP, and these each represent a, a member of MWP. And they're each going to take a lead, or each operational expert group and each temporary drafting group is each going to have a lead from MWP, who's going to be the one being responsible and accountable for this. And then to draw the expertise uh, from, the, from the yellow circles, those are the ESECs that we have. And I think it's also important to say that one of the things we're trying to do with methodology in particular is to break down silos. And we've taken existing working groups in biostatistics, modeling and simulation, pharmacokinetics and pharmacogenomics. We break down those silos and people can be members of more than one ESEC and they contribute to, to guidelines perhaps not in their direct level of uh, experience and competence because actually having that outside voice of you know, quantitatively minded people actually we think helps improve the situation. So the yellow circles are the ESECs and that's where you know, the, the ESEC activities will happen. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The kind of peachy circles are the, the temporary OEGs delivered for product. So when a, a request comes from a committee, we'll form one of these. And we also have the kind of dark orange circles for our permanent OEGs in modeling and statistics and biostatistics, modeling and simulation and biostatistics. And as Jordanus has just said, the main aim for that is to actually support SORP and also the very high volume of work we get from PDCO for uh, PIPs in modeling and simulation, because that's a real core aspect of the pediatric plans, is the modeling. So in theory, it all sticks together like this. And you know, the MWP members have this kind of crucial role of linking it all together. And people only have to take part in the activities that they're actually interested in doing. Um, they're multidisciplinary. It's from a, a broad background. Um, and again, we're splitting out, explicitly splitting out the guidance generation and the product support. We have a work plan, um, as, as all working parties do, and that's, it's built around uh, major pillars of what we want to do. So firstly, operational support, and that's two CHMP as our, as our main committee who report into, but also crucially to other committees and SORP. And actually, one of the things we're really trying to do is to be more efficient rather than one committee writing to CHMP to say, can we consult this working party? And then they reply to CHMP and they reply back to that committee. It's convoluted, it's time consuming, and actually... The questions need to be answered rapidly and effectively. So uh, we're, we're trying to smooth, line, smooth and streamline our operations and specific focus on products. We also have lots of guidance documents to deliver. And, and you know, BCP, when the, you know, the work has kind of stopped for the last three or four years and, and the world has not stopped turning and, and we have a, something of a backlog, should we say, of guidance documents as well as those ones to deliver the, the future clinical trial issues as well. So these are a structured plan for development and they've been prioritised. And we've prioritised what we need to do now, but also what we will need in the future as well. So building that in a kind of structured fashion has been part of the work plan development, taking all of the work plans of the existing working parties and also introducing real world evidence in AI as well. So uh, I think we have prioritised uh, for this year, 15 guidance documents we're going to be 
developing, which sounds like a lot and it is a lot, but actually if it's spread over six or seven different areas, it's, it's only two or three and, and most of those are legacy documents as well. Uh, the other thing primarily in the ESEC is knowledge building and capacity, so sharing learnings from assessments, but also training and development of the network as a whole. And that's two prongs for that. Firstly, training the methodologists themselves in the methodology they need to know, but also training clinicians, people like yourselves, if you're interested, we're going to be putting on trainings of a methodological flavour for non-methodologists so you can learn more yourself as part of professional development. Building the expertise network across the NCAs and, and also with academia, uh, and, and that last one's particularly important for the work we do, where, where there's not always as much resource with NCAs to deliver all the work. And working as a global lead with international regulatory, par regulatory partners and leading a voice in global collaborations. So we'll be more strategic with, say, ICH-like documents as well, understanding where we can lead as the EU. Our guidelines have been structured under four main areas. Uh, particularly, we focus on clinical pharmacology, and that includes uh, the product-specific bioequivalence guidances, which are, are kind of a big project that, that's still very important, primarily for CMDH, as well as modelling and simulation Q&A and documents. Uh, we will be focusing on real-world evidence. We're having a, a structured plan for, for documents that we're going to be re releasing in that area, and also a reflection paper on AI is foreseen. We will be looking at clinical trial modernisation, so implementing ICH guidance, which has been developed over the last five years, but our guidance documents haven't actually taken them on board, and making sure the system's ready for the trials of the future. And in particular as well, pharmacogenomics, so we're ready for the implementing the uh, in vitro diagnostic legislation, um, and to update our existing guidance based on that. And for all of these different areas that we've structured our guidelines under, it's crucial that the ESEC is functional the delivery of them because we need the, the resource to actually write these papers and, and, to, and to review them and deliver them at the end. In terms of work plan and training, we have comprehensive curricula foreseen and we've actually got quite a lot of experience in biostatistics on that and so we, have a, we can build on that experience of how to develop and deliver those curricula. And as I said, training of methodologists is key. And I think from our point of view, the use of case studies and committees is really important. It's not just, you know, what's the latest method, but what is being used by the industry um, in, in their development programs and training of the wider network. We're going to work closely with the EU Network Training Centre for that. And there's also an upcoming joint action that's being led by some member states that we're um, actively liaising with as well to make sure that it's all joined up and, and there's a lot more harmonised thinking about how this is being delivered. And again, the ESEC is very crucial for delivery here. <clears throat> In terms of stakeholder engagement, we have some, some key stakeholders. Um, we have industry and in fact the industry groups that we talk to are organised on the traditional lines. They haven't brought everything under the big one one more uh, methodology umbrella. They still have statistics groups, modelling groups, generics groups, etc. So we will have to talk to them at quite a granular level. Um, we need to talk to global regulators, um, and again, they're also organised on traditional lines. So even though we've taken the quite bold step to, to bring everything under one umbrella, not everyone else has done that, and, and we have to reflect that when we engage with our other regulatory stakeholders. And also, well, we have EU projects, EU funded projects, IHI, etc., but also things where EMA is in the lead, Act EU, BDSG, etc. And I said, uh, finish up the key role of the ESEC we have. So the, the methodology working party is responsible for delivery of this, but the ESEC is a crucial network for knowledge, engagement, and agile delivery. And I think it's important that, that we are going to align our objectives with other initiatives that have been driven in the in the European systems, including those of the Big Data Steering Group of the Act EU. So we'll establish the network ability to assess applications supported by data science, including AI models created through machine learning algorithms. Now that's written down in the Big Data uh, Steering Group work plan, and obviously there's no point them doing looking at that and, and methodology working party looking at that at the same time. So we just need to, to make sure that we align our objectives and understand that we, we do this together uh, and bringing multiple benefits across the network. For um, uh, ACTEU, they talk about develop and publish key methodologies guidance, including on, on AI and machine learning. So again, making sure there's not duplication during the network and coordination between scientific advice and innovation and methodology. 
and ESEC will be responsible for training and development in general. So crucially, it acts as this kind of capacity hub across the network. And I think that should be it. Yeah, okay. So um, that, that kind of gives a little, little bit more uh, granularity to the, the high-level principles as outlined by Alberta, and I'm happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Very clear, and I think indeed we can maybe take questions later, but um, I think it highlights very well how how the, the working party is supporting across the board. So we, we now move to a, a new working party that uh, I'm sure you have heard of, uh, which is the Three Hours Working Party. And we have with us Stefano Ponzano, who is scientific officer at the Translational Science Office and who is responsible of both the, um, the non-clinical working party and the Three Hours Working Party. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Juan, and good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk today about the CHMP, the new CHMP, CFMP, three hours working party. Please, can you go to the next slide? Oh, I have to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I will start to give you a little bit of a background and uh, just to put you a little bit in the context of this new three hours working party. Um, based on the latest statistics uh, given by the European Commission, 10.4 million of animals are used every year. These uh, latest statistics are, were done in 2019 and includes all member states, including Norway. So these 10.4 million of animals are used in basic research and uh, applied research, but it also includes 1.8 million of animals which are used in regulatory testing, uh, including quality control, uh, so it means uh, batch safety and potency testing, followed by toxicity studies and other safety testings, including also efficacy uh, with 40.2%. Next slide, please. Yeah, I need to figure out that this is my role to change the slides. Okay. So you're probably aware of the Directive 2010 from the European Parliament and the Council. It really focuses on the three R principles and it puts the responsibility on the member states to ensure that in vivo animal studies should be replaced with alternative studies in vitro when, when possible. It also put the responsibility on member states to uh, reduce the number of animals to a minimum in every study, and also as a final, it has, member states have to ensure that there is a refinement, which means they have to ensure that the, the, uh, to eliminate or reduce any, to a minimum, any possible pain, suffering, distress, or lasting harm to the animals. So EMA responded very quickly to this, uh, to this directive by showing its commitment to the three R principles. We released a statement in 2011 showing how <coughs> EMA is committed uh, to work on the three R principles. And uh, as you will see, we also have a dedicated web page showing all the guidelines and all the work which is being done in the area of three R's. In 2010, also a new group was established, the three R's working group. And it was the first uh, joint CVMP CHMP working group dedicated to the three R principles. It uh, has worked from 2010 until 2017 and you will find the latest uh, report uh, from the biennial report from 2016-2017. Unfortunately, uh, in 2017, it has been put on hold because of uh, BCP constraints at EMA uh, due to Brexit and uh, the relocation to the Netherlands, and then also because of the pandemic emergency. In the meantime, EMA has published a regulatory science strategy uh, 2025, and it highlights core recommendations for the future, where it says that we need to leverage non-clinical models and three R principles with specific actions to stimulate developers to use preclinical models, to refocus the role of the joint three R's working group to support the qualification of new approach methodologies, and also to develop clear guidance to encourage and prioritize the use of NAMs. So taking into account this regulatory science strategy, we have developed and created this new permanent working party, the joint three hours working party of CCMP and CVMP. It is a strategic and visible group, which is responsible to support the committees, CCMP and CVMP, to any related issues for three hours. But it also is responsible to supervise the activities and achieve the goals, which are highlighted in the regulatory science strategies and the three year work plan of the non-clinical domain. Now, how it, will, how it will work, it is a, a group of six people. It is a multidisciplinary uh, group 
with a human and veterinary expertise. And you see below, uh, these six members will have a lead a role in, in, dif in different areas of the, of, the, uh, of the working activities, but they will not work alone. They will work uh, together with uh, supporting groups like operational expert groups and drafting groups. And there will also be a European specialized expert community called uh, ESEC on new uh, approach methodologies. And this will help driving forward the agenda of the three hours working party. So here I reported the, the composition of the group. You see that there are six members coming from different uh, NCAs across the EU. They have uh, all non-clinical and quality expertise. They are coming from the human side or the veterinary uh, side. We also have um, quite a, a big secretariat to support this three hours working party. Uh, we have uh, three people from the scientific side and also uh, Savrula helping us with the administrative secretariat. I've reported here the web page, which is online at the moment. And like a few days ago, we had the first stakeholder meetings of the three hours working part. It was a very interesting meeting. We also had a public session in the morning where we showcased what we are going to do in the future, um, explaining all the work plan. And then it was followed by dedicated stakeholder meetings, targeted stakeholder meetings um, with industry, CROs, uh, NGO and uh, research consortia, but also animal welfare associations and EU agencies and observers from the European Commission. Now here I'm just highlighting the high level strategic goals of the three hours working party. The main idea is to have visibility at EMA. So to assume a strategic role in the field of the three hours and to start cooperating with all the stakeholders and international partners. We also have to start moving all these methods that are being developed in research towards the regulatory use. So that's an important task of the three hours working party to ensure the integration of new approach methodologies in the regulatory framework. We also have to ensure the follow up of the three hours in batch release testing of human and veterinary medicinal products. As you have seen, there is a lot of animals that are being used for uh, quality control and batch release testing. We of course have to review and update all the EMA guidelines since 2017 by introducing all the best practice regarding three Rs and also impact monitoring of implemented changes. We have to follow up and identify actions to reduce the use of non-human primates. As you know, there is a shortage of these animals, but it's also a very uh, ethical issue regarding uh, the use of non-human primates. And we also have to follow up of actions uh, following the European Parliament resolution, the recent one, which focused on accelerating the transition to innovation without the use of animals. Now, when we think about non-animal methods, wh what is it that we're talking about? It's really three classes. It's mainly the in vitro methods that you might be familiar with. So any cell-based assays, two-dimensional, or any 3D constructs like organoids. But we also have in silico systems, like computational methods using uh, predictive QSAR technologies associated with uh, databases. And we have organon chips. Organon chips are maybe the most promising new approach methodologies for the future to replace animal studies. What are these organ on chips? They are microfluidic devices containing living engineered organ substructures in a controlled microenvironment. They, they try to recapitulate one or more aspects of the organ dynamics, functional functionality and pathophysiological response in vivo and in real time. Here I've reported one example of emulate, which is the lung on a chip. As you see in the, in the image, you have a section of this lung on a chip. You have a membrane where you cultivate the cells from the lung tissue above and below. You can use uh, capillary cells. Then in these channels, you can use a flow of blood and a flow of air. And you can see how, for example, you can simulate an infection with bacteria. You can see how the, the white blood cells go through the membrane and kills the bacteria. And this is followed in, in vivo, in real time. You can also use side chambers to perform vacuum system and contract and expand the membrane to simulate the dynamics of a lung organ. So organ or chips applications is not only about reducing animals, it's also about increasing predictivity of efficacy and safety of new potential medicinal products with the real goal of providing better medicines to patients. And I've reported here a list of how these organ chips are being used now in literature and basic research. 
It really covers a, a vast area of research going from basic science to disease modeling, drug safety assessment, drug efficacy, PK modeling, clinical research, and personalized medicines. The main challenge of the three arts working part is how to integrate all the science into the regulatory requirements, into the regulatory framework. We need to qualify these methods. So the main objective of the three arts working part is to go through a roadmap of qualification of these new approach methodologies. The first thing is to identify the most promising three arts methods and interact with developers with the new three arts ITF initiative that have been uh, put uh, by um, ITF and EMA two years ago. So we need to interact with them, understand what they are doing, see guiding them through scientific advice and ITF, what is the best pathway uh, to achieve qualification. But we need also to interact with international regulators to harmonize the views because alone EMA cannot perform this. We need to talk to FDA and other regulators to define regulatory acceptance criteria. There is also the need to develop guidance uh, to, to achieve to define this uh, acceptance criteria. We need to develop trainings to provide this uh, knowledge of 3R methods to all the assessors and um, showing all the best 3 hours practices across the EU network. And then we need to validate the 3 hours methods. So we need to demonstrate that the method is fit for purpose. It does what it's meant to, to be doing. And this has to be done with earl ECVAM, which is GRC centers in ISPRA. But then when it's validated, we need to qualified it for a specific context of use at TMA to replace a, a study requirement in the regulatory framework. And this can be done only with qualification advice and, uh, of course, that leads to a qualification opinion through the support of the scientific advice working party. Now, um, I, I would like to reiterate that if you are interested in this uh, program, this work plan, if you see any procedures which uh, have this type of uh, methods that are being developed or are being engaged in a procedure or used in a procedure, and you would like to report this information to the 3 hours Working Party, please come to us. I've put here the 3 hours EMA Europa.eu, which is the, the inbox of our 3 hours Working Party Secretariat. If you also want to be part of the ESEC, then contact us, and uh, it, it will be a pleasure to, to welcome you and collaborate with you. And if you have any question, we can always do that during the, the panel session. So I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano, for the very clear update and, and for the relevance of this work. So before I open for Q&A, maybe I wanted also to, um, to give the floor to Maya Sommerfeld, who is the co-chair of the Infectious Disease Working Party. Even if we will not have a, a formal presentation of the Working Party, uh, we want to also to highlight that possibilities uh, of collaboration uh, of this working party, an infection disease working party with the PCWP and healthcare professional working party. So, um, Maja, please. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's very kind and I'm very glad to be here uh, today. Uh, yes, my name is Maya Sommerfeld Grunwald and I'm uh, co chair of the Infectious Disease Working Party. Unfortunately, the chair was unable to attend today. And um, one of the reasons why uh, it's so good to be able to attend this meeting is to um, be able to inform you that we are involved in uh, infectious disease and that a number of the patient and consumer uh, eligible organizations also have shown some interest in infectious diseases. And we are therefore uh, interested to have um, contact, also to ensure good communication, for example, if we are developing guidelines, if there are questions relating to um, product information, um, and also um, just being able to ensure that we can commu uh, communicate clearly with, uh, with you, uh, with the patients and consumer organizations and the healthcare working parties. So uh, we are um, a small group, but we are have had some interaction with you previously, but we just want to show that we are interested in further uh, contact. And um, we, I look forward to being able to see how we can maybe synergize and have that, have a good interaction moving forward. So thank you. That was uh, basically a very brief uh, introduction. Thank you very much, Maja. And I think that that's good. And I think we can now open for questions. We have, so we have Ansela first. 
Yes, thank you, Ansela from Beuk. Very interesting to, to learn about the organ on, on chip. And I have two questions. So one is maybe a general question. So what is the main difference between the status of a committee and the status of a working party? I assume, okay, working parties are advisory. They don't take decisions. Committees do, like the CAT. So, but what is the key decision? What is the key difference? Um, and I also make this question thinking about a little bit the, the commission's plans on the, you know, potentially future restructuring of the EMA. And um, and then another question about surrogate endpoints. So um, how are surrogate endpoints validated? Who takes that decision within the agency? And is this information public? Like, do we have a list of uh, validated surrogate endpoints for specific diseases, etc.? Thank you. Thank you, Ansela. Maybe I can give the first uh, to Alberto and then the second one, um, Jordanis can take it. Alberto, please. No, thank, thank you for the, the question. As you rightly pointed out, I mean, committees are uh, decision-making bodies. So really the working parties are advisory groups to and supporting groups to the, to the committees. So um, the working parties uh, work on a specific uh, question that is provided uh, by the committees or on a guideline or their main role is to, to work on delegated uh, functions, but uh, they are not really at the decision making process. It's true that some of the committees do regular uh, regular revision of uh, medicinal products, like for example, I'm talking about the quality working party or the biologics working party, where they can, on behalf of CHMP, they can uh, discuss uh, product related matters, but uh, still there is a recommendation on the formal endorsement is always at the committee level. So I think this is the, the key fundamental the key fundamental point between both uh, structures. Thank you, Alberto. And uh, maybe Jordanis. So with regard to the surrogate uh, endpoints, this, as I mentioned, need, would need to be qualified. So it's one of the one of the qualification uh, objects uh, that we historically had and continue to have. Um, I have to say that you know qualification, and it was it was mentioned a bit on the slide. Qualification is not like so straightforward. Huh? It's it requires quite a bit of data. It requires usually meta analysis of data, uh, you know, deriving from multiple developments, multiple clinical uh, you know studies, and also for us it's quite heavy as as a procedure. I mean, it's it's as heavy as a, as an initial marketing authorization, so to speak. Um, so we don't have that many of those uh, qualified over over the years, uh, but uh, the ones that are have been qualified. There is the most recent one that I can think of is the um, Stride Velocity 95th Centile. As a, it was initially qualified as a secondary endpoint, and recently it's been qualified as a primary endpoint for Duchenne muscular muscular dystrophy. Uh, so all of these uh, qualification opinions are being published, so they're on on our website. I think Stefano included a, a link to qualification opinions on our website, but you want you will find them among, uh, you know, the other qualification opinions on biomarkers, on clinical outcome, uh, you know, assessment measures and so on and so forth. Uh, we are in the process of reviewing the, uh, the the process for qualification. Uh, we're holding actually a workshop on the 17th and uh, 18th of April. It's a uh, two half day, uh, you know, workshop. And um, we've also been uh, discussing with, uh, well, primarily with industry over the course of last year in a focus group on, on qualifications. And we acknowledge, of course, the fact that, you know, both both the advertisement of qualification opinions needs to be, uh, you know, promotion, so to speak, needs to be uh, improved because, uh, you know, a lot of these are not so well known. Um, uh, but also, you know, the, the the whole presentation of the information. So pot potentially, for example, um, you know, splitting the, the qualification opinions based, based on the category so as to allow, uh, you know, easier identification. Um, along with other things, improvement of guidance, templates, and, and, and all that. Um, uh, well, I haven't shown numbers, but uh, qualification started already since uh, 2007, um, but uh, the numbers have been relatively low. So we're talking about, uh, well, in recent years, in the last four or five years, around 20, 25 procedures. Very few of them actually lead to, to an opinion. Most of them are qualification advices. We have something like two to three qualifications opinions uh, you know, per, per year. Um, so, but we feel that now it's, we've run the process long enough and that, and, and we have enough experience that, you know, we are ready to embark on this, you know, uh, review of the, of the process and improvement of, you know, both the process, but also the, uh, the presentation of the, of the outcomes. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So I have Francois, Virginie, Robin, and Rosa. So Francois first. Thank you. <clears throat> so one million new abbreviations to absorb this morning. <laughs> well, well done. Uh, two, two, two short questions regarding the a European Specialized Expert Committee. Can you explain again the, the composition? I understand, I, I saw on one slide that uh, it's experts from national competent authorities, but other experts which uh, are not necessarily related to national competent authorities, can they join uh, this, uh, this community? And second question regarding the operational expert groups who will work on product-related procedures uh, how this will articulate with the stakeholder engagement unit regarding the involvement of uh, patients, healthcare professionals uh, in uh, product-related procedures. Thanks. Thank you, Francois. Maybe Alberto, you can take this. Yes. So re the first question about the DESEC composition. So DESEC uh, is a community of uh, European specialized experts. So normally they they are experts that uh, could uh, could be coming either from national competent authorities, could come from academia, could come from any other public sector where they they the main the main purpose is that we want to have a community of experts in the field that uh, from the European Union. So they can come uh, from different uh, angles. So as, as I mentioned, from societies, from from uh, academia or national competent authorities. Um, the way of nomination needs, in principle, needs to come through uh, the national competent authorities. So they are nominated by by CHMP members, so the, that is the main process of nomination, although we are now establishing as well another process whether also EMA can be also a nominating actor. So these uh, committees, as I mentioned, are based on expertise and so of course uh, we are looking into all conflict of interest of every expert. They are included in a database that uh, we are going to launch uh, at the end of, uh, of this month. and. Um, uh, they all need to to sign and uh, confidentiality uh, arrangement. So that's uh, from from the first question. Um, if I understand the, the second question, uh, the question was like uh, how uh, patients and healthcare professional, if I understand correctly, could uh, participate in two operational expert groups when there are. Pro, uh, product related matters if if i understand correctly the, the question so the 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 domains have uh, already established some regular interactions i mean with the stakeholders so at uh, i mean at the strategic level normally the work plans are presented and but uh, on a specific product related matters i mean normally i mean there could be a doc consultation if there is any specific uh, aspect that uh, is required from from uh, patients or healthcare pr professionals or for example if it's not only a product related matter if we are talking about uh, a guideline i mean normally we have uh, that point of consultation processes where i mean they are open for every specific uh, situation so normally I mean, this is mainly mainly based on, based on a structure, ways of interaction, ad hoc ones, and uh, required the main the main points. I don't know if I have other, fully addressed uh, your your question. Yeah, maybe Ordanis wants to complement as well. Yeah, maybe maybe a bit, a bit from a, like a practical uh, perspective, let's say in scientific advice. So uh, we have to first distinguish between patient and healthcare professional involvement. Uh, so patients are not expected to participate in operational expert groups, right? The, so the patient input is you know quite specific, and it's quite uh, uh, it, it, we're being kind of proactive in in reaching out and discussing matters. I mean, obviously, uh, in scientific advice, you can get all types of questions. You know, not all of them uh, quality aspects, uh, very methodological aspects are not really for patients. Um, so it's like a, a specific interaction, you know, with the patient. Now, healthcare professionals, uh, depending on the expertise, of course, can be part of ESSEX, can, of course, be a, a part of operational expert groups. Um, but um, 
in in uh, I have to say that uh, uh, with healthcare professionals, the involvement ad hoc is, is slightly is actually quite rare. This is because the main assessment work is done through um, you know coordinators at national competent authorities, and therefore the experts are usually expected to be part of these assessment teams. So if a healthcare professional is is interested in a regulatory work, I think that the best way to engage is uh, by uh, creating links with national competent authorities and uh, you know starting to work as an assessor or contributing to uh, working parties operational expert groups assessment teams whatever uh, you know the the um, you know any participation is welcome actually in the shop we have quite a few uh, academics for example or clinicians that uh, you know they have a day job in the university or the hospital but then they also contribute to assessment work via the NCA and represent uh, the NCA at the um, at the, uh, at the scientific advice working party. So that's the main uh, vehicle, I would say. But of course, you know, depending on the expertise, if if their expertise is relevant for an OEG or an ESSEC or whatever, of course, uh, you know, the door is open for them to participate in those. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, maybe just a comment before I give. And I think um, Alberto mentioned that the possibility to nominate a European specialized expert, uh, an expert to the community now it's been considered also to be able to nominate it by EMA, which will give the necessary flexibility in case an expertise are needed. Because I think if, if it is only restricted to NCAs, yeah, then, then I think that that's something that definitely will allow this on a case by case to reach the necessary expertise. Indeed, indeed, it's not. And but you know, the, the mo I would say that in scientific advice, for example, the, the commonest case of ad hoc expert involvement is when we have an application for. Um, uh, what we call an EU uh, medicines for all, so uh, like an application for for a drug use in, say, Africa or a different uh, geographical region, re region where uh, you know expertise is not necessarily found in 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 the EU, and there is when we. Uh, um, uh, um, ask, you know, WHO to nominate experts. So that would be the ad hoc, the, you know, the quintessential example of ad hoc expert involvement. Other cases, of course, you know, a very rare disease where, you know, you don't need the, that expert, you know, very frequently, so you won't find them, you know, associated with an NCA, so we would uh, similarly engage them directly. But it's, it's much more rare than patient, of course, which is much more common. Thank you. Virginie? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I think I have... Two questions. One is clarification of what has just been said, because I'm still not sure I've understood correctly. Uh, so on this European specialized expert communities, do we understood that patient expert can be included in those SX or not? That, and, and my question, because I know you've mentioned the fact that they can be nominated by NTA or EMA, but like the practical example I have is like when, for example, Prague, was constituted SAGS when I was on the committee. Uh, you could nominate patients to take part of SAGS. And here I understand that SAGS are actually becoming clinical OEGs, or sort of. So is it still possible? That was the first short question. Maybe you can, and then I can back on the second. Maybe I can try, and then you can <laughs> correct me if my understanding is correct. In principle, I mean, definitely the, the type of expertise which is uh, being proposed in this community is not specifically covering patients. However, I mean, on a case by case, based on the needs, of course, we will be able to outreach to patients if needed. Is that correct? I think, it, if I can say, it really depends on, on, on the, I mean, you're able to send your curriculum and, and based on your interest and your experience and what you really would like to, to collaborate with. I mean, it really depends on the content of, of your interest and your background. So it's going to be an assessment made be on a case basis, but in principle, it's open also to any person who has a specific scientific background in, in a relevant area to the ESEC. Thank you. Yeah, Virginie. Okay, so I go for the second one. Um, the second one is uh, a bit uh, on the same line than the one from Ancela uh, on looking forward to the future and also what might happen to some of the committees in, with the new legislation. So at the moment, I think uh, I'm right in saying that there are no permanent patient representatives in any of the working parties except the PCWP. And uh, my question is it uh, whether it is foreseen to have in the future the possibility for patients to be included as permanent member of working parties in the sense that uh, 
in the comp, we see the benefit of having both, like the patient representative being member of the committee and the patient uh, invited on another basis to contribute to some of the discussion. So I think it's not maybe the question of today, because it might not concern the working party that we have been uh, presented uh, with today, but I think that's important to also set the scene for the future. Yeah, Virginie. Maybe, Rosha, you wanted to comment? I want actually to ask um, again Alberto. Alberto, you need to be patient yeah. with me, okay? Because I'm, um, I mean, it, <laughs> I take my time to understand things. So I'm a medical oncologist, healthcare professional. I want to contribute and be part of this, of this um, ESSEC, uh, but I'm not connected to a national competent uh, authority, okay? So is there any chance for me to be part of it? There is any other process? There is any call from uh, EMA? There is any, or, or, or I just need to go and knock to the door of the national competent authorities uh, in my country? Can, can you just clarify for me? And thank you in advance for your patience. Yeah. No, no, th thank you very much. And uh, I think it's a, a really good question. So, um, there are two, two options. Um, well, at the moment, we are constituting these uh, new communities. So the way that we have uh, included the, the experts were mainly coming from national competent authorities. Uh, but um, as I mentioned, we now also have the opportunity from EMA. So separate whether we do uh, external calls for, for interest. So at the moment, if, for example, a person like yourself or any any expert want to be part of it, I think that the, the best way is that uh, you submit your interest to, to be part. Uh, submit uh, your curriculum and uh, what kind of level of expertise you you currently have to be considered to, to be part. So if, uh, I mean, it can be done directly through us or it can be done uh, directly through, through your national competent authority. I can't uh, double check and provide um, more details whether we have any methodological approach in the future, how we are going to do the call for, for interest. But uh, I would suggest that now, if any representative or yourself, that you contact uh, myself and within my team, we will organize the best way of, uh, of uh, assessing the, the, the call for, for expression. I will like to touch on the, on the previous uh, question about the, the the new model of the pharma strategy and uh, and about the the future uh, working party model. Um, we don't know. I mean, there has been some kind of external uh, leak about the uh, plans of the European Commission about the uh, remodeling of our working parties. So at the moment, sorry, our our committees at the, at the agency. At the moment, we have we are basing uh, the working party model of our current uh, committee structure. And um, I mean, it is not very clear and is not uh, whether in the future the, our committees will be will be different on how will be the final the final shape of them. So I take and I acknowledge that I mean healthcare professional and patient representatives are now part of certain committees, but I think it's now very premature to start looking on on a model that uh, we don't know how it will look like at uh, its future shape. So I would like to pass the message that uh, we will see how uh, patients and healthcare professionals will fit uh, in the new committee model in the future if there is a, if there are changes and how uh, it will be uh, impacted in the working party model and we can have a discussion at that time point when we have full clarity on how will be the best way that uh, healthcare professional and uh, uh, patients uh, fit into the, the future structure of uh, committees and impacting working parties. So I think it's, uh, this is my main comment that at the moment, I think it's quite premature to start looking into a model where we will not know exactly what will be the final shape. Okay, no, thanks a lot, uh, Alberto. Maybe, I mean, because I think we are close to, to close, but maybe uh, as a follow-up, because yeah, maybe we need to revisit this how and to try to structure, because I think the, pr the problem that some of the, um, let's say, land societies, healthcare professionals and patient organizations have is that they don't have an NCA. And, and therefore, this is really 
we need to think which is the best way to do it in a structured manner because we cannot miss this expertise and the capacity of these experts to somehow be considered in the community. So maybe we can we can discuss further internally and come back maybe to with some kind of a more structured proposal because maybe sending CVs like that might be not ideal. So maybe we can discuss, but I think we take the point and I think it's in line with your comments. Jordan, if you want to clarify something? But in terms of design, we need to be clear that there's a clear difference between operational expert groups and ASICs, okay? So operational expert groups, because it's about product work, and there's like implications in terms of conflict of interest and all of that. That is why, and because product work is primarily led the assessment by national competent authorities, that's why we said it's better to channel this through the, the NCA. If you're interested in becoming a member of ESIC, the, the very, uh, you know, uh, coming together of an ESIC is to bring as, as wide expertise as possible. So, yes, it should be possible. And I realize from, I mean, if Rosa is not aware, uh, who's uh, so involved in our, uh, you know, uh, operations for years, uh, is, is not aware how she could apply, yes, I, I would agree, Juan, that we need to, to think about how to, to reach out to the, you know, the wider scientific community, yeah, because that's the intention of the ESSEC. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think it maybe it's a matter of better organizing, because I think, yeah, of course, maybe some of us maybe are better connected, but I think we have so have to give equal opportunities and to it's everyone. it's the early days. I mean, we have it's, to give, it's, yes. Okay, no, I think that was very helpful. I've, I'm sorry, because there was a lot of hands, and maybe uh, Robin was there, Jose and Rosa, but yeah. very, very quickly. Um, thank you, uh, Robin Dusveik, European Hematology Association. I have a very short uh, clarification question for uh, Alberto and a substantial one for Andrew. Um, in the uh, Alberto slide, um, where the Hematology Working Party was mentioned, it said between brackets, uh, excluding BPWP. And now inside EHA, they sometimes call me head of acronyms, but this one I've never heard of. So if you could clarify that, please. Yeah, no, uh, what I wanted to refer is that uh, the hematology working party is not the replacement of the blood products working party, so covers the blood products working party, so this is what I meant, yeah. Sorry, that is a helpful clarification because I actually thought the hematology working party was coming instead of the blood products working party. Do I understand correctly that they will exist side by side? Yeah. No, the, the Blood Products Working Party is reorganized under the Hematology Working Party. So the scope of the Hematology Working Party is non malignant hematology. So it will cover also as well new products, gene therapies, and uh, on hematology conditions. So the, the, the Hematology Working Party is a uh, replacement of the Blood Products Working Party. Thank you. Um, question for, for Andrew. Um, when you spoke about um, uh, knowledge capacity building, um, you mentioned, amongst others, that uh, there is a joint action in the in the making. Could you uh, say a few more words about that, please? Uh, uh, not particularly an area of expertise or competence, I'm afraid, yes, but I, I just wanted to highlight the fact that we are aware that these activities are happening and we are making sure that we are not duplicating effort throughout the network. Um, and the, 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 the most important is that actually it's going to be coordinated through the EU NTC. So that, that's the kind of EMA coordinating hub for training and development, and we are uh, strongly linked in with that for the for the training offerings and curriculum. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Rosa. Juan, Juan, yes, Juan. Juan maybe I interrupt. I'm really sorry because I need to leave because uh, I I'm they are waiting for me for to another presentation in the Psychobo at this moment. So I'm really happy to address any question that the members could have in writing after the meeting. If that's okay for you, I'm really sorry. No, not, not at all. Thank you, Alberto, very much. We will follow up and maybe I think we will need yeah. to come back maybe with a more uh, clarification about the issue which has been raised. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Not at all. Final question from Rosa and Jose. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Um, um, I had two questions. I realized maybe they are too long, but maybe it's just the question of what will be done in the future about this, because you sh I think it was Jordanis, you show some slides at the end with a kind of upward trend in the involvement of patients in scientific advice. I was curious to know, I mean, if we have learned something about that and what it's going to be done in the future to 
to ensure this, you know, it's meaningful, no? also for the patient, but also for, for the, the process. That's the first one. The second, I was curious about the organ on chip and, and whether there is some sort of work on undergoing on the ethical aspects of this here or with other, you know, projects or, or other agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. So one for Jordanis and then Stefano. Uh, so as you say, uh, patient involvement in scientific advice is well established. The, the slides that I didn't show you were uh, coming primarily from a, an analysis from the years 2017 to 20 that uh, Maria and, and colleagues in you know S Division uh, carried out, uh, analyzing you know the the types of questions, uh, you know the types of input, the impact actually of, of patient involvement, which is quite substantial. So in something like a, a fifth or a quarter of cases, actually the advice is modified by based on uh, patient input. Um, and uh, in the uh, in 85 percent of the cases where um, uh, it's not, it's because the patient was actually in agreement with uh, the advice that was being uh, you know proposed. So it's well established; it's working really well. Uh, uh, you know, we are uh, obviously you know looking to to to, to maintain it and and uh, even increase it if if necessary. Although you know we systematically every month uh, consider whether patient involvement would be uh, uh, useful in every single one uh, case that that is coming through the door. Uh, we have been uh, discussing about ways to uh, potentially um, uh, make it a little easier. I mean, often, I mean, uh, patient representatives are effectively of two flavors: people who actually uh, are a bit um, uh, either are also healthcare professionals in that in that disease, or have been doing this for long enough that they actually become experts. And and these people obviously are very uh, comfortable uh, around uh, you know the the our assessment documents and all the information. But then you have the occasional patient who is actually a bit uh, intimidated by the, the the volume of information. So we've actually been uh, discussing also with applicants whether we could have like a, a specific. Um, um, Part of the of the submission of the briefing document uh, addressed to the patient, so they don't need to be uh, you know in, inundated with all the information, but then all, only given be given the information that's uh, um, relevant for them in order to to provide their input. Of course, the rest of the information would be available if somebody is is interested. So that's the one thing. Um, and then of course we're also waiting for um, things to develop also at ICH level because there's a lot of around patient uh, centered uh, you know uh, drug development, patient focused drug development uh, in terms of uh, patient engagement uh, but also PROs and the patient preferences. So we will looking for you know looking forward to these uh, evolutions to you know better inform how we could uh, in, inform what uh, how we could further improve and already you know well well working uh, you know process. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe Stefano, you wanted to address the other one. Hi. Um, can you clarify what you mean from the ethical aspects? It means for for the the relationship to the fact of the use of animals or the fact that we are on on the organ on a cheap concept because it's it's mainly in vitro assays using uh, uh, stem cells, which are then expanded and then uh, as an in vitro normal methods, but then they are connected to a chip. Uh, so I, I don't see really the, the, the difference in, well, what do you mean with the, the, the ethical aspect? I don't that I heard about that a few years ago and there were all sort of questions also about, I mean, when do you get into the real organ 3D and especially like with uh, neural cells, for instance, like, I mean, some people call it in the media, uh, we didn't like it, but like mini brains or something like that, when the organs really get to resemble an organ, especially when you are using human cells, of course, or when you're using chimeras like animal and human cells. But maybe I'm a bit uh, out of date on that. There is a lot of disinformation in this in this area, and we are we are trying to work to uh, to, to make sure that there is enough communication about this. But uh, yeah, so we are, we are going to have workshops uh, with uh, with stakeholders and uh, whoever wants. And but at the moment, it is not foreseen that uh, this is being a problem for the for the work plan of the first working party because it, the, the research is going towards the stem cells uh, use and uh, the differentiation. And um, it, it is it is always uh, an aspect that needs to be considered, but we are just trying to to really focus the the, the research in the right direction. So it's uh, if there are any ethical aspects, then they will be discussed with the stakeholders at the, at the right moment. Uh, we are not there yet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just the last question, and we close. Thank you. I, I sometimes wonder how much internal 
um, conversation is going on. Because I remember yesterday at the closing remarks from Ema Cook, she said the NCA should get closer to patient organizations. And here we are the next day where the NCA really does not want patients to be involved, maybe wants to, but has not found a way yet. So I think that is a bit of a problem. The other thing is that maybe there's also an opportunity for um, us um, patient organizations to work closer with healthcare professionals, because if a healthcare professional is um, chosen to be an expert, then maybe they can involve an expert patient organization at the same time so that you have the, the healthcare professional and the patient organization, both of them, in those expert committees. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Jose, and, and I think that's good you raised because I think just to clarify, and in no way we want to give impressions that uh, there is no willingness to involve patients and healthcare professionals. I think if it's a new structure, we need to maybe ensure that the extra structure allows patients and healthcare professionals to participate and be involved. I'm not, not, I think we, we are talking about expertise. So I think the expertise can be brought, and I think what is critical is that we need to allow that this network of expertise at the end, because we, we reach to a lot of experts in different fields, are able to contribute to the work of the working party. So maybe we will discuss further internally with colleagues how, how to better do that, but we don't want to give the impression that NCS don't want uh, uh, patients to be involved. That, that's not the case. And I hope colleagues agree on that. So, okay, no, thanks a lot. I think it has been extremely useful, and I hope you agree that uh, it's a good overview of all what's going on in this respect. We will discuss further. We'll come back to you, uh, which are the best mechanisms so that if expertise is there, how this can express their interest to be considered to participate for the European Specialized Expert Community. So I think we now can break for coffee a bit late. Uh, maybe can we try to be back at 11.20? Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. <laughs> Thank you very much. So colleagues, in the interest of time, we need to start. So if you can come in again, thank you. And thank you for waiting, all the participants that are with us online. So we will start with the next part uh, on the agenda. This is a committee feedback. And we will start from the presentations of different committees. I need to say at the beginning that um, uh, there is a note that we'll, we will have no presentation from the Prague committee this time. But we will start with the presentation of CAT committee. And please, Mencia, if you can present. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, OK, so uh, good morning. and. Um, Thank you for listening to the presentation. It is my pleasure to give you an update on the CATS activities. Because we don't have that much time for presenting, I thought to quickly go through um, our work plan and uh, highlighting the activities that uh, might be of most interest uh, for, for these working parties. And then also to briefly stop on the most recent approved ATMPs. Next slide, please. So um, just a few words on how we work and, and, and why the work at the committee makes it very different to the rest. Uh, what CAT stands for is uh, safe and efficacious first-in-class ATMPs. We also stand for including incremental scientific and clinical knowledge in regulatory decision-making. We support ATMP developers, and we are a happy and proud to incorporate physician and patient perspective in our deliverables. We support patient access by addressing root causes of real-world data deficiency and also by linking with HTA bodies. We warn against unproven cell-based therapies and we strengthen communication and exchange with EMA committees and working parties. Next slide, please. The main differences between uh, ATMPs and other medicines uh, are basically that they are complex products to develop, manufacture, characterize, and test. Uh, therefore, they follow non-standard uh, development programs. Uh, they are, they uh, frequently develop novel toxicities. Therefore, there has to be a risk assessment on the insertional mutagenesis events. Um, they must follow specific post-authorization obligations because uh, frequently after the trials and the assessment process has been done, there are remaining uncertainties. 
and it is very frequently that there are no precedent cases for regulatory decision making. Next slide, please. So going to our 2023 work plan, the um, activities that I wanted to highlight uh, are the following. First, on uh, enhancing the benefit risk uh, methodology. Uh, what we are looking is, of course, balancing benefits and risks in a way that they are robust, consistent, and as transparent as possible. And for that, we are contribution to the finalization of the uh, reflection paper on single arm trials. Secondly, on our efforts to improve interactions with HTAs, we are uh, holding product specific discussions on newly approved ATMPs by setting up meetings and webinars to present to HTA bodies the scientific grounds of the approval. Thirdly, on uh, the post-authorization safety and efficacy follow-up of ATMPs, uh, the CAT will prepare this year a scientific publication on the follow-up of patients treated with AAV-based gene therapies and patients treated with CAR T cells. And finally, on the uh, real-world data side, uh, the uh, CAT is keen to use enhanced analysis of re uh, real world data to complement the uh, 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 and, and give an additional perspective to the um, evidence that has been obtained from clinical trials. And there is uh, one specific activity that is a project that I want to present to you very briefly that we are finalizing this year, uh, which is um, the uh, first uh, EMA funded pilot study on SMA. Next slide, please. So um, this first pilot study uh, has used uh, spinal muscular atrophy as the disease uh, that uh, could be ideal to uh, pilot this exercise. So uh, SMA is a um, monogenic disease that in four years of time has gone from not having any therapeutic option to have three approved therapies, being one of them, uh, gene therapy. And uh, therefore, uh, <clears throat> it could be like the good disease to try to understand how real world data could help to follow up uh, in a post approval um, environment. So, what we are doing is we are looking <clears throat> at um, information containing already existing registries. Sorry, next slide, please. So we are looking at the information contained in existing re registries with the objective to, of describing the natural history of SMA, the evolution of the care management over time, and the disease progression considering the new DMTs, using, as I say, the data from registries. A very important secondary objective is that uh, we want, with this uh, pilot, uh, to um, evidence the challenges that this uh, looking into the information that the registries have uh, gives to us and, uh, and the lessons learned by performing this study. We know that the uh, real world evidence is getting more and more attention from, uh, from uh, the EMA and it is a great exercise to understand the challenges that we're going to be facing on a, on a, on a real like um, case. Next slide. So the design is, of course, a non-interventional descriptive registry-based cohort study of SMA patients. The source will be seven European registries covering 10 European countries in which there will be some that are clinical reported, uh, some are patient reported, some are, mi are mixed, and something that I find it has great added value, some of them have patient reported outcomes, so for specific uh, areas that are relevant to patients. The data will cover period from 2010 to 2022, and we will be studying the data of uh, some 2,000 to 1,400 uh, patients. Next slide, please. Um, I'll jump that one in the interest of time. So next slide, please. I won't dedicate more time to that study so that I can have some time to speak about two of the most recently approved uh, um, ATMPs, in which, of course, uh, the CAT has had um, some uh, input. First of them is a gene therapy for AADC deficiency, which is a severe neurological condition. It's an ultra-rare disease that uh, we know about 200 patients. It consists basically on the loss of dopamine production 
and uh, leads to a very disabilitating uh, situation. The um, indication of uh, Upstasa, this uh, gene therapy, is for patients aged old months and older uh, with um, a confirmation of the diagnosis and uh, with a severe phenotype. The, um, the therapy consists on a gene replacement based on AAV2 uh, vector, and uh, the um, method of administration is through an injection directly to the brain. Next slide, please. Some of the uh, aspects that have been specifically discussed at the uh, CAT were the uh, comparability of the manufacturing processes, the relevance of the, the data that came from third countries, the uh, specificities of the administration procedure, the extrapolation to an uh, older or younger patient population, the non-comprehensiveness of data, and the granting of uh, marketing authorization under exceptional circumstances. And then, of course, the follow-up data with the registry-based studies. Next slide, please. So the other gene therapy that has been uh, recently approved, which was uh, in uh, uh, July uh, 2022, is uh, another gene therapy, Roctavian, to treat severe hemophilia A. Uh, this uh, went through a, a single-arm trial that lasted for two years and involved 138 uh, male adult patients. Um, there were um, some other therapeutic options, but they were burdensome. They implied weekly or monthly administration. And with this single intravenous uh, infusion, the results obtained uh, have been uh, very positive. Next slide, please. So um, in uh, uh, after these two years of study, 75.4% of the patients uh, had decreased their symptoms to those of mild hemophilia. Um, the, the yearly number of bleeding episodes decreased by 85.5%, and the need for additional factor VIII replacement treatments dropped by 97.5%. The um, safety concerns are mainly around the hepatotoxicity treated with corticosteroids, and then, of course, there are needs to uh, long-term follow-up for 15 years. And that's all I had the time to say, so next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mencia, for a very clear presentation on a difficult topic. And you were in time, so this is like a precedence for all other presentations to try to get complex things in a short time. So we will continue with CM, a CHMP presentation from Fatima Ventura. Fatima? Yes, thank you so much. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. So, um, next slide. Uh, I have, yes. So, next slide. So, in fact, the last uh, feedback we gave, uh, you can change the slide. The, the last feedback we gave was um, aston astonishingly three years ago, precisely in, in March uh, before the pandemic starts. So we thought, well, what could we say to you on the three years um, um, working uh, activities from CHMP, which were amazingly uh, during this period. So we decided to focus on um, uh, the feedback we we want to give you to on the uh, an initiative we started uh, in um, in twenty 2020, in twenty twenty one, which is the CHMP early contact with patients organizations. We had a p first uh, pilot phase, and we are now uh, routinely doing these. And then we would like also to give some numbers on the participation or the interactions of healthcare professional patients in the context of CHMP activities. Next slide. So on this on this um, early contact with patients organizations, maybe some of you already know of this initiative. The issue was that um, um, uh, routinely patients and representatives and also healthcare professionals are involved in the assessment of uh, CHMP uh, um, procedures, but they are usually intervene late on the procedure, especially when there are major objections. So the, the assessment is not going so so straightforward and we need the input from the, the real world. So the, the aim 
and and in that sense sometimes it is too late to make a, a different uh, uh, orientation of the assessment so the aim with of this uh, pilot was to um, make these current uh, engagement practices more uh, efficient more early uh, so that can be um, of an added value so we wanted uh, that CHMP uh, would be aware of all certain aspects of um, the disease uh, uh, quality of life, the treatment options, and the true and met medical needs. So, since the beginning of the assessment, and not in the late stage of it. So we went. We expected to facilitate also further interactions during the the same procedure with uh, with patients and uh, especially here in, in with patients. In fact, this is uh, included in the CHMP work plan for the last uh, years, and also at EMA's uh, regulatory science uh, strategy. Next slide. So here is more or less where patients uh, and healthcare professionals uh, can intervene during the EMA activities. And the aim of the, 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 this um, initiative is to uh, get the involvement of patients uh, since the first day of the time, uh, the timetable of the assessment, which uh, can last uh, 210 days. So the, the aim, uh, the pilot started with selection of uh, orphan uh, marketing authorization applications. And then uh, patients' uh, organizations were invited to um, uh, share key aspects uh, of, uh, of their perspective uh, of living with the disease. And this was uh, done uh, with some time before the first assessment of CHMPs that occurs at day 80 of the, of the, uh, the timetable. Um, then this information would be shared with the rapporteurs and, then, uh, and also with, um, with the applicants and uh, for uh, transparency issues. And then the rapporteurs would decide if this information was really an added value and uh, useful for the assessment uh, itself. And in the end, if it would be uh, worth it to include in the assessment report. And uh, after this pilot, uh, there was some um, EMA colleagues um, uh, raised a short questionnaire to rapporteurs uh, to check if uh, the, there was some value of uh, the input uh, from patients that were received during the assessment. Next slide. Uh, this, uh, the outcome report of the pilot is uh, published in the email website, so you can uh, then check it uh, later. Uh, next slide. So I must say that in, in general we were kind of proud of the outcome of this pilot because this started uh, in July, well, August 2020 with a group of uh, CHMP members and uh, EMA colleagues uh, and we defined this pilot and it was over 17 months. Uh, there was contribution on 37 procedures and the rapporteurs in general were very positive with the input. They they found it is useful and um, in the in some in, in great majority uh, make a difference in the assessment report of the first assessment report. Special forty one percent of the cases really contributed to this uh, to this assessment. So the input we gave or uh, we received from patients were more or less related with daily impacts, treatment options, perspectives and perceptions of the adverse event effects of the current treatments, uh, what would constitute an important improvement, because sometimes the, 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 uh, the, the small improvement uh, for us, uh, uh, it can be a, a great improvement for patients. And uh, also, what would be the, the wish uh, for the new treatments uh, for patients? Um, and the pilot now is uh, is finished in the July 2022 and is now a current methodology that we are planning to extend also to um, to uh, um, healthcare professionals. Thank you. Next slide. I gave you in two examples where the patient engagement um, uh, was included in the assessment report. This one is from a Fabry disease uh, medicine uh, medicinal product that is uh, uh, included that was included in the CHMP day 100 list of questions. So the first list of questions that go goes to the applicants, and the other uh, next slide. The other is also um, it's from a pump. Uh, uh, treatment next slide that uh, it is uh, 
previews. <laughs> it is on um, included in the day 182nd list of outstanding issues. That means that uh, in the end, it will be likely to be included in the CHMP assessment report report and then it is the EPAR from this product. So the feedback from patients will be uh, publicly available. Next slide. So now, like you said, the early contact methodology is now a regular activity. Uh, we are um, contacting uh, patient organizations every for, um, for not only now for orphan, but also other indications. And like I said, we are ex expecting to extend these also to eligible healthcare professional organizations. Next slide. So overall, since uh, uh, the end of the pilot, we get uh, about, um, let me check because <laughs> about, um, yeah, uh, about 20 in, uh, procedures that we get uh, contributions from, uh, fresh, um, from patient uh, organizations. Uh, and you see we are already uh, getting into non-orphan products. And uh, we are expecting the contributions for uh, this uh, six uh, procedures that started in January. Next slide. I would like to also to give some numbers on the current, uh, well, the, the usual CHMP uh, and patient uh, uh, interaction uh, on CHMP activities over these last three years. And we get from scientific advisory groups, so the SAGs that we had uh, talked about uh, before and ad hoc expert groups in these specific uh, um, areas, about 100 uh, uh, interactions over these three years uh, or about in about 50 meetings uh, of these uh, Groups, um, we have we have the, about almost 200 contributions of patients in scientific advice and protocol assistance, like your Danis mentioned, and also participation of patient representatives in oral explanations at the CHMP. About uh, 20 procedure, um, about 20 inter in interactions in these procedures that uh, are um, are uh, listed in the in the slide. So a very important contribution, although already in the last stage of the procedure. Next slide. For healthcare professionals, the uh, interactions are about 65 uh, during 20 and 21, also on the SAG and ad hoc expert groups, and uh, five contributions uh, uh, for scientific advice and protocol assistance. We don't have data from 2022 because according to EMA colleagues, uh, the methodology of counting the interactions changed, but maybe then we can uh, ask for, um, um, for the details uh, uh, from Maria. I think this is the last slide. Yes, thank you. I would like to thank um, Concha Prieto, that is also my colleague here uh, representing, and also Maria and Ivana for getting the data. Thank you. Obrigado, Fatima. So we will continue with the presentation of um, uh, Comp Committee with Tim Least and Elizabeth O'Rock. Thank you very much. Um, so. We will be giving a bit of feedback on some of the achievements that we have that we have made as COMP in the last year, uh, in 2022. We have only a very short time, I understand, seven minutes, so I will be flying over my part. Um, I know sometimes it will not make sense if you miss the regulatory science background, So, but I guess afterwards questions can be asked if it's necessary, and then the second part will be done by my good friend and colleague Elizabeth here. So. We'll start. I think uh, the first thing that I want that we want to highlight is something near and dear to my heart, mm -hmm. to my own heart, namely ophthalmology and very specifically inherited retinal dystrophies. So last year, after about five, six years of being in the woods, the comp has finally um, come down with a new ontology for IRDs. So how that we will define conditions within IRDs uh, for orphan designation uh, moving forward. So very quickly. What is the problem with IRDs? So if you don't know, or if you know, of course, IRDs, they are what essentially a spectrum disease. So it is a huge group of uh, genetic etiologies that have a very varied um, expression on a phenotypical level. And these uh, expressions can be, uh, I mean, 
even within the same gene, if you, if, if you know, within a family, uh, ch children with the same gene defect can have very different expressions depending on which specific locus is affected, uh, which modifier genes are involved. And now, a big issue with this is that a lot of what we still see today in, in, in science literature is that we are still talking about these diseases in a, uh, what I call the classic classification, so in a phenotypically driven classification. So we talk about retinitis pigmentosa, labors congenital amaurosis, et cetera, et cetera. And these were all names given at a time when people didn't understand the underlying genetic etiology. Now, um, as you can see on the yeah, next slide, sorry, I'm sorry, I should say next slide, next slide. Apologies, yeah, I'm not controlling myself. So as you can see here, this is the bubble that which I keep uh, bring around for five years now, which kind of shows you all these little uh, black things. I know it's not very legible at this size, but all these black uh, things in the bubbles are, are genes. It's, it's very outdated, by the way, because we have now around 345 genes known that cause IRDs. And then the, the actual soap bubbles or the colored bubbles are these classical uh, named um, diseases, you know, con congenital static night blindness, LCA, Ailstrom syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. And you see how much that these overlap and where the same gene can give rise to very different um, classical diseases. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so this actually brought issues on a regulatory level for us. Uh, and here it becomes a bit difficult, but there is a bit of a divide between what we at COMP give as an orphan indication or an orphan condition and what a therapeutic indication is, that, which is what is given by the CSMP at the time of marketing authorization. And to put it very simply, a therapeutic indication can never fall outside of an orphan indication. So an orphan indication should always be as broad or broader than a therapeutic indication by law. Now, in 2018, a product was came to the market, Luxturna, um, and here we had a bit of a problem. And you can go to the next slide, please. Ah, oh, no, no, sorry, it's, not, it's another thing. But the problem here was that Luxturna, uh, when they came to the comp, they uh, received orphan designations for the treatment of retinitis pigmentosa and LCA. But at the time when they passed by CAT and CSMP, they were actually told, because Luxturna is a uh, viral vector that contains a functional copy of the RP60, Five gene, and they were told by CAT and CSMP, no, your indication should actually be treatment of IRDs caused by mutations in the RP65 mutation, which is scientifically the most correct because that's what they're doing. Now, the problem there is that when it comes to IRDs, our knowledge keeps uh, growing and growing every day. And we now, for example, know that one of the diseases caused with R by RP65 mutations is also um, retinitis, pig retinitis pigmentosa with choroidal involvement. Now, despite that it is called retinitis pigmentosa, you can make a very strong argument that it is actually a chorioretinal dystrophy, which is very distinct from typical retinitis pigmentosa. And now the problem, of course, is since they had orphan designations for retinitis pigmentosa and labus congenital amaurosis, this new disease that they can treat with their product does no longer fall within the orphan indication. And technically that would, that would mean that they lose the orphan indication. Now, in this particular case, it was covered with a mantle of love. And we said, okay, there's retinitis pigmentosa in the name, it's fine, it's covered. But it was kind of an indication that in the future, this will happen more and more, especially because genetic treatments are becoming the de facto norm for these IRDs. So we knew we had to do something because our classic phenotypically driven um, ontology was no longer tenable in the face of, of uh, scientific reality. And so we started working on this. And in the beginning, we kind of went all ways. I mean, it, it, it was very bad. We, we, we tried all kinds of things. We gave uh, designations that were not very um, continuous, that, that were bad. So in 2021, um, I actually thought we should really start working on coming to an ontology that is usable and that is fairly robust moving forward. Um, so I was lucky to acquire a book at that time where the authors used a model that I thought would be quite useful to use for us as our orphan, as our orphan designations also. So uh, in 2021, I presented a proposal to COMP. Um, they were all very enthusiastic about this. Uh, we also went uh, to the comp cat meeting when we had a meeting together. We also came to cat, and everybody at cat was also very um, 
uh, happy with that. Now, the problem with that I had is that I think a ID that does not get pushback is not a good idea because it means that either people do not understand the ID or people are not interested. And I don't think the people are not interested. So I think it was mostly that we lack a lot of ophthalmological expertise in, in, the, in, the, in the committees or at least the committees that where, I, where I went to this, the, explain my, um, my model. So we then at COMP decide, okay, we'll, after I pushed for it, that we will form a working group uh, for this. And we start in early 22, where we start to do refinement of my proposal. And very quickly, we start making holes in the model that I proposed. And we very quickly also saw that, that we were not gonna be able to do this by ourselves. So we start preparing and then effectuating a expert meeting in June, 2022 which involved both clinical experts at, in Europe and patient experts on IRDs to see where we should go with this model and, and what would be a good thing uh, for us to move forward. That went actually very well, a lot better than I'd hoped actually. Uh, we had a lot of good discussion also afterwards still with the experts and the, and the patients. And so we had our final proposal last end of last year of the new model that we will be using. And this was now accepted by COMP in January 2023 officially, and it has now also been published on the EMA website. So uh, next slide, please. And, and I apologize for the very small letters here because this is a screenshot from the proposal. But what will happen now is that IRDs that now come to COMP, instead of going with you know treatment of retinitis pigmentosa, there will now be three possibilities. If you come with a very uh, with a gene therapy that's very specific, you will just get inherited retinal dystrophies um, caused by dysfunction of your target gene. The other thing that, that you have to keep in mind is that will also still be products that are very broad, that do not uh, target just a specific gene. Now for them, you see in this table one, we now have a new model that we will use for, for giving uh, the, the designations which is based on my initial proposal, but you don't see much of my initial proposal in there anymore. Unfortunately, it's been very uh, much changed. So, and basically it will come, it will boil down to, are you a syndromic IRD? So are you uh, um, associated with a syndrome like Schubert syndrome or Elstrom syndrome, or are you a sort of standalone IRD that, that, is, that is not associated with, with a, uh, a syndrome? And then in there, we will look, are you cone driven? Which means are the cones first affected? Are you uh, rod driven? Are the rods first affected? And then macular dystrophy, which is a bit of a catch-all term for everything that doesn't fit in the other two uh, subcategories. We have the uh, choroidal dystrophy, so the dystrophy that involves the um, capillaries behind your retina. And then last but not least, we also have the vitreoneuropathies, which are those that involve your, um, your vitreous body of the eye. So this is a model for every treatment that could treat more than one of these IRDs or, or, or more that goes over genes. Um, and then last but not least, there will still be a few um, diseases that do not fit in either of these. And for these, we will still foresee the possibility to have a very specific um, designation. And I think, for example, X-linked uh, retinoschisis is one of those. And now you may say, oh, this looks all very logical, but I can assure you it took a lot of time and effort to come to this, to come to a model that we feel that will also hopefully stand up to the test of time, because this is a field that is in constant motion. And now that we have kind of a, a template on how we did this, this will now also be used by COMP in the future moving forward for a lot of other conditions where we know that they are actually genetic spectrum diseases rather than, than, than specific conditions. And, and we will use this now also to move forward to, to change a lot of ontologies uh, in the future, I think. So thank you. And then my colleague will take over, sorry, for, for the second part. <laughs> All right, it's very short. But before I give you a list of the products, of medicinal products that are authorized uh, last year, uh, next slide, please. Um, just a quick overview, how often designation is decided on by the comp. Uh, well, first, the comp decided very early in, in development, drug development might even be based on non-clinical data or, or very preliminary clinical data, and then they have to decide on the condition. It might be a challenge on itself because uh, it's before the drug development continues in the marketing authorization for the final uh, therapeutic indication as established by the CGMP. So uh, in the first instance, um, whether it's rare, and uh, also in the initial orphan designation, uh, the, uh, the, the comp look whether there's a potential for significant benefit for what's already available for the treatment of that disease. 
And uh, why is that so done early? That's because there are incentives for, for orphan debt in, in any of the products. Um, that's, uh, there is no fee for academia or small and medium enterprises or a low fee for, for the big companies for protocol assistance and uh, the fees for the, uh, if they come through all this process, contract development, if they are successful for marketing authorization applications because there's a subsidiary from the European community. Um, then, uh, of course, marketing authorization is decided by the uh, CSMP. They decide on the benefit risk and the final therapeutic indication for the drug, mostly on its own, not necessarily compared to other treatments. But for the orphan assignations, that might be years in between in this process, we have to check again does it still fulfill the criteria of significant benefit? And uh, because there might have been changes in the treatment paradigm uh, in, in the, all those years that the drug is under development, other treatment may have been approved or um, other methods. Next slide, please. So last year, there were 24 products, um, but um, orphan medicine products, also right, by the CHMP and also uh, got uh, the orphan final orphan designation, the maintenance of that um, by the comp. Uh, 24 of 89, so it's quite a lot, and uh, I think it's about 25 to 30 percent, and it's still increasing interest. So that's a good thing for, for the rare disease community. And th this is a very broad therapeutic range, might be from rare cancers to, to um, hereditary disorders, and I think Mencia um, discussed uh, Upstaza, mm -hmm. which uh, there are also so, for the epidermis bullosa and blistering disease, and I think the, the patient's input was very important here at the CGMP. Next slide, I can discuss them all in this short time frame, sorry, I would love to do that, but uh, <laughs> there's no time for that. But it might be maybe you're not aware of, that it can also be the situation that on itself, the benefit risk is positive for a product, but it's, it's not significant better than anything else that's also right in, in the meantime. And that happened to six products last year. And um, so they are, they are authorized, you, you can use it and, and they are effective and, and uh, they outweigh uh, the yeah, well, the, the safety is acceptable, at least. But um, it, it mostly happens in, in the hemato-oncology field because we've got so many products, so it's difficult to establish whether they're really superior to the other ones. So, uh, of, yeah, and that happened to three products. Um, the fusion, a large B-cell lymphoma, we, we got, I think, about six or eight products in the last year. So it really, it's more and more becoming more and more challenging to see that it's really, really better. And um, other products, uh, the enzyme replacement therapy in pompa disease. Um, we have myozyme and um, an attempt was made by a difference in the utilization of this product um, to make it less vulnerable for antibody, uh, uh, drug antibody formation and to be more effective in the target, uh, which is the muscle, muscle strength. But um, they fail to demonstrate, so it's very difficult. It's a rare disease and a very heterogeneous disease, as most of these orphan diseases are. And uh, in the end, the, um, the studies, uh, yeah, well, it was not, it could not be decided whether it was really superior. And uh, even there was a discussion whether this could be dis considered as new uh, chemical substances. So uh, these are marketed, but um, of are at least uh, marketing authorization, mm -hmm. but uh, not anymore as an orphan product. So they, uh, they don't have the extensive protection of 10 years, but the, the regular protection as for any other product approved by the CGP. Thank you. I don't think we have time for the plan. We'll, we'll skip over that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Just remember, we will have also time for discussion. Also during the lunch, you will not escape. We will get you. 
Uh, and we quickly move forward to a presentation of uh, HMPC from Anne Lean, and it will be done online. Anne Lean, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, here's the feedback from the Herbal Medicinal Product Committee. Uh, it is made under the uh, French agency um, template, but it's uh, a feedback from HMPC. That's my first presentation. Um, next slide, please. So we are currently preparing a new communication initiative for HMPC stakeholders on herbal products. Next slide. So a bit of history, um, why we are there. During the, the Slovenian presidency, we had a presentation on an, from a national competent authority experience with a patient partner. And then the HMPC decided that it would be interesting to have the feedback uh, direct from the patient network experience regarding uh, herbal medicinal product use. And then under the Czech Republic um, presidency, which, which was in, in Malt, uh, we had a discussion uh, within the HMPC members on how to better communicate about herbal scientific data and safety. And then we decided at the HMPC level to include this topic in the work program in uh, this year. Next slide, please. So more details uh, about the national experience with a patient partner. The national um, competent authority policy has uh, had developed an agency openness to stakeholders to enhance the transparency of the work and uh, wish to introduce an added value to the benefits, risk assessment and the decision making process, including patient partners, to also introduce feedback from real life experiences and to support communication reports and dissemination of key information. What has been discussed um, then uh, and the key points uh, highlighted was identify the practices regarding the use of herbal medicinal products, how to communicate about self-medication to healthcare professional and how to find an official information about the risk of herbal medicinal products. Next slide. So concerning the feedback from the patient network, it was a specific patient uh, network uh, dedicated to chronic disease and some concern raised was uh, highlighted, then clarify the statute of herbal products and their labeling because there were so many different uh, statues on the market to promote the scientific information on the risk and possible drug drug interactions notably to create a trustworthy and readable source of information in the official websites to identify a specific concern in that matter if for patient groups like pediatric, geriatric for herbals. And it has been confirmed that uh, the, the patient were has to front the lack of knowledge or the lack of interest on herbal medicinal products. And they really uh, wanted and need to exchange with healthcare professional on self-medication as they are using herbal for to support uh, and as adjuvant for for um, for conventional uh, with conventional treatment or as uh, herbal medicinal product as such uh, for treatment. Next slide. So then we had a very rich uh, exchange. Within HMPC member um, based on the Danish carousel uh, process, and we discussed about how to better share scientific information, how to better share the warnings and interactions we know, how also to better reach the target to give information to stakeholders, like become more friendly and accessible for patients using lay language. Uh, the, the national language is also a key to give logos or colors to be more readable, to also create some templates for reports, uh, giving general information with standard sentences, to give also the same information to patients and care professionals to communicate better on safety. What, 
Next slide. So now the, the, the topic uh, to prepare a new communication initiative for HMPC stakeholder and herbal product has been introduced in the HMPC work program this year and adopted in January, last January. The communication initiative is based on an important knowledge on the assessment of over 200 herbal substances or preparation that are mostly used in self-medication. And the HMPC has the wish to expand this, the communication to patient and consumer and also healthcare professional on really what they need to also contribute of, of, to a safer use of HMP. The key objective of this uh, uh, work uh, of this topic is, are to identify topic on which the external communication will focus and bring together similar initiative already set up by regulatory agency of member states. So we, we would like to be really pragmatic and use the, the, the feedback from what is working well. And to propose after a survey and analysis of key elements, what to communicate, in which form, to whom, in also identifying the opportunities and limits uh, for NCA, uh, NCA on one side and uh, HMPC AMA on the other for a possible start in uh, next year. Next slide. So the activity for this year uh, will be uh, first to compare existing national initiative via a survey in order to identify the needs and experience we have with, within the member states to also analyze the information collected toward a common feasible proposal for improved presentation of HMPC assessment um, to healthcare practitioners and patients, uh, like a communication format and phases on safety and interaction of uh, the recently assessed substances, for example. Also to explore achievable opportunities to publish information on the different status, uh, the differences of between the status of the pro products in cooperation with relevant bodies within and outside EMA. And uh, also to select practical proposal for a patient focused communication initiative to enhance public health and we hope better medical practice. Okay. So um, the idea is to present, uh, to come back, to present you uh, a more uh, pr pragmatic um, uh, project before agreement on specific activities uh, next year. Next slide. So thank you very much for your attention. We are looking forward to the next steps and the project team is, uh, made is, is um, consist in, with uh, all uh, the member of the project is uh, Olga, uh, she's in, in the room, Maria from Portugal, Erika from a uh, Swedish agency, specifically in charge of uh, the statues, the different statuses with Barbara and myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anneli, for the presentation. And we continue with the next presentation of um, PDCO from Jan. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, just um, next slide, please. Just want to show you two slides. Um, and this is about two reports that just came out uh, a month ago. The first is the boosting by the European Commission, is the boosting the development of medicines for children, closing report on the European Medicines Agency and European Commission, action plan for, on pediatrics, which uh, covers the last five years uh, after the first five years and uh, everything that has been uh, achieved and is um, uh, published in this report. Um, as also new, several new, I think plenty new developments. Um, it's about identifying pediatric medical needs. It's um, 
uh, the, the detected in, and, and, and constructed in workshops. Also, we have this Accelerate uh, Pediatric Strategy Forums with the, with, uh, the EMA, uh, mainly in pediatric oncology, where specific uh, oncology diseases are tackled uh, with experts and developments uh, created and problems solved. Uh, then strengthening of the cooperation of decision makers. Our collaboration with the FDA is developing fine. We have an Emprima uh, consortium with uh, 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 scientific societies and regulator rating, uh, regulators over the world, uh, Canada, uh, Japan, US, and EMA. Um, uh, where also, uh, I think, uh, developments have been established and working with the uh, human HTA bodies. Then uh, there are several achievements and reports on ensuring timely completion of pediatric investigation plans, um, trial preparedness, and, uh, and uh, being, uh, being sure that publications will follow shortly, reflection papers in uh, new developments where not much knowledge is available, but some structure is uh, necessary, uh, extrapolation paper which has been uh, published and has huge impact on uh, the, 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 the pediatric investigation plans because the extrapolation of adult data should not be uh, necessarily have to be completed, uh, completed. Uh, then uh, the structured guidelines like just one published on diabetes mellitus after many drugs have been uh, studied and are in study to get a really uh, a better structure in the development. Then improving the handling of the PIP applications with a stepwise PIP um, and having a pilot that uh, is, uh, will shortly start. And also one of the things is to scrutinize waivers and deferrals in PIPs that come back in a minute to this. And then lastly, increasing transparency around pediatric medicines, which means that community registries for medicines and community registries for trials are stimulated to um, make uh, the, what we do more transparent. Next slide, please. And the other uh, paper just uh, uh, issued a month ago is the guidance on this stepwise PIP. Um, which uh, because it takes too long uh, to, to after adult development to get the, the, the pediatric work done. So there should be really tried to shorten this. So, um, and this is a, there's an, a serious attempt with adapting uh, regulatory processes to better support innovation, launch of a pilot phase of the stepwise PIP agreement, so to, to get it uh, expertise, then certain cases, uh, to agree on partial development program, conditional on the development of a full PIP, once evidence becomes available over time, which means that we do partial age waivers and so can get things going. At, uh, in many cases in adolescents who join adult, adult programs, but then structured in a PIP, then allow agreeing on PIPs for innovative medicines where crucial information is not yet available. Like an, an example is no validated biomarkers, SPD endpoints, but uh, they might uh, get validated in due course, but then the, the PIP could start and we are not uh, burdened this with uh, old and too uh, uh, for, for children uh, um, burdening uh, endpoints. Uh, planning the conditions and milestones for companies to return EMAS pediatric committee and discuss the uncertainties once more data are available and then the stepwise development with fixed steps and deadlines avoiding modifications, which also are uh, delaying the modification or delaying things. We should do this earlier. And as I said in the, the, pre the previous slide, like uh, deferrals and waivers for the lowest ages can also be uh, addressed earlier if you do it in a stepwise manner. So I think this probably is also a very good step forward uh, mm -hmm. Above all the obvious uh, uh, challenges to shorten the period, um, and we are just have st starting it, and uh, so we will see forward and will report to you uh, in a year time. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Excellent. We managed to squeeze the 10 minute delay into just three minutes. So we have now uh, many possibilities to ask questions. So I'm opening the floor, please. Thank you. And Stella from Beuk. I have a question about the orphan products. And so when there's a satisfactory treatment on the market and a newcomer wants to, so do they provide, do they do comparative trials to, to, to show the like the significant benefit, the, the information you get? <laughs> That would be a dream if they do that, <laughs> but 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 no, it's, it's very rare that we have comparative trials for that. Uh, often they will come with uh, animal studies and then try to extrapolate from there. Or no, no. Or sometimes they have some proof of concept studies, but it would be a dream if they all came with comparative studies. But no. So often it is a very difficult discussion, especially for crowded areas. You know, you have what. I like to call this profitable orphans, you know, in oncology where it's so crowded and where everybody wants to be, where I always wonder, do we really need them, give them orphan? But okay, that's a discussion for another day, but no. So it is a very difficult discussion, and no. Thank you very much, Ansela, for the question. And we are moving from Francois. So first, a question to, to COMP about the multiple uh, orphan designations, if you could discuss the consequence on the total population when it's then above or when it remains below the prevalence threshold, and also in relation with the discussions <coughs> um, in the revision of the orphan drug incentives and to prevent the accumulation of designations for the same product. And my second question, more to, to Fatima. <coughs> So I think we, we, we've seen all this effort to engage patients uh, with the CHMP during the evaluation, but still there is an attrition uh, from the scientific advice to the early dialogues, SAGs, and oral explanation. Not all products benefit from discussions with patients on benefit risks, and I think the majority uh, don't. And, and maybe we could think first of a new pilot at day 80 on the report when the um, assessors, when the experts are discussing the effect tables, which are the key benefits, key risks uh, that we should focus the, the discussion on. At that stage, to ask patients and clinicians if they think that it's the right effect table of, or if other effects should be uh, incorporated here. And also to plan patient preference studies starting uh, with this uh, reflection on, on the effect table. And there are so many other aspects that we could think to improve even more the, the involvement of patients <coughs> with the CHMP. And uh, maybe we could even think, and that's in relation with the previous discussions, uh, to have a kind of a, um, external experts engagement task force uh, to structure more uh, how we engage patients and clinicians in all these procedures, because sometimes um, we, we duplicate. The EMA would be contacting patients uh, on, 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 and, and, and simultaneously we would be consulting the, uh, contacting the, the same patients. Uh, I think if not today, but maybe we could reflect on how we could maybe have the uh, experts in patient engagement working together and advising and brainstorming on where to find patients with these conditions or using this medical device. I think in the future we may benefit from stru structuring together uh, something here. Okay, so I'll first come to your discussion about stacking. So, um, Yes, it's true right now, you, you can stack orphan designations on a single specialty and then they are all treated as kind of independent. So you can get a, an orphan designation A, then 10 year exclusivity on that. Orphan uh, designation B, 10 year exclusivity on that. So when your exclusivity on A runs out, you can have competitors for your product, but only for indication A, whereas they would still not be able to add indication B because that's still going. Um, on the new regulation, now, is this a problem? Yes. In, in practice, I'm not sure if it's really a problem. I'm not sure if there are that many products out there that really stack an enormous amount. And I know there have been worries about evergreening uh, that, that happens this way. And I've long before I joined Comp, I believe there was a case where this was attempted. But uh, if I remember, I don't remember which product it was, but you know, I vaguely remember the, the introduction that we get at Comp. This was eventually resolved legally. Um, 
but in 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 practice i don't think we see it very much um but theoretically yes it, it could be a problem um of course the good thing is that this way you also on the positive point there is that you do not need to introduce a new specialty every time you know like the problem is if if the other option would be that that, that for every time you have a new orphan indication the same product would have to come to the market again under another name and go through the whole marketing authorization uh, pro procedure again, delay, in a way delaying your, your product. So there are benefits and, 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 and cons here. And if I remember right what I read in the leaked proposal, and now we're, I don't know, can I discuss this because we're going into dangerous territory now? I believe they will now limit it to two on, on the product, right? And then uh, it's also a cumulative, cumulative 10 years. I personally do not yet know where I stand on, on, on that, to be honest. Um, I understand why they do it. On the other hand, I'm a bit afraid it will maybe also disin disincentivize a bit to keep working on a product and, and keep adding patients under the treatment umbrella for that product. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm on two legs about it. Like on, on the one end, I, I can I can see why, but on the other end, I also see a lot of cons. And, and it, it, I don't know. And I, and I have to be careful because it's, of course, not official. But, yeah, I, I'm not really sure yet what I, what I think about it. My, my first reaction was a bit, mm, what are you doing? Uh, because you will, you will make it more difficult now. You will, some products that may have four will now have to come twice to the market as two different products, two different specialties. And as far as I know, there's no um, way now that, for example, for the second product, they could have a, a reduced um, MA procedure, so they would have to go to the whole thing again. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure where I stand. I'm sorry. I, I can't give you a definite answer on that. Uh, thank you very much. Prior to going to Fatima, we have a comment. Yeah. But uh, why would the, the product have to go again through marketing? Because... It happens for other products, so it, they get one more year. If within the, I think it's nine years or so, they, they extend, they add one more indication. So if this happens for non-orphan products often, right? So why would for orphans be more complex? Uh, I'm asking. Well, now you want, you, know, you want to get and take it if you want. Yeah. It, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be more complex, but uh, we have to compare then again in that for that condition. So if, uh, yeah, sorry, it's a very <laughs> challenging to answer with. Uh, if it got another condition, then you have to compare it to the other products as well again. So I don't see whether it's really, really so different. Not to mention, again, commercially speaking, I mean, if I were a company and I had to do redo all my marketing products for a new product with a new name, I, I'm, that's why I say I'm on two legs. I, I understand what you say. It, it may not be the most complex thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. But, but now, of course, what you do for orphans is you just at new orphan designation and you get 10 years, 10 years, 10 years. Yes, for that indication, just for that indication. It's not for the product, it's for the yeah. indication. Yeah. But I mean, I read that there are about an interesting article, so around 17 orphan products where you have this stacking. But I think the question is also like the subsetting, the, the salami slicing, the so-called, and I think with personalized medicine, uh, we could end up accumulating I mean, unless the comp is very strict about, you know, what's orphan and what's then all this uh, subsetting and we, we could end up accumulating 10 and 10 and 10. And uh, and I think, I wonder if that's what maybe they want to prevent this, this potential um, or, or, or providing over incentives, you know, I mean. No, I, I can say that comp is generally allergic to subsetting in any way. So, and. When I was talking about the orphan, the, the, I, the IRDs, that, we, that was one of the worries that we had when we were discussing potential new ontology. Because there you will have, for every gene, technically you can have a gene therapy. But right now, it is, there is actually, legally it is allowed to subset if 
your disease or your product defines the condition in itself. So, and that is so for a gene product. Now, how will I go for personal medicine? Maybe, maybe they will be able to, to do, but to be honest, it's also something that, that we haven't yet seen, despite their coming, that we start seeing these, these mm-hmm. genetic products coming out. So we haven't seen the problem yet. And in theory, yes, in practice, I, I don't know. And, but yes, you are right. It, it, it is, of course, maybe a way to deal with that. I'm, I'm still not convinced it's, it's completely correct. But as I said, it's it's leaked. I have to be careful. And I'm, I'm still on two legs about it a bit myself. So. Thank you very much, Fatima. Well, thank you, Francois, for the comment. And, and also, I have to thank you for all the contributions that are already said done during the pilot and the after pilot. I think what you are mentioning is like a second stage of the, the early contribution. Uh, in that matter, the day 80 um, assessment report and other, uh, the list of questions is, is a confidential documentation. So we'd have to, to check how this could be arranged. So the first contribution that we ask, uh, patient organizations are blinded uh, uh, to any details from the dossier, right? It's just an indication and the, the active substance. So in a way, you are right. Maybe when we go further on the SMS, assessment, we could have some feedback. So in the middle of the procedure, so not leave it to the end. I think we can uh, we can uh, discuss that. And uh, also the your, um, your suggestion for a better um, cooperation between all these uh, um, activities where patients and healthcare professionals participate is also, uh, I'm, I'm willing to participate in such a a uh, brainstorming um, uh, group uh, that we could make it more flexible, more more value added uh, to the, the whole system. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, maybe, I don't know if Maria wanted to know. Okay. So that is a uh, point taken and I think it's very important to uh, comment. Thank you, Francois. If, thank you, Fatima. And we can add this to the table of actions and make a call for anyone who is interested in joining this uh, this group. So thank you very much. Uh, comment to that or okay just a short comment and then we'll go to Josie yes very quick just to say as, as Virginia said we actually do have experience with this in comp because we have permanent patient representatives and I do think that works really well and think it's a very good idea that this should be extended to to other committees and, and honestly I would like in comp even to have more than two I would like to have six or seven patient representatives they are really valuable they really well and I think if you have a brainstorm about that do contact the comp to have people from the comp uh, work with you because we have the, the experience in that. So, Thank you, team. And we go to Josie. Thank you. I have a question for Mencia. Um, I believe that um, a lot of the products that are um, come under your cat are terribly expensive. And um, once um, the patients enroll in a clinical trial, they will continue to, to receive the product. But after that, it's hugely expensive. And you said that you have, um, uh, you, you, you interact with HTA, but um, that surely that must be different in each country because some countries um, perhaps is, is funded by insurance and, and partly by other um, organizations. So how do you go about getting the product to the patients? can go. So what we are trying to do is to simplify because of this uh, or one of the reasons uh, of uh, compromising access of uh, patients to approved therapies is of course the the um, the um, price. We can't we can't address that issue directly. What we can do is uh, to try to simplify the processes uh, that go through the HTA bodies so that they are not they don't add extra requirements of extra evidence or they don't consider the evidence that has been uh, used for regulatory approval uh, insufficient. So there is where we're, we're trying to, 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 to soften and make things easier. But then, but then the, the price negotiations are just beyond our scope. Thank you very much. And we go to Rui. 
Yes, hi, Rui Castro from United European Gastroenterology. I also have a quick question to Mencia about the <clears throat> MFA-funded pilot study on the, the spinal muscle atrophy. I, I wasn't aware that Emma was doing this type of studies, uh, registry-based cohort studies, which I think are really, really important. And I was just wondering whether you are all planning in the near future to do similar studies like this one, and if not, why not? <laughs> and if so, what is a little bit rational for choosing a particular disease for, for doing this type of study? So obviously, it should be a disease with uh, limited therapeutic options or with medicines that have been recently approved and put into the market. Uh, but what's the rationale for choosing a, a disease for these kind, kinds of studies? Thank you. So the idea behind choosing uh, SMA was, uh, well, firstly, because uh, it went through a procedure at the CAT for a gene therapy that was approved um, two years ago. And um, uh, it's a pilot uh, study, so it really had the possibility. There were various networks of registries. There was... Um, it was the good possibility to just pilot how this would work. We uh, During the procedure in which I must say I was not yet part of the CAT, but uh, I know that I did participate in some, I was invited to participate in some of the discussions, but um, there is always the problem of the... Um, if the evidence that with which the, uh, the product is uh, recommended for approval is enough, and then all the post-authorization follow-up, we, we have to start relying on real-world evidence, and therefore it really seemed like the right disease in which to, to, to look at. Because there were three therapeutic options, we can also try to look at the fitness for purpose of the existing registries to capture any change that these therapies could bring. So again, that was, I think, it was a positive feature. Maybe you you don't think the same, but... but uh, <laughs> so, and about the question on whether there are going to be more or not, um, the, for the moment, there are no plans. <laughs> so this, let's see what the outcomes come. As I said, there was uh, this uh, great secondary objective, which is to look at and analyze the challenges and the lessons learned with this pilot, and from there we will move. And then, of course, there is all the Darwin uh, EU efforts that are uh, concentrating on real-world data. So... Awesome. Uh, so the question on, on the blindness prevention, I think you're speaking about a possible secondary effect of one of the therapies, but that is not on the EPAR. I think it's a, it's, it has been outruled as a secondary effect. No, but about the, the, the question, why choosing this disease? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, I think it's also because it's... Uh, no, you, you have to use the mic. Yeah. It's, very, it's very debilitating, and also it causes blindness. And you can prevent it, and that, that's what it does. If you're okay, early enough. Talking about different diseases there. So SMA, uh, it, it, it doesn't carry out blindness. It's muscle weakness. It's a neuromuscular condition. To just to add, I, I was not questioning why this disease was. I think it was rightly done. So, but just wondering for the future, if there would be another uh, pilot studies, how would the decision be made? So, so it was just that. Thank you. That's often question now on the study. Um, what would be very relevant if we know the relative effectiveness of, of treatments because they came on the market in a very short time frame and we have no comparative data, so it's very difficult for, maybe not for the gene therapy, but, but for the other ones, it will be very difficult to make a decision, one is intertakal, one is oral, which to take for the prescriber. And I really hope the study will help for that, but it's, it's not really designed that way. It's not possible, I guess, for real evidence. Thank you. No, I, 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 um, I have two children living with SMA myself, so that's the question that I would love to answer and, and, and know if I'm losing my time on the wrong, incorrect therapy. Um, so we have to, um, to manage expectations because uh, also we have to think that the registries and the data sets of the registries were designed before there was any treatment available. So they are not, they are not designed to assess the safety or efficacy of DMTs. Nevertheless, we are going to try to analyze the uh, the uh, the effect of the and the safety 
but the fitness for purpose is going to be the big question. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have no questions in Webex. Do we have another, like a final question? Yes, please. Thank you, George Batista, representing the community pharmacies from PGU. And my question goes for the Herbal Medicine and uh, Medicinal Products uh, Committee. Um, so at the community pharmacy level, we see an awful lot of confusion between um, herbal medicines and food supplements and uh, patients taking them interchangeably, um, not really acknowledging what is a, if it's a medicinal product, if it's a food supplement. We know that EFSA uh, has uh, um, been a bit slow, let's say, on the... Um, uh, on the analyzing of the botanical claims and the health claims. Uh, the European Commission uh, can also do a fair share on, on that part. Uh, my question is if there is any uh, future perspectives on enhancing communications either with patients or with healthcare professionals and maybe work, working closely with EFSA on this uh, regard uh, because we see this as a potential problem and we're very much uh, concerned at the pharmacy level. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. It's uh, really a topic that is uh, 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 handled uh, as a, in the work program um, um, of the HMPC, and uh, of course we are we are really uh, aware of that that problems, and also to to give the information. It's it's really in the work plan to to work on that on that difficulties with the differences with the statues and to clarify the the, um, the different statues of the products and and of course we work we we plan to work with EFSA because we often have information or or, or we share some uh, publications with EFSA and we have direct con contact as HMPC with the EFSA but um, by the end of the year we will come back with some uh, some uh, some some more mature proposal to discuss with you and and then we can exchange on on that top, on that to specific topic that is of uh, important for the clarification and the use of herbal medicinal products thank you very much anli i propose that we close this session and i have just two announcements to make one is that um, uh, there will be uh, there is a restaurant on the second floor you can use. Uh, you can pay with the contactless card. The second one is that you need to be back at 1.29 because <laughs> at 1.30 we will start. Short. We will start. Thank you. <laughs>
aspects that we need to consider for the whether or not to consider a product as a medical device has to do with what it's the intended purpose. So the product he has to have a specific medical purpose that it's defined in the regulation. And also the mode of action needs to be taken into consideration, meaning that it cannot have its principal mode of action being based on any uh, pharmacological, immunological or metabolic means, uh, uh, in case it would be a, a medicine, of course. Medical devices are structured by risk classes, so from the lowest risk class, the class 1 medical devices, which are generally uh, more consumer products used, so the risk is quite low. You, you can be familiarized with most of these devices, so from glasses to wheelchairs. Uh, and then it goes up to class 2A, which would be already a, an intermediate class risk, to the really higher risk classes like class 2B or class 3, the, the highest class risk. It's important to also refer here that unlike the medicines regulation, in the medical devices there are third parties involved in the assessment which are the notified bodies. The notified bodies are designated by the member states. It can be either private or public entities. And it's for them to do the part of the assessment with the compliance with the European regulation before a device can be placed on the market. The remit of that assessment goes from uh, um, it only applies to the higher risk products, so it goes from class 2A to 3 and some specific types of class 1 devices, but even then it's not for the whole device itself, it's for a specific part of that device, meaning that, for instance, if it's a class 1 sterilized medical device, the notified body's assessment will only focus on the sterilization process and not the product itself. This, in the same way for in vitro uh, medical devices, the the definition is also helpful to understand what, what's being covered by the, the remit of this um, regulation. And it's basically a very different types of products. It covers from reagents to calibrators to instruments itself that are intended by the manufacturer to be used for in vitro examination, so in vivo tests are excluded from that definition, and also that it's the samples need to come from the human body, so other sources of, um, of tissue or blood are excluded for this. So, for instance, tests that are specifically destined to be used in veterinary, uh, in a veterinary context, are not included in this um, definition. And then it's for purposes of uh, following up on any physiological or pathological processes or states or any condition, congenital conditions or a predisposition to a condition or a disease. So the definition is quite broad on the, on the purposes of the in vitro diagnostic medical devices. So they are covered by two different regulations, the medical device regulation and the in vitro uh, device regulation. The implementation has suffered some backs and forth also with, uh, with the, the, the COVID pandemic. It had to be the full implementation is ongoing, but the end of the transition period has been su successfully um, extended and very recently there was another extension that was um, given to the application because of many aspects that we don't need to cover here today. Regarding the expert panels on medical devices, they were created by uh, both the medical device regulation and the in vitro device regulation, and they are their main function is to provide scientific assessment and advice in the field of medical devices and in vitro medical devices. 
the panel members are experts in their own field and they are appointed by the European Commission based on a call for expression of interest where it is detailed what are the needs in terms of scientific, clinical and technical expertise that would apply to those experts. Um, the Secretariat for the Expert Panels has been uh, up until one, 1st of March 2022. It was provided by the Joint Research Center, but since then it has transitioned to the EMEA and it's now provided by the Expert Panels and Groups Office where I work. It's organized into 12 different panels, one of which has some specific characteristics and it's called the screening panel and I will elaborate a little bit further on its function uh, after this. So in reality there are 11 thematic panels, one being specifically for in vitro diagnostics. Um, and you can see that the, there is also the support of a central list of available experts that can be called in for specific procedures. And all the expert panel's activity is also uh, coordinated by a, a committee where the chairs and vice chairs of all the panels sit. So you can see that there are these are this is organized in clinical areas and some of the clinical areas are quite big so they were reorganized in subgroups as is orthopedics or the circulatory system for instance. The expert panels have two types of activities mandated by the regulation. Some are mandatory activities which are procedures that need to be followed depending on the type of device and some are what we call ad hoc activities meaning that these are activities that can be requested uh, by either the commission or member states. For the first of those mandatory procedures we have what we call the clinical evaluation consultation procedure CECP for short and it's applicable to all class three implantable medical devices. I have a few examples here. So these are the highest risk medical devices uh, class and specifically the implantable ones, it adds a, a, an additional layer of risk. Or also, and that's a specific type of products, the class 2B active medical devices destined to administer or remove a medicinal product. This is a specific part of, a, of a, the classification of the regulation. It's uh, the first part of Rule 12, and it covers basically the... Um, so we're talking about dialysis machines, ventilators, uh, infusion pumps. So it's equipment destined specifically to uh, administer or remove medicinal products. Mm -hmm. Airways for the Class 3 implantable medical devices we have a lot of implantable active medical devices for cardiology, for instance, as are pacemakers, ICDs, implantable um, cardioversor defibrillators, IPGs, in, uh, impulse, um, implantable uh, pulse generators, or commonly also called new neurostimulators, for instance, if they are used in the neurological uh, setting. Breast implants, it's a special category of implants that was promoted to class 3, as were the joint prosthetics. So the procedure is focused on a specific part of the assessment that is conducted by the notified body. So the notified body assesses what it's provided by the manufacturer as being called the clinical evaluation report and the notified body produces its own assessment report which is then called the clinical evaluation assessment report and it's on that document and the associated documents with it that the expert panels need to provide an opinion so uh, an opinion it's a non-mandatory uh, opinion or uh, uh, um, uh, an advice 
on what was assessed by the notified body. These are publicly available on the Commission's website. I have here the link for you in case you want to check those that are published. Some of them are redacted while the conformity uh, process uh, while the conformity assessment process is still ongoing. There is an intermediate phase between the production of an opinion and the submission, which is where the screening panel intervenes. And the screening panel has one function, to determine whether or not an opinion is needed for that specific device. And that is based on three different criteria. One is the level of novelty that the device involves, combined with the possible clinical impact or health impact of that novelty. So just a novelty with no impact or no, with no clinical impact would not trigger the need for an opinion. The other two are valid health concerns. So we um, have sometimes these broad um, communications that come from the European Commission regarding, for instance, um, a, a whole group of devices, as was, for instance, the the at um, is the, um, the the breast implants. For instance, some types of breast implants are under special surveillance by the um, the 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 vigilance group. So we do get that information from them, or we could also get information on an in significant increase of serious incidents that would also trigger a specific uh, need for an opinion on that device. Similarly, for the in vitro medical devices, we have the Performance Evaluation Consultation Procedure, so the PECP, and that it's mandatory for all Class three IVDs, and these can be broadly grouped into two different groups of products. One, it's the, 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 the infectious agents that are either linked to transfusional medicine safety or the ones that have on its own uh, uh, the possibility of causing a life-threatening disease and they have a high degree of propagation as was the case with SARS-CoV-2, as is the case with HIV, HPV, HCV, HD, uh, HCV, HDV, I'm sorry, no, I, I, there is a, a typo there. Um, and also, for instance, treponema polydom that comes from that setting of the transfusional medicine safety. And also the IVDs that are uh, determined to be used for five blood group systems, AB0, rhesus, CAL, KID, and Duffy. And even for CAL, it's just one antigen. It's just the major CAL antigen that it's uh, under this. The PCP is, as I've told you, mandatory for all class D IVDs, but it has some specific rules of exemption. Namely, if there are already common specifications available for that type of device, common specifications are technical rules for assessment of a type of device that is published as a, a, as a legislative act, meaning that they replace the, the need for a, view, for a view for an advice on that device because it's already published what it's needed for the approval of that specific IVD. And very recently, there was the first batch of common specifications was published by the Commission. So a lot of uh, IVDs are now exempted from following this procedure. And also, the way the process was set up is that whenever a type of device that came for this procedure was certified, then the same type of products would not need to come again. So they would just have to have a look at what was published in that advice, which we call in this case for the, the, the IVDs, we call it a view. And then they would be also exempted from following the procedure. Um, so it's an, unlike the CECP that I've just presented to you, here there is no screening phase because 
if the device meets the conditions and there are no exemptions to the procedure, then it's uh, a, a view is needed. Apart from these mandatory activities, the expert panels have what we call uh, ad hoc activities, which are done in an advisory role. So they advise either the member states to the medical device coordination group, the MDCG, or the commission on any issue regarding safety or performance of medical devices. They also contribute to guidance and common specifications, and they also can provide advice to manufacturers of class 3 devices and class 2B active devices, again intended to administer or remove a medicinal product. So the same first part of Rule 12. You've noticed that in this case, for advice to manufacturers, the remit is a little bit broader. So it's not just class 3 implantable medical devices, it's all class 3. And this takes us to what is currently going on. We have an ongoing pilot for scientific advice, specifically focused on this type of product. The submissions is, are currently ongoing. They've started very recently. And we will use this pilot to, uh, in a way, build what will be the final process for uh, scientific advice in the future. So we've decided to take, during this year, 10 scientific advice procedures in two phases. So first we'll take five pilot projects and then uh, after September we'll take another five depending on adaptations that are needed. Um, in case the applications uh, are uh, exceed the number of 10, we will use a selection process to ensure that different areas are covered but also that specific current needs for devices uh, in the European Union are in a way supported by this pilot project. So we will be specifically targeting devices that are developed to help treat uh, or diagnose um, a, a, a disease or condition that affects a small number of patients, namely what it's commonly call, called the orphan devices, or devices that are uh, used uh, for for in for p uh, developed for pediatric use only. Uh, we'll also be targeting devices that are conceived for unmet medical needs, what the, the guidance calls a breakthrough device, meaning that it's a device for which there are no um, uh, really good alternatives at the moment, or on the opposite. The, the really novel devices where we can have potentially a major clinical or health impact. So we'll also be targeting those and prioritizing those. This is in line with what it's called now the, the new policy of the Commission for supporting the transition to the new medical device framework. And you can see here that this pilot project is highlighted as one of the measures that the Commission is promoting to help with the development of these high-risk medical devices. Also, the, the, support, the specific support to tailored solutions for the development of orphan devices, it's mentioned here in the fact sheet. So, the current pilot project that it's ongoing, it's this uh, timeline, the timeline, the timeline is still tentative, so we'll need to adjust. That's why we are having the pilot, of course. And it started on the 27th of February with the submission of letters of interest, where the applicants submit a high-level information on what the type of device is, what they would like to um, ask in the, for the further development. And this process will go on until um, until th uh, the end of March, and from in February in April, sorry, we'll start with the selection of the first five applications for this first phase, and then we'll repeat the process at a later phase after September with the adaptations that might be needed then. Just to give you a quick overview of the process, so. All the processes will take place more or less in during 60 days, so the procedure 
as the duration of 60 calendar days, but it, these might need to be adjusted depending on experts' availability and the nature of the request, of course. But we'll also include a mandatory pre-submission meeting, which is in this case destined specifically to help the applicant prepare the process for the, the scientific advice application, because we understand that in this specific setting for, for medtech uh, industry, some applicants might not be very familiar with the process, so we need to give as much input as needed so that they get the most out of this uh, advice also. Uh, the, currently, the pilot phase is, on, is ongoing without any fees charged to the applicants, so it's quite appealing at this stage. At the end, every procedure will always include a discussion meeting with the applicant to ensure that there is the maximum of input being done before the final advice is produced and uh, the regulation foresees that the advice should be published uh, although taking into consideration uh, commercially confidential information but during the pilot phase we'll will not publish any of the advices given so and it brings us to this specific topic which is the patient involvement and <coughs> healthcare professional involvement in the uh, expert panel's activities. And in this particular case, we have a specific article in the medical device regulation where this input is foreseen. So it's Article 106.4, where it's mentioned that the expert panel should take into, consider, into account relevant information provided by stakeholders, including patients, organizations, and healthcare professionals when preparing the scientific opinions. Um, whereas for healthcare professionals, probably that input comes already from the nature of the expert panels and how it's composed. I've grouped here for your information how more or less it's, what, what is the background of uh, these experts? And for instance, the vast majority are medical experts, which are active practitioners currently, most of them are active surgeons in their field, and they are members of academia and or scientific and clinical societies. We have 25 members of the IVD panel, which is a very specific type of expertise that combines technology with infectious disease epidemiology, and they are also members of academia and clinical and scientific societies. And then we have more or less around what we call technical experts, so from very specific types of technology to uh, methodology, for instance, and they cover all types of medical technology in a more specific sense, so that they are not in a specific, they are sometimes in a specific panel, but they provide input that it's sometimes more general, like is in methodology, for instance. Whereas to collect patients and healthcare professional inputs, there is already in place a vi vigilance system that is set up at national level by member states. So they collect a lot of what is the current experience with medical devices, especially associated with incidents, meaning serious uh, inj injuries caused or potentially caused by medical devices or associated to its use. So both patients and healthcare professionals have a very active role uh, in setting up and keeping these systems uh, running. Manufacturers are also a very important part in these systems and we are currently liaising with the expert group at the commission where these uh, issues are after they were analyzed by the member states where they are then discussed at the uh, further le at a higher level and then we'll try to liaise with them to collect this information for our consultation procedures. But it's also possible that we identify specific groups or categories of devices where specific, a specific need of input might be needed. So that's also something that we are considering, asking our experts which types of products in general would benefit from general input either from patients or from healthcare professionals. So that could also be a way forward. And that concludes my presentation and I'm
open to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, prior to opening the floor to the question, just an information. So a call of in a call of interest for expression of interest to join the medical device shortage steering group was launched in mid-February and when the process will finish you will be all informed by Ima what happened and now I'm opening up the questions and I think Carl was the first one yeah thank you for your presentation I'm, I'm one of these colleagues involved in the screening part but I think you have to be clear on that I'm over there as a clinical expert and I do one specific file assessment, just like I do for FAHO, EMA on drugs. And the input that we may need from um, healthcare professionals and, 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 and patients is perhaps also different on needs, on potential shortages, because I, with the pediatric background, we do have concerns that based on what I've seen, that we will end up with another off-label setting and that, um, the machine is there, but it's not allowed to be used under a given weight category. And then we'll end up with other problems. So it's not just often in the indications, it's, it's likely also often populations. And it will be up to us to, to mention this because also our hospitals are very uncomfortable with that. Uh, although they have accepted for, for 50 years that we prescribe off-label, they feel much more uncomfortable if we use medical devices off-label likely because legal perceptions have changed over time. So there is a major concern, at least from a pediatric point of view, on that, and I assume that is also applicable to other populations. So we will need this input to know where the shortages are, uh, and, and let's say the field's not yet covered by industry. Thank you very much. It's a very important point. It, it allows me to clarify a little bit better. So I, I fully agree with you that we do need, it's a different type of input that we need at a certain stage. But um, the our focus here on orphan devices would be mostly on how could we contribute more of a as a, as a scientific assessment alternative to what we currently have. Because we know that in terms of evidence generation and when it's presented for as assessment, it's completely different when we are dealing with a, a highly used product or an orphan device. So the challenge is also in terms of what would be needed in terms of development and uh, 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 clinical data to allow uh, 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 in this case, I was thinking a regulator, but a notified body, which is the, doing the assessment as a third party, mm -hmm. to be confident on the safety and the performance of that device. So it would be very much focused on that. But I also have to mention that the Commission is setting up, has set up already, uh, a task for specifically for orphan devices. And some of these actions are just part of that huge program which covers from the scientific uh, support to manufacturers to other types of actions. Whereas for off-label use of medical devices, it's, uh, as you understand, a little bit outside our, our remit, but we do understand it's an issue, yes. Thank you. The point that I try to make is that besides often indications, there could also often populations, even a stupid ventilator, the thing I use on a daily basis, needs to be uh, uh, useful in, in, in given populations. So that's the point that I want to make that is very much beyond uh, often indications as we could end up with often populations. Thank you. We will first go to Gualberto and then to Marcin. Uh, thanks, Miguel, for the very clear and comprehensive overview. Um, I would like to ask you if you have considered uh, specific attitudes or pathways for digital therapeutics, uh, which are uh, at the top of the digital medicine, probably, uh, even if uh, the number of these products is quite low at the moment. Um, since they are very similar uh, for some aspects with the drugs, and at the same time, uh, they need a very strict involvement of patients, engagement of patients, uh, without engagement of patients, 
probably these uh, these uh, products does not there has not the effect. So, um, do you have some particular or specific uh, uh, thought about this? Thank you for that question. Very interesting. Um, unfortunately, because the remit of uh, the expert uh, panels is a bit limited by the class risk uh, that I've presented to you, digital therapeutics in general would not fall under that category. It would probably fit under class three, So, and even then it would be a very specific type of, of device. Um, so we, we, it's not an area that we are currently much involved to, to be honest, because of our limited remit. Uh, but uh, in the future, it depends a little bit on how it evolves. But I fully agree with your considerations that there, as in many others, patient input is really, really critical. Thank you, Marcin. Thank you very much, Marcin Dinkovarek from CPME. Uh, I wanted just to follow up on the on the issue of orphan devices because this is something that we are quite following at the moment, and and we are aware of the task force and actually the the, the task force of the European Commission. Um, they extended now the invitation to to other healthcare professionals to join the task force, and I just wanted to clarify one thing because uh, in the presentation at the last coordination group, uh, the um, task force lead, I think presented something that the, one of the potential solutions uh, to address the limitations uh, related to orphan devices could be early advice by the expert panels on how to prove uh, safety um, early enough. So I was just wondering, and I wanted to understand if this early advice that was elaborated by the European Commission, by the task force, is this something that is already included in the pilot or this is, these are two separate things and this early advice is something that you are considered or that is considered for the future. And one uh, maybe a question for uh, more information is that uh, I, would, I would be grateful to know what are the uh, details of, co of cooperation between the expert panel panels and the um, medical devices coordination group task force on orphan devices because um, we are also joining this task force so so just in the light of this. Thank you for those questions. Um, Regarding the first, it's you are absolutely correct. So this is this uh, this part of the pilot will also be targeting that specific request that we provide uh, early advice to the developers of orphan um, of orphan devices, and that could be a solution for the current problem that it's ongoing. Um, I think that, and you, you've attended the, the workshop, so I, I also uh, attended it. And so this is one solution of many others, because this is not, it's not early advice to manufacturers that will solve the issues that we are currently having today. So, but it's absolutely crucial and that we all understand that we think of and we support these developers with new approaches, new methodologies, so that they can also benefit from that scientific input to probably promote and, and, and better ensure the safety and performance of their devices. So it is targeted in this specific pilot, yes, it's, it's what I was mentioned, but it's the uh, what we, I would call the orphan device strategy. It's quite broad, as you had the opportunity also to to listen in. So in terms of cooperation, we are fully uh, engaged with the European Commission on this topic as we're uh, with others. So we have uh, bi-weekly uh, bilateral meetings with the European Commission. And so these specific uh, areas that Commission wants to target, we are directing as much as possible our activities to cover those and through the Commission also to MDCG, of course. We are invited to present at the MDCG um, uh, regularly on the uh, ongoing activities of uh, uh, the expert panels. So, so far, scientific advice has not been covered because it was not set up yet, but from here on, it will be uh, also a part of that uh, agenda. Uh, we also have interactions specifically with some member states that want to engage more in this field. For instance, we've had recently been contacted by uh, some, some uh, member states that were uh, 
specifically volunteering to support these activities in terms of orphan devices due to its delicate and pressing nature. Thank you very much. Additional comment? Yeah, Mikhail? Just a quick, uh, quick follow-up. Could you uh, say which member state? Or is it confidential? Uh, uh, um, because we haven't closed yet the full, <laughs> so I wouldn't like to highlight ones in detriment of another. So it's not confidential, it's, a, it's just that I hope to have everyone on board. <laughs> so I would hope to say all. Thank you very much. So any other questions on that, uh, Francois? A few years ago, there was a European project, SEED, Shaping European Early Dialogues, uh, led by HTA. And they also provided scientific advice to developers of um, medical devices, one of which was the artificial heart and with uh, patients who had a heart transplant and who were candidate for the artificial heart with cardiologists and also hospital providers who need to, uh, hospital managers, who need to adapt the organization of the, of the hospitals. Do you also have the intention in your scientific advice to open to all the possible stakeholders who would be interested in um, providing an advice on these developments? Thank you, that's a very interesting question. Um, it's. Uh, if you're talking specifically about HTA bodies, for instance, it's specifically mentioned in the HTA regulation that there is a possibility of joint con uh, uh, scientific consultation. So it, it is more than foreseen, it's mandated in the regulation. So definitely yes. And in the future, we want to develop a process that it's stable, of course. So we cannot have everybody involved at the same time, but that we make sure that we have the different inputs whenever needed at, at any time. Thank you. Okay, so let's go from, from left to, to right. Um, Dario, sorry. Thanks, really. Thanks for the presentation. This is Dario Trapani, European Society for Medical Oncology. Sorry, I think it was notable that in your list of thematic areas, there was no oncology, no cancer. So I'm wondering, of course, how the oncology medical devices are captured and analyzed in what proportion and also in what proportion of the IVD experts, the 25, how many of them, of course, are cancer? Because commonly in the IVD committee, and I experience the same because I'm part of the IVD SAGE of the WHO, there are 90% infectious disease epidemiology and me alone in cancer. So I'm just wondering if it's the same in EMA, because in the practice of oncology in Europe as in the world, this really creates fragmentation of the practice. And this is definitely a concept that we imported, you know, all this story of the um, companion diagnostics that really creates confusion. And I do believe that is like fundamental lack of um, regulatory harmonization in that. Thank you for the question. It's uh, quite challenging. Um, so one is the, the remit of the regulation itself. And as, as I presented, um, and Ima was not even involved in the design, so I'm quite comfortable saying it. it the the class the uh, the classification rules were set up as they were for in vitro uh, diagnostics, but I can tell you that they are pretty much. If you look at the directive, at the in vitro directive, they haven't for the higher risk. They haven't changed that mu that much, and the perception there is that a high risk in vitro diagnostic is the ones that are currently used in blood bags. That was the original idea, and that was a little bit what was picked up uh, at, uh, during the transition for the IVDR. So specifically for IVD and, uh, and oncology, uh, those are uh, class C devices. So they are not directly assessed by, by our panels. Um, so, um, so for that, we have specific colleagues on the other side of the of the uh, of the scientific advice for the medicines that are currently uh, uh, studying the possibility to have a pilot to co-develop uh, the, the the companion diagnostic with the medicine. So, but that's a different aspect of 
what we are talking here. I'm focusing specifically only on medical devices. Um, and whereas this is for in vitro, for, for uh, uh, medical devices, it's again the same. So for class three implantable, it's a very specific setting. And again, the rules were set up as they were, but for class three, the focus is generally circulatory central system and neurologic central system. Of course, there are devices that were promoted to risk as were joint replacement uh, prosthetics or breast implants, but the, the focus, uh, or the original focus were these two major areas, so hence the, so it's not a question of, um, so because we are focusing on the highest risk class, that excludes a little bit, but I think, and that's my opinion, I think that in the future, it, there is a possibility with further reviews of the regulation that other uh, classes of devices might be included for this consultation procedure. Thank you. Thank you. And then I saw some hands um, there prior to Elena was Jorge Robin. A question uh, from uh, from EHA on uh, the, the the IVDR, um, given EMA's uh, mandate, um, one specific specific concern that that uh, we have is uh, in addition to getting all the the labs ready for uh, for IVDR requirements, um, <clears throat> is that due to the regulations. Uh, uh, certification uh, requirements, uh, there will soon be uh, a shortage of uh, in-house um, devices. Um, in academic hospitals, uh, about 25%, depending on indications uh, of uh, uh, IVD tests, are uh, in-house developed uh, devices. So there is great concern that there will be uh, significant shortages. Um, how is IMA, uh, when its mandate was uh, extended, um, indicated to us that, uh, first of all, EMA itself will have to build uh, capacity around uh, IVDs. So I, I was wondering how, how that is uh, going. And so, I mean, we ourselves have a big question, will hematology be ready for, for IVDR? We're working hard on that. but. We're also hoping that EMA will be ready. Thank you for, for your question. Um, there are elements to your question where I'm not really qualified to answer, namely on the, the, the potential shortages that are foreseen and whether or not there are the current uh, um, uh, bottlenecks of the implementation of the regulation. It's not specifically for, for EMA to comment, but some aspects are publicly available, as you know, and one of them specifically for IVDs was the fact that previously in the, uh, in the, in the IVD directive, only around 10% of the IVDs would require the intervention of a notified body, whereas for the new regulation, around 70 or 80% will need that intervention. That is well known, and that created uh, a, a bottleneck for the assessment, uh, uh, at the assessment part from the notified bodies, and that is currently being solved. Um, the, I've shown you the fact sheet from the commission where the this... Uh, what they call measures to facilitate the transition for the regulations. There are a lot of measures that are set out and others more are thought of. So, But I, I don't know them all and I don't know if there is something specific for, for IVDs. I was also referring to the fact that EMA itself had to build up knowledge, uh, capacity, in-house knowledge about um, uh, in vitro diagnostic uh, devices. And as a consequence, um, indicated it needed some time to hash out its, its own role. So my question is also if there's already some, if you are succeeding in a way in building up that capacity and if there's already more clarity within EMA on, on how the agency sees its role. 
that would be the second part of my of my question on the capacity itself. Um, more and more, the EMEA is being tasked with uh, activities that relate to medical devices. So more and more, the agency is moving into that sector and also bringing more uh, more capacity on that. Uh, the office that I currently work with, it's uh, will be is already uh, in charge of uh, a lot of activities with medical devices. It's, it's, we are only focused on, on those activities, and it's an office that it's being uh, uh, built around those. Specifically for IVD, of course, we have the expert panel specifically for IVDs. It's 25 uh, members, so it's and a, a quite broad uh, range of experts on, from different specialities, so that in, externally we already have that uh, expertise, which is quite uh, nice and interesting, and we do use it very often. But even internally, yes, we are uh, building up our own capacity on that further involvement that uh, the EMEA is having on medical devices, which is growing by the minute, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. El Elena, you had a question? I did. I have a couple, but I'm not sure we'll have time for them. The first one, you mentioned, yes, it is in the regulation. It's the law in terms of consultation for HD and so on. Um, we currently have the coordination groups being arranged for devices in the HD network. I'm speaking now from a member state perspective. You think there is awareness at member states of these activities in relation to the formation of the HTA groups? Because usually these departments are quite different. They do not cross-talk. And that's as much as I can say here. It's the first question. Um, also in terms of envisioning volume of work and so on, because you can see that some people or some member states think two, three people are enough and others think 50, 60 are enough and so on and so forth. So that's the first one. The second one is um, perhaps I've missed it. I, I don't think it's been discussed a lot, but for devices, particularly for pediatric patients over 50%, 60, I mean, particularly for some indications, it's off-label use. And we've seen shortages in terms of recall cases. I mean, I can refer specific cases, but I think also Piotr probably can, can refer to uh, th this type of thing or interventional cardiologists probably have experience with it. So will you be looking at this at all? And then finally, it's something which is uh, particularly concerned to me is in terms of relative effectiveness was mentioned earlier, very often... Um, you mentioned to uh, to a previous question, IVD separate from um, MDs and so on. Sure, but very often, uh, more and more, the therapies, the comparator could be a drug um, or the comparator could be a combination device or product and so on and so forth. So is, is any scoping for these things happening um, and any capacity building, including in terms of data collection taking place. So I know that <laughs> these are a little bit technical, perhaps. Uh, I'm more than happy to park them, but it would be good to have some information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, okay, I'll try to be, I'll, I'll try to summarize as much as possible. But we can have a further discussion on this, probably given your, your, the specific nature of your questions. Regarding the, um, the HTA and the awareness, you are absolutely right. Sometimes these things do escape. And uh, let me share this with you. Even internally, from the EMEA perspective, it was not clear at first that there was already foreseen the involvement for medical devices, which is, uh, of course, what we, we were already uh, so but that was good because that also gives us the opportunity to be involved from the beginning here at the EMEA. So we are currently, from the from the current developments that are ongoing, we were involved from the beginning. Um, whether or not there is already that awareness for member states, I think that it will come when they see the 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 the, the package that is being um, produced. Um, the 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 problem of um, orphan devices and the shortages. Absolutely, we know that it's public. It's been it's it's been like that for many years. Uh, your example is perfect. Card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 been. A, I remember a 
paper, I think it's 2013, where uh, pediatric cardiology identified around 60 or 70 percent of devices being used uh, off-label. So it's it's we know that there it's there. It was also mentioned today that probably what changed probably the risk perception from hospital management possibly because the regulation or the requirements didn't change that much. What can be done? Um, again, I think it's uh, commission and member states are, are studying a, a package of things. This scientific advice with, will help with some, but will not help with everything. And of course, it's not a magic bullet to this to the solution of shortages for for orphan devices or for orphan indications. Um, as for the interactions, uh, excellent question. But it's it's really it would take a lot of time, and we you'd probably be interested in very detailed aspects of these interactions. I've already mentioned one. Our colleagues from the medicine scientific advice they are developing a pilot project on the the combination use and how further can it be taken because for instance notified bodies are not allowed by the regulation to take part in any consultation uh, activities so that limits a little bit because to give a, a specific advice and then you you put up a clinical study, you involve patients, patients you, you implant devices, and then you're not 100% sure of the consequence, in a way, it's uh, we understand that it's difficult for, for the developers. They need to have that trust built in. So, But again, how this can be adjusted, I think we are, at this point, looking at it. It's good because we already know that it's a problem, we want to handle it, and we are thinking of solutions and, and at that's at where we are at currently. Thank you. Thank you. And now someone who has been waiting very, very patiently. So thank you for that, Bear. <laughs> I got all the time. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting, by the way. And um, I have two questions. Uh, was first on the on the classification on the very bottom line. I see wheelchairs, but what's the absolute uh, bottom line? Because <clears throat> There's so much materials on this. Uh, take, for example, uh, diapers, bandage, uh, bandages, gloves. To what level? Because at the end, if you're going into the into the, in, into the diapers and it has to be uh, approved, then the fee will go also back to the to the consumers and will have an additional layer on the on on the health budget. So I'm curious, what is the bottom? Where is the bottom line to, for for approval? And the second one is there is also uh, in the evaluation a kind of a green label uh, in the in the, uh, towards the uh, production of uh, of materials. So, for example, we have uh, we're going to do a campaign within the nursing on the glove or not the glove because there's a lot of gloving without any relevance on uh, on, on this. So, I wonder if there's also um, a green, uh, uh, a green, uh, a green label or green stamp during the evaluation of the uh, of the of the products. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's why these discussions are so interesting. You get a lot of new ideas, and you think of things that you hadn't uh, at first. So the, I, I will take the, the easiest one first, which is the classification. So in my presentation. Um, I mentioned that where the intervention of the notified bodies is required. So it would be, in generally speaking, from class 2A on, so class 2A, class 2B, and class 3, whereas for class 1, the low-risk uh, products would only be for devices where there is a st they are sterilized or they have a measuring function. And even then, the notified bodies' uh, remit for assessment is only on the sterilization process or the measuring capacity of the device. So a thermometer would not be assessed as a thermometer itself on the production, just on the whether or not the standard of measure does correspond to what it says, because that's the critical function of a thermometer, as we all understand. And I fully agree with you that these classifications and these interventions for assessment need to be balanced with what we get, because Having clinical studies for bandages would be absolutely ridiculous. So, of course, we want to avoid that as much as possible. So um, that's already balanced in the in the in the um, in the classification. 
to my knowledge, no, there is no uh, seal of green approval or any recommendations or even, to my knowledge, that's not something that the notified bodies do on when they do the, the, the assessment. But I think that probably more and more this could be something that the, the European Commission under its remit could consider as also giving support to manufacturers that want to adapt uh, either to production or in specific guidance to users on how to probably, even though use of devices is usually left to member states, so it's it's difficult. But maybe to have a general recommendation or to, I think these sometimes commission has these um, uh, reflection papers which are interesting to set these ideas uh, running. So, and thank you for the for the thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. We exhausted our time. Maybe a short question, like a last question, Irina? Not short. It's even not a question. You can relax. <laughs> I only think, I, first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. Extremely nice. And I only think that this is very good to share this information for our healthcare professional. As you see, you remember, Emma make a very good resource for about biosimilar. It's, I, I use this very much like for healthcare profession and also for patient. I do, I'm not sure about now about patient, but for healthcare professional, your information like collected, classification, regulation, it will be very, very good to sh share this. Uh, you have already done this. Only share this information. It, because if I go to uh, Emma's site, I cannot find exactly quickly this is information. I think it will be it's lack uh, lack knowledge of this dramatically area uh, in our med even healthcare profession. Thank you so much. Maybe I'm not wrong, but maybe it if will I be helpful. If I may helping. react to that, um, I have to say I think the presentation was extremely clear and and I think illustrated very well the process. So I agree. Uh, we can take note of that because I think we can, you know, we are working on reflecting more on training needs, information needs, and I think we can maybe capture the elements and that maybe can be prioritized and we can take note of it. Can I ask a very quick question? Thank you again. I think you have, after this, I think you can answer any question. <laughs> <laughs> I think in your presentation is very good because I think we have a legal basis to involve patients and healthcare professionals in the overall assessment. And I think the willingness is there. And, and the way we can see it works, you will have the experts in the panels, and then in addition, you have an additional pool of experts that can be called, let's say, on demand, depending on the needs. Um, so maybe that's something that we can discuss offline, but is there any, because maybe it's too early, we need to see how everything works, but is there, uh, similarly to what we do with medicines, where sometimes there is a need of a specific expert involving patients or healthcare professionals, et cetera, in addition of this pool of 150, is there any additional flexibility by which we can complement with the network of experts that we have from patients and healthcare professionals? Thank you, Juan. Excellent question and very to the spot. We've even explored already that possibility. And unfortunately, the way the regulation sets up the concept of expert does not foresee that... Uh, uh, a lay person could take part, so it doesn't foresee that a, a patient could be an expert, which is okay. <laughs> it is what it is, so maybe it could evolve a little bit, but we thought of that possibility that would really help directly on the input of procedures. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we are closing this point, and thank you for all the discussions. And I'm giving the floor to Rosa. <laughs> I'm migrating, sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Marco. And now I think that we are moving. So we, we had already a very interesting discussion about um, many topics, uh, last one in, in a medical device. And now uh, we are moving to another uh, super interesting area, uh, which is uh, um, represented by clinical trials. Um, uh, which are clearly fundamental for uh, uh, all the, uh, the groups uh, um, uh, participating to, this, um, to, to our working parties. And uh, <clears throat> um, uh, we um, uh, 
are, uh, th there is the, um, the initiative, which is the uh, Accelerating Clinical Trials uh, EU initiative, which is meant, uh, this is my understanding, to uh, make Europe very interesting and competitive and a hub for, uh, for research, which is uh, really key. And we are very uh, uh, lucky today to have with us uh, Maria Filancia, I think with us relatively, because I, I'm, I think that she will connect, uh, she's connecting uh, remotely. And uh, Maria will uh, update us on the um, uh, um, ACT-EU multi-stakeholder platform uh, and will explain us about the concept paper uh, consultation and the kickoff meeting. Um, so I think it's a very interesting topic. Uh, Maria, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Yours. Great. Thank you so much and uh, hello everyone. I'm happy to, to present uh, this update on uh, the ACT-EU. Uh, I understand that in the past uh, my colleagues uh, have already given you an overview of what is the ACT-EU and therefore today I'm just focusing on one of the priority action for which I'm coordinating uh, uh, well, the, the way forward. Let's put it this way. Next slide. So, you know, at this stage that uh, the Accelerating Clinical Trials in the EU, uh, it's an initiative launched uh, last year in January. And uh, um, as Rosa said, uh, aims at making EU more competitive uh, and more attractive in terms of EU uh, clinical trials uh, and innovate the way clinical trials are done. Um, this type of objective uh, is reflected a little bit everywhere, in particular in the clinical trial regulation, which is being implemented and indeed uh, elevating standards for clinical trials is part of, uh, of this regulation. Next slide. Um, ACT-EU has a set of 10 priority, uh, but one of those, which I'm coordinating with the other uh, 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 a small team, um, recognizes that in order for the clinical trial to evolve um, in all steps of its execution from beginning to end, there is really a need to have a multi-stakeholder discussion uh, that can drive and support the change. And therefore, uh, the priority action three um, is actually to establish a multi-stakeholder platform, which should include patient uh, after a stakeholder analysis, which I will talk um, in, this, um, in this presentation. Next slide. So then from this slide should be built, but uh, either you push everything or uh, while I'm speaking, you can push. So the main goal of the multi-stakeholder platform uh, encompasses all aspects of clinical trials. So we are not just focusing on one single point, but it's from the design, the conduction, the analysis, the transparency and engagement with, with patients. Uh, click. Um, so the plot, yes, please build everything. I think you can. Um, uh, so the multi-stakeholder platform uh, should enable uh, clinical trial transformation by bringing together all stakeholders uh, in a new neutral platform with regular meetings uh, and balanced discussion, putting patient at the center of the discussion. The platform uh, aims at uh, also enabling uh, innovative approach through multi-stakeholder collaboration and to do that uh, enhancement of each other understanding um, and trust uh, is a key. Uh, in addition to enabling and support pilots for improvement, um, meaning every point uh, identified as a, in the work plan that needs to be further discussed and maybe um, trialed uh, could be done through through pilot, dedicated pilot. And of course, um, in terms of transparency, the multi-stakeholder platform aims at disseminating all the outcomes, uh, not, obviously not only in regards to the output, but also through uh, it related to, to the discussion of the actual platform itself. Next slide. So about the stakeholders, uh, we have identified uh, the key stakeholders that should be part of this uh, platform um, simply by doing a short analysis on all the steps of clinical trials and the players involved. And as you can see, 
patient healthcare providers, ethicists, regulators and inspectorates, academia researchers, HTAs, body payers, policy makers, and of course, industry sponsors and clinical trial investigators um, are the stakeholders that should be part of this platform in order to ensure that um, all the representatives are there. Next slide. So um, I think in one of the slides there is a link. Um, as you may know, we've been uh, working on developing a concept paper for uh, the platform and uh, also for um, understanding how the platform will, will be an interlink between them and other bodies. Um, and there is currently an, uh, a public stakeholder consultation, not only on this concept paper, but also on uh, uh, well the, the, the interest in being part of the platform itself and also uh, the topics um, that should be considered as priority. Um, for what relates how the proposal is, we can see, as you can see here to the left, um, the ActiU multi-stakeholder platform uh, is meant to meet uh, at least two times a year through plenary meetings where the main activities will be to identify and prioritize the work plan topics, present work plan topics uh, and call for volunteers to work more on ad hoc topic groups which will essentially look after technical discussion on specific topics. Of course, discuss proposals and agree on pilot projects coming from the ad hoc uh, topic groups and report back to the ActiU steering group. Uh, you can see to the bottom that uh, essentially the ad hoc topic groups will be um, obviously referring back to the multi-stakeholder platform, but the idea here is that every time there is a key deliverable, uh, experts are called together to work specifically on that deliverable um, and therefore coordinate their own meetings, reach a decision and draft proposals that then will be presented back to the, to the platform. Um, next slide. So, as I said, um, we are grow we're trying to build this platform starting from the seed. So during uh, the month of February and actually ending today, we launched this four weeks public stakeholder consultation. Uh, so it's still on until midnight. So you can still, uh, if you haven't, uh, you, should, you should have received an email, but in case uh, you can still uh, click on this link and uh, have a look and participate. Um, so the, the, the consultation is about three main points, as I said, first of all, interesting being part of the platform we want to know who will, will at least at least part of the first meeting on the platform who will want to be involved um, what are the from your perspective the priority that we should consider topic uh, priority for discussions uh, and that therefore could be part of the future work plan of the platform and then comments on the concept paper proposal so that we can actually further build from your feedback, uh, the actual platform and make it uh, um, as efficient as possible. Uh, this is for this is the plan for uh, this period. And during uh, 2023 and 2024, we envisage having a series of workshops with the with the platform in order to start the discussion, start to know each other, and better define the platform itself and the work plan. Um, and then uh, we envisage that uh, as of 2025 onwards, the, the platform at that stage will be established and uh, up and running with the ad hoc topic groups and the work plan with all the deliverables, essentially. Uh, next slide. So this is my last slide. So in conclusion, ActiU uh, seeks to deliver innovation in clinical trial and one of the key um, point pillars, let's say, for this innovation is to have a dialogue and collaboration across all stakeholders involved in, in the trials. And therefore, this uh, platform is a multi-stakeholder platform uh, and represents the main forum where all stakeholders can know each other, understand each other's perspective, and then work together to uh, to resolve all the challenges and, uh, and then build proposals for improvement on all the aspects of uh, clinical trial. 
So that was the end. Um, I'm happy to reply to any question. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> that was really um, clear, very nice update. Uh, and uh, I'm now opening uh, for a question. Any question, comment? Ansela. Beuk. I wanted to ask if, um, if, if there are links between this initiative and the EHDS, if, if, if you're engaging in that discussion uh, and the role of uh, so clinical trial data in, in the HDS, how, how would that then be used? For, I don't know if my, well, let's see. I'm not sure what HDS means, but um, uh, I know that um, there are already several other discussion ongoing. And uh, I mean, other groups already formed talking about clinical trial and talking about um, data, for example. And we, what, what we're trying to do is to try to merge uh, everything. I mean, at least make clarity. But yeah, ActiU right now, it's um, it's about, I mean, this initiative, the multi-stakeholder platform, it's more about driving the ActiU objectives of implement, of um, evolving uh, clinical trials and attracting more um, EU. But I don't know if colleagues connected or uh, in the room. I have, yes, Anna, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, in all fairness, we haven't. Uh, it's a very valid question. But in all fairness, we haven't really started to tackle um, the European health data space within um, within ActEU. Not just yet. Um, I think it'll be a topic for sure that will come up. And as we look at the priorities coming out of the survey uh, in the following days, this is something that will probably come up in some of the comments from stakeholders. So with that, as I say, it's not right now contemplated within the objectives of ActiU, but uh, looking at clinical trial data is part of the part of the work uh, coming into the initiative. So I think that we will have to uh, address the issue of uh, clinical trial data in the European health data space in the upcoming uh, in the upcoming months. So it doesn't really reply to your question, uh, but we know that it's going to come and we will uh, be talking about it. No, it does. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And apology, I heard HTS, well, that's why data didn't come to me. But indeed, uh, looking at the preliminary uh, responses data, it's obviously one of the key topics. Okay, Bear. Thank you for the presentation, and it's just um, very interesting, also from the from our perspective. And also, we want to share our interest just to be engaged into this topic, as we have uh, established recently uh, a nursing education and scientific organization with a subgroup. It is on clinical trials. We have several nurses <coughs> very familiar uh, on this on this topic. <clears throat> and they want to be uh, engaged, but also taking some learnings to the nurses because clinical trials is more than just ticking boxes. And also on the adherence uh, on clinical trials, this is uh, this is more uh, crucial than more than the more realized because of the the dropout of uh, patients uh, and also on the behavior on clinical trials, but also on the awareness. Uh, of the of the healthcare professionals, so uh, I'm very eager to uh, to follow up. Okay, so Bear, first of all, yes, this is exactly what we want. Not just ticking box. A clinical trials should be more pragmatic and should be more effective than they are at the moment. So that's why this initiative is actually hugely welcome. And if you are eager to work, so there is the survey. If you haven't done yet, <laughs> today is your last uh, opportunity to to express your interest. Okay, and this is a reminder for uh, for all of us. I think there is Robin. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'll keep it far away from me this time. <laughs> um, we did complete uh, the survey, um, but I, I thought I'd take this opportunity to flag something uh, as well that we found a bit peculiar when uh, ActiU was first uh, announced. Um, it, it was accompanied by a short uh, paper published on the EMA website that described its, its scope and objectives. 
Um, and, and we were pretty happy with that uh, scope as it was described there, um, which, which included two uh, topics that we find particularly important, but that were uh, missing uh, from uh, the more recent uh, publications. Of course, we flagged this in the, in the consultation as well, but they were uh, optimizing um, ethical oversight and integration of the ethics committees um, into um, the European clinical trials regulatory landscape. Um, and reducing administrative uh, burdens. And we were very curious, of course, if the fact that these did not return in more recent um, descriptions of, of the ACT EU and the announcement also of the stakeholder platform, if that was kind of um, uh, reflected the preference on the part of uh, EMA and its uh, regulatory partners. But that's maybe a bit of a mean question. Maybe I can start. No, indeed. Sorry, <laughs> I thought it was a question for me. Maria, you can go ahead and start, or I can take it. Either of the. <laughs> so I uh, indeed. Well, that's the reason why we are doing a public stakeholder. Well, first of all, we are not uh, leaving anything out, and uh, the concept paper we we drafted it was more to give you an idea on how on the idea on, on of this multi-stakeholder platform and if you say yes what do you kind of commit to but that's also the reason why we we decided to also consult you on the priority topics uh, because we wanted to get from you as well what you think uh, are priorities because we might not have the full overview or the full understanding on uh, on the same level so definitely your comments are really appreciated and we don't want to leave anything out as i said the platform encompasses all aspects of clinical trial and regulatory is one of them for example ethics as well thank you we won't uh, we won't let you forget about these topics May I just compliment uh, also briefly on on Maria's response um it wasn't it wasn't omitted uh as Maria said it wasn't omitted on on purpose and we hope it does come out of the priorities um in in other areas of act eu there's also work um reflecting on how to bring the ethics bodies closer in particular in the priority action that's looking at governance as well so we're we're discussing there how to uh there is we we see more and more the need to bring in ethics for different discussions uh within act eu uh, so as part of the governance that will also be tackled there and as i say we hope to receive uh, responses from ethics committees and ethicists as part of the multi-stakeholder consultation and we hope that people are putting this out there as a priority. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Um, yes, I have a comment, a proposal more than a question. Um, as you know, in the context of the Act EU, um, an initiative has, has been taking place uh, in recent months, uh, which led to the release of a recommendation paper on the centralized elements uh, in clinical trials in December 2022. And so, as I think that this is a quite interesting and important topic for uh, patients and healthcare professionals as well, um, I would like to know if uh, Juan, uh, Rosa, and Marco uh, deem it appropriate to learn more about uh, this specific topic and discuss and share with the colleagues in one of the next meetings of, uh, of our committees. Um, if you think this could be useful, a number of uh, people uh, from this group uh, participated in this initiative, uh, Francois and other ones. So. Um, I think it could be a good, a good occasion to uh, learn more about the contents and also uh, the implementation activities we are going to, to do in the next months. Can I react? Thank you very much for that. And I mean, we take the invitation from your side. And I mean, act to you, clinical trials is a priority for the agency and for the network at the moment. And uh, I think that the, 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 that's the reason why colleagues are working in order to establish this uh, multi-stakeholder platform.
So uh, de definitely both working parties will be invited to participate. So it's not just about information. Our expectation is that you become part of the of the platform in one way or another. So I think, uh, yeah, we will we will definitely go in depth into into this and. Yeah, this is just the beginning. We are colleagues are working to set up the priorities, and this will be the basis for the first steps in the establishment of this uh, platform. Which, you know, longer term, we'll need to support and we'll need to create this uh, ecosystem by which we can always progress in the EU. Thank you, Francois. One small concern we have regarding the composition of the stakeholder platform is that we we expect uh, clinical centers uh, already running clinical trials uh, who candidated to become members of the platform but there are many other hospitals who are hoping to run to run clinical trials in the future so would like to discuss the buyer obstacles so depending on the composition of the stakeholder platform maybe see if these are represented well enough otherwise to reopen uh, the composition for them to join i think this is a very uh, this is a key point because if we are doing uh, you know this effort um, um, among other um, you know aims to decentralize trials if we just keep uh, um, you know the attention on the usual uh, players this is not working uh, maria and colleagues um, would you like to comment on that one i'm happy to jump on this maybe yeah. but maria and, and and they can complement i think there will be a kickoff meeting on the establishment and one of the aspects that we will need to discuss here is composition. So I think the, the question is very timely and we will need to define that, yeah. Maria, are you okay? Do you want to add anything? Yes, no, indeed, uh, as Juan said, uh, we need to define how to, the composition in terms of how to best represent everyone. Uh, and be flexible enough, uh, I, I would say, yes. So uh, just to be sure, it's nothing is set in stone and we are want to agree with you, with you and the other stakeholders, whatever is best for, for the community as well. You can also disagree with us. I mean, we do not need to agree oh, <laughs> <laughs> about everything. But I think that Francois' point is really important because if we want to, you know, advance change and uh, speed up things, we need to maybe to take other angles of observation. Okay. Um, any other comment, reflection, uh, anything else that we want to flag to uh, the Act EU colleagues? No, are we happy with the information that we received? So I remind everybody that today is the last day uh, to uh, participate in uh, the public consultation. I have a question. It's a cheeky question. No, it's, a, it's an easy question, Maria, for you. So the, the public consultation, it's with different sections. So, uh, and the last point if, uh, in, is the question about uh, the willingness to be involved. So if someone click on only on the last point <laughs> and to skip the previous question, <laughs> will it still be considered to participate or not? Uh, we need to fill in the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole survey. Be. Well, it will be nice to to know also feedback on, on the rest of the question. If I'm not mistaken, uh, I haven't put any mandatory <laughs> question, but uh, uh, it still would be good to know who you are, your your affiliation, and what you think it will be you can give to us in terms of priorities. Definitely. <laughs> Okay, no thanks. It's just because it's the last day, so I'm trying to facilitate colleagues and uh, you know. It's quite <laughs> short. The, 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 show, the no, no, I know. The, yeah, yeah. The survey is quite uh, short. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, and I think that Anna uh, wants to jump in. Yes, thank you. I was just reflecting on the intervention that there was pre um, the one before last. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of the person that made it. It was regard in regards to the decentralized clinical trials recommendation paper. If you want, I'm I'm happy to follow up outside of the meeting uh, with the project team leading on the implementation because obviously it's going to be a while before the kickoff meeting for the multi stakeholder platform. So if you want someone from the DCT team to come to the um, to your next uh, plenary meeting. Yeah, we're happy to to facilitate that. If you wanted a presentation on uh, the implementation of the DCT. Thank you so much. I think that given the, the interesting topic, the appetite in, in the room, I think that will be nice to have some sort of follow up even before our next uh, meeting. So thank you.
Thank you so much for offering that. Thanks a lot. Um, before I close the session, is there uh, anyone that wants to make a final comment? I understand that uh, everybody's happy with uh, what we had. So thank you so much, Maria and Hannah, uh, for uh, updating us on, uh, on this topic. And we will be uh, surely follow up because uh, it's something that is uh, really dear to um, the majority, if not all the organization that are in the, in the room and connected remotely. So thanks, thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and now, Trial, no, trials and tribulation, no, more tribulation than the trials. We are ready to move. Ah, okay, no, so, sorry, I forgot. Basically, no coffee break, guys. It was not my decision, I want to tell you, so <laughs> just, uh, you know, to blame others. But uh, we aim to finish maybe a few minutes before, so if you need to go to the toilet or anything else, you can do discreetly uh, while we move on. But um, so coffee break is abolished. So, um, and uh, having said that, I'm happy to move now to the next session on, uh, which I think is on biosimilars, am I right? Yes, biosimilars and interchangeability. We have a very interesting discussion during uh, the, the workshop on, uh, on shortage in the, uh, yesterday and the day before. So, and I'm very happy and we are honored to have with us again, uh, very privileged actually, uh, Stefan Tristop, which he, who is the uh, CMO um, uh, of the agency and uh, is going, uh, I'm assumed, to update us <laughs> about what we, we discussed uh, with respect to biosimilar. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Rosa, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, nice meeting you all and a lot of familiar faces because many of you took part in the, uh, in the breakout session on Wednesday on biosimilars in, in the shortage uh, workshop. Um, and thanks for having, a, for those of you who were there, I can tell you, for those of you who weren't there, I can tell you we had a very lively discussion and uh, a lot of uh, good feedback. Uh, Maybe not so much on shortages, maybe more on biosimilars and interchangeability, but that doesn't matter. I think it was very, very fruitful. The session on, on biosimilars within the shortage meeting was had the aim of understanding stakeholders' experiences on shortages of biological medicines and whether biosimilars could be a way of uh, ameliorating or preventing shortages of biological in, in general. We spent some time uh, talking about the work of the HMA Working Group of Biosimilars to be, to be distinguished from the, from the Biosimilars Working Party, which is the more scientific uh, working party of, of uh, the agency that deals with scientific advice and, and approval of biosimilars. The HMA group is, as the name said, linked to heads of medicines and have more impact on implementation of biosimilars. A lot of this links to discussion on national level on pricing and reimbursement and so forth. And that leads into the, uh, I was about to say, famous statement on our website of interchangeability of uh, biosimilars. But just a little bit of, of background and just to make, make uh, things right and, and what we are talking about. Interchangeability is the by definition, changing one medicines for another. And in the context of biologicals and biosimilars, we talk about interchangeability when you switch from the reference product to a biosimilar or vice versa. Or if you twitch, switch or interchange between two biosimilars or more biosimilars, that all has the same reference product. That is something we, uh, and anybody else is welcome to have a meaning about uh, interchangeability, but that's something that we can talk about here as a European agency. When it comes to member states and, and prescribers, then switching is one thing. That is the prescriber-led decision of changing the medicines for a patient to something else. And that is taking place every day. Either you switch the patient to something uh, to avoid side effects, or you change them to another drug to improve the therapy, or you just change biosimilars, uh, change from originator product to a biosimilar to save money for your healthcare system. And on top of that, member states can decide on substitution policies, even automatic substitution, like many member states already have for small molecule generics. And we see increasingly this is also happening for biosimilars. So 
just to summarize the evidence behind coming out with an interchangeability statement um, is that we already know that switching between biologicals, non-biosimilar biologicals, is very rarely associated with re adverse reaction. So changing from one biological therapy for, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis to another biological therapy for rheumatoid arthritis, that change in itself does very rarely lead to anything uh, dangerous for the patient. It may even be a reason to change because you want to improve uh, therapy due to existing antibodies. The way biosimilars and the scientific rationale for, for all the biosimilar concept in Europe is that a biosimilar has to be highly similar to its reference product. So highly similar in the sense of, of how the molecule's physiochemical is characterized, how it behave in different uh, assays, and of course also with clinical trials to rule out any uh, differences in safety and efficacy. So there has been a lot of studies because one of the concerns early on was, do we need to do switching studies? And today, we, the level of knowledge is switching studies do not make us more wise. There has been done a lot of switching studies and, and even multiple switch studies, which have not been able to pick up any difference in efficacy and safety between the reference product and the biosimilar or multiple switches between biosimilars. And a couple of years ago, we looked into our pharmacovigilance database, and at that time, we had more than 1.3 million patient years experience with patients switching from reference product to biosimilars uh, without any sign of, of change in, in, um, in side effects. So we feel very confident that changing from a reference biological to its biosimilar or between biosimilars with the same reference product is a safe practice. And therefore, in September last year, uh, we published together with the heads of medicines agencies this statement on interchangeability of biosimilars, referencing uh, five uh, publications, scientific publications that has looked into this and very detailed going into all the details associated with switching and what I just summarized very, very quickly. That uh, statement came out and um, there was not much attention uh, uh, the uh, the biosimilar industry uh, congratulated it, and the originator industry was a little bit concerned, uh, and that was where it all ended. Um, then we got some uh, feedback from uh, both. Here we got questions to our communication department, and we also collected questions received at member states, which led us into developing a, a Q and A document. And currently, the Q and A document is addressing three questions, uh, namely. Um, whether can you can how, how frequently can you switch? Does this only cover one switch, or is multiple switching allowed? And the answer is is yes. The other question was: Is is there a difference whether we talk about a, a rather simple molecule, let's take growth hormone and insulin at one end of the spectrum, or a very complex fusion protein at the other end? And again, the answer is: It doesn't matter. Switching is is not what we regard associated with any. A risk in terms of change of efficacy or safety. Um, and then a question, does the statement of EMAS website, uh, have that, does that have a national impact? Does it mean that uh, I can be switched in my country? And the answer is we don't know or no, this has no impact. This is a national decision whether you would allow switching or even going a step further for substitution. And this is, of course, work in progress because, guess, we already got two more questions to address, or maybe even three more questions, and uh, the CHMP has also made us um, need to update this due to a recent approval of, of a biosimilar where there are slight differences in the excipients between the reference product and the originator product, excipients that will not have any impact on the general patients but may have an impact in a few very, very rare patients who have a very rare enzyme defect, and therefore there need to be uh, warnings so the, the product information will slightly differ. And we will have to amend our general statement to underpin that prescribing and also prescribing biosimilars, you always need to consult the product information. So switching is not something you can do by switching off your brain, you still need to read the product information and do proper 
care of your patients, and patients need to lead, read the uh, insert leaflet. So this is work in progress. So the meeting uh, we had on Wednesday was preceded by um, a survey, and this is, of course, from, from a scientific perspective, not an impressive survey with 26% res responding. I was told this was good because normally we only get 10% responding, so you can say this is exceeding our expectations, but, but on the other hand, it's, it's limited what we can say. But on the other hand, in retrospect, the issues that came up and the observations from this uh, pre-meeting survey nicely reflected what we ended up discussing in, uh, in the meeting. And still a need to more information about biosimilars Maybe not so much about what is a biosimilar, but more the details, the nuances about switching and differences and concern around safety, concerns around differences in, uh, in devices, because that's a big issue when patient change is not so much about getting a biosimilar product. It's more all the issues related that that biosimilar may, come, may be delivered in another device which also on the healthcare side gives a lot of challenges because you then have to instruct patients and that they divert some extra cost and resources and so forth. So more detailed discussion about biosimilars and, um, and related uh, issues. Um, experiences with shortages, um, there has been shortages across Europe, uh, also shortages of biosimilars and I think many, many of the participants in the workshop uh, was of the... Uh, uh, the position that having access to not only one biosimilar, but multiple biosimilars to one reference product could potentially increase competition and lower the risk of running into shortages. But having just a single biosimilar would most likely not make the day in terms of preventing uh, shortages. There were, in general, um, trust in interchangeability, uh, but of course, I was about to say, of course, there were still some concerns raised, uh, and especially concern raised from uh, participants who came from therapeutic areas where biosimilars do not exist at the moment or where they are about to be introduced. And that, I think, is also a learning here that the gastroenterologist and the rheumatologist who have now have access to biosimilar monoclonal antibodies for 10 years or more. Uh, they are comfortable here, but when we move into new therapeutic areas, we are starting a little bit all over again and have to explain. And there could be some learning exercise from the experience from one therapeutic area to another, both among physicians and among patients. So we hope to be able to build a little bit on that uh, moving, uh, moving forward. The breakout session, as I said, was, was very lively, and I may have already summarized most of it on, on the previously site. Again, it was no doubt, as I said, there's an extensive both scientific and now also clinical experience. I have to remind you that it's almost 20 years ago we approved the first biosimilar. Next year, it will be 20 years. We approved the first biosimilar in Europe, and we are, we are ahead of the rest of the world here in terms of implementing them in clinical practice. There is still need for, for timely communication, and the basis for that communication is to build trust in biosimilars and build trust in interchangeability of biosimilars. Consisting messaging, many of your organization, I'm looking at you now, Bea, have spent a lot of effort in, in developing uh, guidances and and. Uh, material towards healthcare professional and patients in understanding biosimilars and building trusting biosimilars. And it would be important whoever, and then I could be looking at myself, the heads of medicines agency work group, who go into developing more information material that we make sure that there is a consistent messaging there and definitely no contradicting messaging. So the more we can build on the same, uh, the better. Concerns about interchangeability, we still need to do that. And some of the concerns that came up was related to off-label use. And as you all already know, dealing with off-label use is very complicated for us because that's basically doctors doing something outside what we approved. So we a little bit turn our blind eyes to what is happening, but sometimes we need to be able, we, we need to address it. And we've seen some shortages situations has nothing to do with biosimilars, where the shortage is mainly driven by lack of availability for off-label use. But that's another story I can entertain you 
if you were allowed to have coffee, but you don't have coffee today. So that, that's going to be some other day, Rosa. Um, there is difference in speed and access of, of biosimilars a, across Europe. Um, may, this is driven by, by many different things. Uh, some is driven by how member states deal with this. I think one of the learning was that the member states who have been extremely good at implementing biosimilars, they are they are, they are waiting for the biosimilars to come. They engaged early with the manufacturers. They engaged and say, we would like to, and they put things, they put measures in place to implement the biosimilars, whereas other member states have a more laid-back position and they are waiting for the biosimilars to come and then they look into this. So they are different and there are also different barriers in terms of acceptability and pricing and reimbursement issues. Um, we had a very brief discussion about the sustainability of the biosimilar concept because one of the worrying things is if you look into the, the if you look five years into the future looking at biological medicines that will lose their patent protection in the coming five years, for half of them there is no biosimilar in development. So that could mean that these products will not get into biosimilar competition in five years' time. And that is, of course, a question, why is this happening? Some of it might be explained that these biologicals are biologicals for very rare diseases, so the business model is not really working. Another explanation might be that the, uh, the competition in the biosimilar fields are so high that biosimilar industry cannot really make a business cake for, de for, for developing products here. And that's, of course, a concern because then we we might end up in a situation where member states cannot, you know, both in terms of shortages and maybe also finances can have access to more uh, biologicals. Health technology and, and payers were supportive of biosimilarity and interchangeability. Uh, again, one of the issues that came up there was the switching issue. Um, and then um, I, th I think important, some of the HTA folks highlighted um, that they understood that from a regulatory perspective, Generics, small molecules, is regulated in one way and, and biosimilars in another way, which is linked to the complexity of those molecules. But in terms of implementing them and having the interchangeability statement available, they could basically be handled in the same way as generics. So that was a learning for a take-home message for the HTA bodies. And then I think we agreed that biosimilars could be, if there are sufficient of them on the market, uh, more than one uh, competitor on the market, it could be a way of alleviating shortages. So that was uh, a tour de force in interchangeability, biosimilars, and, and the very fruitful uh, workshop um, on Wednesday. I think we will go to, to not this Rosa, but the other Rosa online for the next presentation, and then we can have a Q&A and discussion. Thank you. Rosa, Rosa, from Rosa to Rosa. Rosa, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so thanks a lot, Stefan. I'm going to try to complement his presentation with a bit of um, context of, of the how the interchangeability statement uh, that we issued in September uh, fits with the communication campaign that we have done over the years um, on biosimilars and where both uh, PCWP and HCPWP have been very involved. Um, let's see if the slides come up. Okay, um, I don't know what's uh, happening with the slides, but I can I can uh, start talking about it and then uh, we can we can see them hopefully on the screen. Um, so, uh, one of the things we discussed extensively in the past with uh, your organizations was the need for EMA to support understanding of biosimilars uh, because it was clear at the time when these medicines were first uh, coming onto the market that it kind of um, represented a new paradigm of regulatory science. Uh, at the time, it was a novel approach to medicines development 
coming uh, often with a reduced clinical package, but of course, a wealth of um, quality uh, and comparability data. And it was uh, at that point, it was highlighted that in order to achieve sustainable uptake, uh, regulators had to step up a bit the information. Uh, go to slide number three, please. Next one, please. Thank you. So at the time, if you remember, uh, there was a lot of dialogue and, and we uh, sat with many of you in focus groups to understand what were the knowledge gaps, the concerns, what type of information was needed from us. And uh, that's how we prepare uh, materials that were targeting either patients or healthcare professionals, trying to address the concerns at the time. And this was also done in collaboration with the, with the European Commission and in the context of a multi-stakeholder dialogue that had been set up by the Commission at the time. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, um, Following on the years, uh, what happened is that uh, EMA put out these uh, two strategic papers, the Regulatory Science Strategy and also the European Medicines Agency's Network Strategy, and uh, biosimilar uptake, but uh, in particular communication, also plays a role in the strategic priorities. So it was highlighted that it was indeed important to really promote the availability of these medicines to increase the wealth of uh, biological medicines that patients could have access to, but also support the uptake of biosimilars by healthcare systems. And one action that um, is part of the strategy is to uh, uh, roll out strategic communication campaigns to patients and healthcare professionals uh, to reinforce trust wherever we see that there is a gap or a need uh, to do so. Um, next slide, please. So the statement that uh, Stefan has introduced and that was uh, discussed at the shortages workshop uh, really came about because um, the member states and, and also EMA acknowledge there is really a need to step up a bit communication in this area. So it was clear that the science hadn't changed. So biosimilars that were approved in the EU via EMA could be used and can be used interchangeably if uh, the national regulatory agency allowed it. And as Stefan mentioned, there is a wealth of science now supporting that prescriber-led switching is, is a common practice um, uh, in, in, out there in the, in the clinical world. Uh, so basically, from a scientific viewpoint, there hasn't been any change interchangeability was well established and there were no any concerns. However, uh, the agency had not issued any specific communication or recommendation on interchangeability. And at this point of time, it was acknowledged that we really need a harmonized EU-wide communication and position communicated out there to the, to the world because um, we had identified uh, some uncertainty uh, uh, among some stakeholder groups on the use of biosimilars in clinical practice. And that's how the statement came to, uh, to, to arise. And um, uh, really the idea is to have a strong EU voice on this. So it's very clear that uh, we don't want uncertainty uh, regarding uh, interchangeability so that when prescribers come to decide uh, what what biological medicines to prescribe, you know, there is this communication that can support them. Next slide, please. So here is the, the statement, you're probably familiar with it. It was first published in September. And as Stefan mentioned, we are now including in an ongoing update, a sentence to really make explicit that uh, interchangeability should only be done when uh, considering uh, the conditions of use, which are reflected in the product information, because as many of you might be aware, 
sometimes the reference medicine has more indications approved than the biosimilar or vice versa. So it is important that this is uh, explicitly mentioned. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this is the Q&A that Stefan referred to as well. And he already explained some of the content that is right now on the current ve version on our, on our website. But also we are including a few more questions to to try to address what um, uh, we have seen uh, coming from from healthcare professionals or from patients. Uh, the questions that have been raised to either us or member states. So you have there some uh, example on uh, whether switching is allowed when biosimilars and reference medicine have different indications or when there are different conditions of use. For example, uh, if one of them contains a different excipient uh, that uh, poses a contraindication in the product information, and uh, yeah, the switching uh, can be done, but of course it's important to follow the conditions of use uh, that are either in, well, in the SMPC. Uh, and also uh, what happens when their manufacturing changes to the biosimilar or the reference medicine, whether interchangeability can take place. And we also explain this why uh, this can be allowed because of the way um, the evaluation takes all this into account and uh, this is all subject all changes are subject to regulatory approval and follow all the scientific guidelines so we explain this uh, in the latest update of this of the q a and i think that's my last slide uh, i hope you found this useful and yeah as stephen said we'll we'll be happy to take questions or comments thank you <laughs> Thank you very much, Rosa. This is very was very clear, and of course, thanks, uh, uh, Stefan. Uh, very clear. We had already part of the discussion um, in the workshop uh, shortage. Uh, so um, I, I now open the floor for question, comments, reflection. Josie. Please forgive my ignorance and thank you for the presentation. But is there a list anywhere that shows biologicals and it's biosimilar? Oh, yes and no. Um, <laughs> I think you, if, 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 you if you search for medicines on our website, you can click to see only biosimilars. Um, so yes, and, and for those biosimilars, you will be able to see what is the reference product. But what I he heard you asking for, can I have a table that says add a limo map and this is the Humira and here are the, I don't think we have that kind of table, but uh, I was about to say you, you can, you can cre create it yourself. The information is there. Sorry. Especially as perhaps um, more biosimilars are being created. I think it would be a very clear indication. I mean, if I may, yes, I think that the challenge is keep that updated because, of course, more are coming. But we take note. I think maybe what what Stefan said is good. I think that we can make some kind of demonstration, but the website will be sufficiently accessible to really be able to see the list of biosimilar medicines. And as you click on them, you will be able to see which is the reference. The, 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 yeah. But okay, we take note of it. Any other comment, question, reflection? Elena, yeah. You missed the previous session because we were discussing exactly off-label use. Um, not in so much detail because, but it's good that you have it on the radar. But the trouble is looking a little bit at it when it's such such, such high percentages is a little bit troublesome. So how much is a little bit looking at it is the question. And the second thing is, uh, uh, is there any actual tracking for any particular indication? I mean, to Jose's example, you can generate your own list in, in this type of thing and then monitor reporting in terms of um, shortage or switching or whatever. But we don't have an overview really. Um, but perhaps you do already or you plan to generate one? Thanks. First of all, coming up with a list of potential off-label use of medicines would be a bit of a challenge uh, because uh, being a doctor myself, I know you can be very creative. <laughs> uh, 
So that would be a challenge in itself. Um, and, and secondly, it's, it's outside our remit in, on the licensing side. But I know our pharmacovigilance folks, of course, have focused if off-label use leads to uh, adverse events that you shouldn't expect in that, um, in, in, in that therapeutic, in the indicated therapeutics. Uh, that's one area. That's, that's that's true, but that's something entirely different. And the question that arises is whose remit is, if anyone's, in the EU. So is it? It's definitely not the Commission's remit. It is not the DG Santé's remit. So whose remit it is, if anyone's? Because it's it's the off-label use is very high, and in the US they do things differently. But they have similar problems, of course. So uh, we discussed off-label devices. Their things get even more creative, as you know, and it's even more difficult to track. Uh, also, switching may not be available at all. So, hence the question. Thanks. It's, I would say, it would be diff it, it's a kind of reverse problem in the sense that we are here to authorize medicine. So. You ask us to track what we're not authorizing. So I think from a from a pure regulatory purpose, it, it would be difficult to track. I have a very pragmatic approach personally to off-label prescribing because you as a physician have been given an authorization which qualifies you to prescribe. And as long as you use your brain and your science and prescribe based on that, then I would have no problem. You may run into legal, prop, legal troubles if, if it goes wrong, but that's my over, uh, underlying perception of this. Then, of course, if we come into situations, let's just take vertiprofine for, for photodynamic therapy of, of different uh, uveal conditions. That use for the approved indication is almost zero, but there are maybe 20 to 25,000 patients in Europe that have benefit from this product on off-label, and it's currently in, in shortage. And there, I, I think, what else can we do than letting doctors do, use this off-label? The alternative is to say, well, these patients can't be treated because there's no existing therapy, and apparently there's no interest in developing that for industry. So thanks for the answer. Just two quick points. Um, if we can go on the basis of our discretion in prescribing that we don't need a regulatory body or labeling, we can just go along. You know, it's, it's a little bit egg and chicken and chicken and egg. But I do understand and agree. And also, I think we have had beautiful things coming out off of label use in terms of repurposing. And I'm thinking of cladribin and many other molecules. But being also pragmatic, the, the level of usage is so high. Uh, that I'm wondering whether there is some sort of data collection, or there could be some sort of communication reporting, um, including, I don't know, maybe via Udemed and so on. And hence the question whether we're looking at that. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned when you say use of, of off-label is high. That's a little bit unspecific. Um. I mean, 2011, 12, for devices, for cardiothoracic, it was, for TAB, it was something like 60, 70%. If you look at numbers of repurposing registers and so on, it's, it's very high. And also, we don't even have an overview of how high it may be when we discuss switching and shortages and so on. So uh, you said it yourself, it can be very creative. So we have reports, uh, in academic reporting, that it is high. It is not one person or 100 persons or 1,000 persons in the EU. So... Uh, it's it's not orphan. Huh? It's very high. So that is a little bit disconcerting in terms of pharmacovigilance, but also it's a little bit disconcerting in terms of how we monitor. And perhaps if there's so much of label, maybe there should be, I don't know, some fast labeling or some quick regulatory submission to check what exactly is being happening off label. But, but I think, that, so, sorry, Stefan, for interjecting. So, but I think that this is another um, side of the story, okay? Actually, it's, it's really important topic, not necessarily limited to biosimilars. And I think that it will require a lot of uh, time, maybe specific focus for discussion to understand who is doing, uh, who is doing what. So I would, like, I, um, I would like to go back to the, uh, to the um, biosimilar discussion. Any question, comment? Piotr. Oh, yes, I can be heard. Are there any differences in geographical location of the manufacturing process, so GMP? Are there any concerns about GMP for biosimilars because of them being produced in different countries, sometimes in remote locations or, or not? Uh, 
um, to be to be licensed, uh, you have to comply with GMP, GMP depending on where you're manufactured. And um, we also have originator products being manufactured in uh, very strange places of the world. So we don't have any concern as such, but of course we are monitoring any manufacturer. So we are not singling out specific production sites. And results of monitoring are ensuring, not worrying. Absolutely. No, we have no, no reason to, uh, to distrust what is happening here. Any other comment, question, reflection on this point? Why your seminars? May I actually ask you something? Because, uh, so, uh, I've been following the discussion around biosimilars now for a few years. And I was of the, you know, the idea that, you know, it's over. It's, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful Sorry. concept. It's, uh, if you just pay attention, study a little bit, uh, it's a, it's a interesting science, and then uh, you know you have the product is a different model of development, which is actually very interesting, and that's it. So we're done. But actually, then attending meeting and discussion is not done. It's not over. So I, I have the feeling that we we'll keep coming back to some uh, um, issues that uh, I thought we would have uh, now fully clarified. So do you think? Uh, I, and you do not have to, to answer today, but maybe this is something to, to think about. Do you think that uh, uh, if we are sufficient, uh, um, you know, reassured as a group, as a uh, healthcare um, uh, professional um, uh, working party, and uh, maybe jointly with the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, patient consumer working party, do you think that there is any scope for having uh, our position to, you know, to help the discussion and clarify what is not clarified yet. Uh, uh, interchangeability is the last point of discussion, but again, maybe there are other points. I think that maybe coming from us, and it can be, you know, it can, it can be something that can help the discussion in, uh, you know, moving forward. It is true that uh, EMA is a pioneer, is a true pioneer in the, in the biosimilar field, and so Europe, I have the impression that we are, you know, there is a, you know, we're just waiting for, I do not know what exactly. And uh, we will, um, I do not know, we will lose these uh, expertise and priorities. So do you think that there is any point in having some sort of uh, reflection paper, something coming from this group, or uh, there is no appetite uh, for it? And again, I just want to launch the question. And if you have any immediate reaction, fine. If not, we can follow up uh, uh, by email. Let me just add to that request. Uh, first of all, having been involved in biosimilars for a few years is an understatement for you also, but, but that's another story. Uh, I, I would say the, the European agency would, would very much welcome if, if you, uh, the two working parties, would be interested in, in, in engaging in this. We know a lot of your homebound uh, I'm looking at you again, Bea. Many of your organizations that you're representing have been engaging in this, and, and if we could escalate it to a more pan-European level coming out of the working parties here in collaboration with what the HMA working party is doing, I would, I would welcome that very much. But, but I think to your point, maybe it's something, any immediate reaction then is something to sleep on as well. Bea? Um, yeah, thank you. I'm very interested to engage also for your information um, next week I already I also have uh, meetings with the chief nurse executive of the World Health Organization so um, they also need to be aware of these these activities and some of the nursing are very internal minded but they really need to know um, where their responsibilities really are so uh, for this reason, I, also, I would be very interested just to, to engage where we can. Any other comment? Uh, yeah. Maybe just a comment. I mean, I, I fully support any activity in order to promote further these messages. And, and I think we take the point of further engagement you know, of, the, of the both working parties. And I think regarding the possibility of a statement, of course, we would be always in favor, but I think we already have a lot of statements, and my, my only concern is that if we keep on adding more statements, we may create more confusion. So I think I would start identifying if there is any information gaps which is needed, because if it is, then definitely we need to address. 
But if already the information is there, maybe we can look at from another side. Maybe, for example, if there are questions to be added to the Q&A, that is not written in stone. We can always add questions. But maybe how to uh, disseminate and promote the use of this information, of the interchangeability statement, of the Q&A, etc. So I think, uh, not, not to say yes or no, but definitely let's discuss more. I think the more we can do to uh, uh, communicate this further to the, the, the people who need to get it, the better. And I think this engagement would be welcome. For me, it's fine. I mean, I would like just to move forward and, you know, and be everybody, you know, on the same, um, you know, aligned on the same uh, position and move forward. So whatever is the vehicle for that, uh, it's uh, it's fine. So it just, um, yeah. Yes. May I? Okay. Um, coming from EHP, European Society of Hostel Pharmacy, this being my name. So uh, I agree with the uh, last proposal. We have... Uh, you know, a lot of position paper and all the others. And I think that uh, we just have a recommendation. So it's a very crucial uh, issue just to have a recommendation. Because problems is, I think, it's from country to country, how the, how every country develops the recommendation. So if we want to, to support uh, the use of a biosimilar, I think that we have not... Uh, who have to go more deeper than a recommendation. So, of course, we need to be deeper in the Q&A and see probably uh, what it, it fits in better in uh, its uh, country. But in, uh, in my opinion, we have uh, a lot of uh, scientific support to, to go with biosimilar. And we need this. And I think that uh, the collaboration be between the healthcare profession from one part and the patients from the other, who are the end user of this, I think it's a very strong collaboration who can uh, you know, go all this issue very faster, very longer. Thank you. Actually, I agree with you, Despina, about the fact that there is a lot of science there. And yet, uh, you know, sometimes I have the feeling that for a reason or another, there is no, you know, moving in, in the way uh, she moves. So I do not know if it's a matter of uh, uh, related to the, you know, having reassurance about this product or is a matter more, as you say, of recommendation at national level, which is a deeper, completely different type of, uh, um, of, of, of point or problem. But um, I think that we are not making full use of these um, of these products, uh, and it's uh, it's a pity because they're basically uh, basically is, uh, they help us to uh, increase access to very good uh, option and drugs for patients. Robin, I I agree um, that there is plenty of scientific uh, evidence. Sorry, it doesn't like me. Oh, cl closer. You, un you, un you understand it. Uh, it will take me many meetings to get the hang of it. Um, one thing that we have, that the signals that we are getting from our doctors is that the problem is not so much with the doctors. The problem is, sometimes it is, but it is more with uh, reluctance, skepticism amongst patients, also nurses. One, one thing that we... Um, did try to do um, in our own uh, scientific journal. Uh, we invited all relevant stakeholders, including patients, uh, doctors, uh, nurses. The nurses did not respond, by the way, um, to, to present, but also academic experts um, and, and, of course, our own leadership to provide their, their uh, perspectives and, and explain uh, the advantages. Um, uh, for access in particular of biosimilars. So everything was laid out, the, the scientific evidence, uh, the history of adoption of biosimilars in, in hematology, uh, uh, the advantages, uh, ways to overcome uh, questions, hesitancies, uh, skepticism. Um, and we were actually about uh, to invite uh, EMA to provide the closing uh, perspective for this uh, series in our journal. So that's one way, one, one way we have tried uh, to do this. Um, <laughs> by the way, I mean, it's just, it's just a, a funny detail, but one, 
obstacle we ran into is that when we invited an industry perspective, we promised that we would present all perspectives in our journal. So uh, we got a, a biosimilar manufacturer to write an excellent uh, contribution um, and the editors of our scientific journal refused it because it was written by a company. So <laughs> that, that's, that, that was one obstacle. But I, I guess, you know, this is... Because I, I, I understand, Rosa, the, the idea behind your uh, proposal, and that is that as much scientific evidence as there is, and as many scientific publications as there are, it is not always enough to overcome practical obstacles, uh, questions, hesitancies uh, on, the, on the work floor in the hospitals. But, but I, I also understand when, when Juan and others say, well, you know, we, we need to be careful with kind of duplicative uh, publications. But maybe this is a suggestion that can also work for other uh, disciplines. Yesterday we spoke about uh, communication, good communication and trust. And this is something that I think uh, it uh, has a problem uh, uh, regarding the years behind us. Because uh, I'm a hospital uh, pharmacist for 36, 36 years. So when biological products came uh, in a sense, and uh, uh, then we have, uh, you know, the first uh, um, questions and answers between uh, doctors, uh, especially doctors and patients, and after that the other healthcare professionals, uh, the, the, the patient said that uh, what a doctor uh, consult that what I do. After uh, we have uh, the bio, uh, biosimilars, and then in the beginning we said, uh, I don't want to change. I want to, to continue with the medication that I have uh, begun my therapy. Now we have uh, that we can go to interchangeability. So there is a little confusion. That means that uh, we have uh, to be very clear. And I, that's what we said before, uh, Rosa, science. Science here to, to lose, to, 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 to give us all the solutions. We have to trust the, the science and we have to, to give the good options and the clear options. And I think that the, the good communication and I think the, the training with all, with, for all uh, healthcare care professionals, the common training uh, will be a, a very good key in a good collaboration and in the good communication on this issue especially. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I think it's all the time. This is long, long discussion. It's very difficult. Uh, I, when, I, <clears throat> when I listen to this discussion, I also have background scientific, and I believe, I trust, that in same times, sometimes I not trust some uh, clinical uh, trials, which also can manage by a uh, pharmaceutical company, or not managed, but sometimes it's interesting. And this case, all the, uh, all the time thinking about biosimilar insulin. I cannot, I don't know about another thing, unfortunately. And in our area, I, uh, maybe not problem with some biosimilar who produced in European area, but sometimes we have uh, another production from another area, and then they come to our, uh, to, uh, our region. They resistant of patients. I uh, I some I understand also that sometimes it's also in mentality uh, issue like we don't want anyway, and, and but saying we must understand we work for patient and if the patient have normal control for example I speak about diabetes on this insulin, we must be careful change and say exactly that uh, equal exchange. Exchangeability. This is this is it's very uh, difficult. And also, if we speak it, even continue to speak that the pharmacists can change. I'm pharmacist, but I don't want the pharmacist change me to to buy a similarity. It's not his uh, responsibility from my side. No, uh, I don't know. I I also agree with uh, with um, not agree with recommendation. Now we have a lot of documents have already. Maybe we need to spread this more information, communication, and improve trust for this. Sorry for emotion. <laughs>
No, that's fine. So thank you. Thank you very much for the feedback. And I think that now, since we were obliged to not to have the coffee break, <laughs> I don't want to, we were forced to move forward. So I think that we do, I don't want to waste this uh, spectacular advantage. And I will suggest to move to the next uh, uh, point, which is the feedback on mini campaigns. And we are very lucky today to have with us Monica. Um, from the agency that will update on this point. Monica, the floor, see you. the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Rosa, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's actually it's really great to be back. I haven't been in in this meeting for a long time. Very very busy with other things, so I'm actually really very happy to to report back. Now, I have actually two mini campaigns to um, introduce. But I, first of all, I realize we are running late. You have, we have actually trying to have safe time. And I have the two campaigns. One is on shortages. And you can look at this in the, in the, in the presentation, but the other is on biosimilars, yeah. incidentally. So I would actually suggest if that's okay. And Rumia, if you would be so good to move immediately to, I think page six of the yes, presentation. Uh, you see, not it's not only not only external visitors have problems with the with this uh, uh, speaker system. Me as well. Um, I should say just very quickly what what expects you in this presentation. So I quickly run you through uh, our biosimilar interchangeability campaign so that we run at the occasion of the uh, of the statement. Um, then I would like actually to have a bit of a an exchange with you whether whether there is interest for joint campaigning. And then I'd like to target it immediately because a big campaign might be coming up and that's European Immunization Week end of April. So and without further ado, I now quickly jump into the into the campaign, the mini campaign we did around the biosimilar interchangeability statement. So Clearly, we had a brief, and that was raise awareness for the formula CHMP position that bio biosimilars can be interchanged. Um, and then what you see in gray is kind of the, maybe maybe that's more the things we, we discussed here, right? This reinforced attitudes to biosimilars are high quality alternatives, support changes in GPs prescribing behavior. But to be honest, we thought these are way out of our league and, and uh, they, they need to be, you know, they, they need to be tackled. But I think we, at that stage we, we were not we were not the ones to do that. So for us, mainly raise awareness for formalized CHMP campaign, uh, formalized CHMP position. Um, can I have the next slide? So uh, this is what we did. You, you have seen the statement. We published web updates. We had a news item. We had a so-called slider, so you could see it immediately when you go to our web page. Um, we had social media, so we had a. Um, a LinkedIn post. We had something on Ima Cook's influencer LinkedIn uh, channel. We had uh, we posted on Twitter and we posted on Instagram. Uh, and also, this was a comms package that we shared uh, with our colleagues in the national competent authorities. And uh, we also shared it at the time with you, the uh, PCWP and the Healthcare, uh, Healthcare Professional Working Party. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, these are the materials we, we uh, produced at the time. So uh, basically the, the approach was we went into the statement and really uh, picked up the high level messages. So we had this info sheet on the left hand side where we kind of wanted to express that we have really long experience now with biosimilars. There are 86 so far um, authorized or were approved at the time in the EU that we also have a lot of safety data and taken this together, there, there, there is confidence in these products. And then we also had this, um, I've now just, uh, you, you know, here you see six different pictures, but we used them as a so-called carousel. So we posted it so that you can actually slide through on LinkedIn, um, on Twitter, and on Instagram. Um, we had actually especially on LinkedIn, which is, of course, the channel where we reach most uh, professionals, we had really good uh, good uptake. We had over 150,000 views. We had 2,500 likes, um, over 2,000 clicks. I People looked at more information. We had 30 comments, which is actually, which meant that it, 
generated some some discussion um and uh yeah and also had actually very good feedback on linkedin we had i have to say we had much more limited impact on twitter which is to be expected and also more limited impact on instagram which has also to do that our uh, our uh, followership on Instagram is much, much smaller. So uh, no, nothing unusual here. But anyway, among the, the professional community on LinkedIn, it did really, really well. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. So that's that's the example. And I just really also wanted to run a bit through what, what kind of what our Say our organic campaigning capacities now. So what can what can we actually do with our various channels that we that we serve? So right now we have a press distribution list of a thousand journalists. Um, I wish I could now give you a complete breakdown in terms of a geography, but I can't. I hope I can do that at a, at a, a later stage. I mean, it's very still very much English speaking, but but it's a good it's a good spread across the EU, nevertheless. And we have a very specific accreditation list. So these are people who we would actually inv uh, invite for for press events of 450 people who have expressly said they want to be on this accreditation list. We have a YouTube channel uh, with 17,500 subscribers. Our LinkedIn channel had, as of a week ago, about 117,000 subscribers. On LinkedIn, we have 250,000 followers. We have Ema Cook's influencer account, which actually always um, really is a, is a fairly powerful tool because she gets reshared re a lot. And then we run a joint Instagram account. It's called One Health uh, NVEU. And we run that together with uh, our partner agencies from ECDC, EFSA, and, uh, and on that one, we have about 8,200 followers. So um, next slide, please. Now, <laughs> This is, to be honest, this is something we find out all the time. It's a, it's a very cheesy uh, proverb from the internet, but I think it actually really applies so perfectly to campaigns. If you want to travel fast, go alone. I, what we've done, for example, with the biosimilar campaign. But if you want to travel far, I, if you really want to get out there, we need to do it together. Um, so that's kind of... In, I should have started with this because honestly, <laughs> that is actually the starting point of my of my presentation today. I think we need to, um, if we want to have any impact, really real impact, then we need to do more joint campaign planning. Uh, Rumia, could I have the next the next slide? So, <laughs> for example. So really, starting point is it would be great to understand each other's needs and limitations for joint campaigns because you know it's kind of everybody has a you know that there are there are things that we can do to help you disseminate information, but there I think there's also things we need to explain how we can do things, what we can put in place, etc. But I mean overall, if we could come for certain topics, joint message development, a joint, a joint dissemination plan, coordinated posting, amplification of each other's messages, and then also learn together from these campaigns and, and implement them in the, for, for a next iteration, I think we could actually, we could make, make a much bigger dent than what we can do on our own. Um, so, not having, of course, heard already a, a, a here, uh, somebody put it in the ring, Biosimilars is a, is a possible campaign. But we, we know for sure there are two campaigns that are coming up this year. One is the European Immunization Week that's going to take place from the 23rd to the 29th of April. And I have a little bit more info on this. And then the second campaign uh, is European Antibiotic Awareness Day. Always takes place around the 18th of November. And every year we produce a lot of information and every year it's kind of we disseminate it but but we don't really have oomph so um maybe we can go to the next slide european immunization week so i'm, I'm trying to i'm trying to convince you now so european immunization week as i said takes place end of april the objective this year is improve vaccine uptake, I, the routine vaccinations where we see um, that have, where we see a drop in as a, as a, 
uh, as a consequence of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, to improve vaccine uptake in the context of a global backslide in vaccination rates due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I can show you on the next slide what we have done last year. Um, yeah. So we had this series of, uh, of images where we kind of really focused on, on various diseases and, uh, and the way how vaccines can contribute to them. Um, we posted them at the time on, I think, Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. We had uh, a post from Ema Cook. We had, um, I think, uh, we had uh, something on our website. We had a short video statement from Ema. So, you know, we had a, we had a package and um, we also joined, of course, others and, and, and reinforced each other. Um, but, but taking it to the next step, I think we would actually be really, really interested to work with you on uh, on this campaign. I think also I'm uh, I've been around for long enough so that I still have very warm memories of uh, of a video we did with this group, with the PCWP and the Healthcare Professional Working Party, and I think it's still shown in the in the open areas, which um, I admit is outdated now. Yes, but it was actually it was and still is really powerful. And um, so maybe going to the next uh, slide. My question is really, is there interest here in this group in doing some joint campaigning in general? Is there in particular interest to join forces already for um, European Immunization Week? Now, I mean, I actually know this is kind of around the corner, I have to say, you know, it's we have uh, beginning of March, uh, end of April is, is really is close. So I mean, if there is interest, I think we would actually have to start immediately. And then if there is generally interest, would you be interested to maybe have a small campaign planning group here, a, a small group that really discusses these campaigns, uh, see what we can do together? And then would that group be interested to start with the European Immunization Week 2023? So open questions, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. I thought that we were the ones supposed to ask you questions, not the opposite, but <laughs> it seems that I'm wrong. So I open the floor for comments, questions. Yes. Thank you, Mary McCarthy, UN, which is the European GP group. And yes, we'd be very interested in joining your campaign. We know that immunization varies um, extensively across Europe from 70% in some areas to 30% in others. And UAMO has at the last um, General Assembly in Ljubljana in November um, produced a series of videos to try and persuade those who are more hesitant about vaccination to embrace it. So that, yeah, we'd be very interested in joining that campaign. Thank you. Uh Thanks, Mary. Before we move to further comments, uh, whoever uh, has uh, some interest, I think uh, the easiest way is to um, express it to the um, secretariat, and then the secretariat can uh, establish the liaison with uh, with Monica. Okay. And now, any other comments? Any? Other? Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a few questions and remarks. First of all, how successful was the campaign? So, compared with other campaigns that uh, EMA has produced before if any, um, how successful do you would rate this campaign? Do you mean the European Immunization Week or Biosimilars? Um, Biosimilars was actually was very successful compared to other campaigns. Um, we had a lot of engagement. We actually also had a lot of media coverage. I think four, um, and I, I, I apologize, but four weeks of, so, our, our last the measurement the last measurement I had was four weeks after the campaign we had 37 newspaper articles, uh, which is quite a lot. Um, as I said, the the um, engagement on LinkedIn was extraordinary. It was actually our highest rated LinkedIn post from of all of uh, 2022, and we had I mean you know we we still had pandemic interest, so so it actually meant it was really quite outstanding. So there is. There is a lot of interest. Um, think the the old problem for us is the is the reach, right? Uh, I mean, within our 
within our fairly specialized groups, we, we get we get out a lot. But then to go beyond, to to really go down to to was often member state level and patient level, not not so good. But in terms, but if you ask me compared to other campaigns, this has done extremely well. Okay, thank you. Because it, the other question, the following question was uh, regarding what would be the target group? Because obviously LinkedIn was the most successful because it's the used by healthcare professionals, maybe the ones who are more aware to these type of uh, topics. And also related to the content of, of the of the message, maybe, I mean, of course it depends on what target do, do you want to go. Do you want to go to patient level, general population, parents, children, healthcare professionals, and so on. Uh, so also the language I think would need to be to be adapted. For example, I, I would not go uh, to the general population with the, the one sentence that was one million treatment years. Maybe they don't know what one million treatment years uh, boils down to. Um, so also goes to the, my next comment, which is uh, uh, PGU, of course, community pharmacies are uh, um, used to do campaigns, uh, especially on social media as well. So for sure we are uh, on to, uh, we usually share and retweet and, and uh, uh, share all the, the information um, that EMA produce, produces. Um, just asking not to be overlapping with other uh, campaigns, for example, with uh, uh, ECDC, with Dejecente, with, I mean, the, with the European Immunization Week. Um, I'm sure Dejecente has something uh, um, prepared already, especially they are focusing now on uh, HPV vaccination, um, so on cancer, prevent preventable cancer uh, vaccinations. And PGU as a, a coalition for vaccination co-chairs together with CPME and EFN. We are, of course, very welcome uh, and campaign on, on vaccination but we just think that we need to be targeting the real uh, population that we need to, to to achieve and also maybe we need to tweak the messages in the different uh, um, social media um, targets let's say um, that was my my comment thank you so um so uh, let me let maybe first um, because you, you mentioned the overlap with uh, DG Santé and ECDC, so I can reassure you actually on this we are working really closely together with them. Um, so whatever we do would actually slot in, uh, in it, it would, would fill a gap that they are, are not yet addressing. Um, and then I hear very clearly what you are saying, and I have to say actually that comes back to the need also to work together because um, I think. The insights you can provide as a as a group and you know from your organizations would actually really help us to um, to to target exactly who so or to define really who do we need to target define them together how can we get to to these people because in the end you know we at EMA we always will have a, a, a an over a general few but but we are not we are not uh, on the ground you are, you are on the ground and i think that's the insight that um would help would really make campaigns just so much more so much more powerful so um therefore i'd be i'd be delighted if if you were were part of such a campaign or and if we can actually gather exactly that information so that we are we are targeted we are not just doing uh we are not just spraying around Thank you very much, and, and I mean, I, w I was very pleased when, when we were discussing and Monica uh, suggested to come with this proposal. I think after the pandemic, I think it's great to be back and, and make these proposals. And uh, two things, um, regarding the, the vaccination one, I think it's very close, so I think it's great if we would be able to jump on that. And I support very much this idea of creating maybe a group of more interesting colleagues. I wonder because I think the, the point is that sometimes we put a lot of um, a lot of pressure on yourself as, as as contact points, and I wonder whether it's up to you as well, or if you want to involve colleagues from your organizations who are more into the communication departments, which maybe are also cap in a good position to provide a relevant input because they are really enhanced into how to use this tool, how to make it more. I don't know, it's up to you to decide, but I think I, I'm sure that uh, we haven't precluded this, but I'm sure Monica welcomes also to get access or, or to have in this group, not just uh, you as members. Then I think beyond the vaccination, I think I go back to the biosimilars and I think 
uh, you know, the biosimilars was very successful, as, as Monica said, and we didn't involve you. In a way, we did it in isolation. So I wonder, because the, 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 the need has been highlighted here, if we can plan at some point to go back and to do another one, first to identify what Rosa has said, where there is a need to uh, generate additional information, but if not, how we can, the information we have, how we can try to, to, to yeah, to, 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 to disseminate beyond what we have achieved so far because the need has been generated. So maybe we can plan about that as well. Um, and then just a question from Monica, because something which maybe is also very attractive to you, when we are talking about these campaigns, how, how is our approach to common, the use of common logos? Because also it's, it's something that we, we, we want to use all, only EMA logo, or we want to do it with the organization's logos, how we want to tackle that? I mean, we have had examples in the past where we basically have editable versions of, of uh, assets where you can, where we would then have, say, EMA logo and you can add the logo of your uh, organization. So that's that's definitely doable. Um, it, it, you, you will need to have the capacity to, to do that in-house because I think we, we would really struggle uh, producing material for every organization but if if we provide editable versions which we have done um, that should normally that should normally be quite quite quick Elena I need to go to the toilet so brief okay <laughs> <laughs> Elena have fun uh, in there Rosa so very quickly three things because we have had to to be out there and do communication particularly those of us that are involved in academic medicine uh, I, I am on LinkedIn, very active, as many of you know, but and I may get 6,000 views, 7,000 views. I assure you, 90% is all colleagues from the industry. They're not colleagues in the field and they're not patients. And most of the patients or the people are not going to read in English and get the information from vaccines from LinkedIn. That's one. Second, I'm leading uh, the WG for vaccines and I'm also... UFA, public health specialist, we have a problem with vaccines. So we cannot remain just on communication. We need a very aligned approach on branding, not just logos uh, or colors. Eh? And we need also a very structured approach on what the key messages are. I'm not going to say that we need an infodemic management campaign or strategy for the HCPWP, but think about it. I mean, we're already doing some things with WHO. We've done things with CDC and we've started to do some things with FDA. I think perhaps we need to also discuss infodemic management, particularly for vaccines. And also thankful to Ivana for reaching out because we're trying to do, we have a lot of events coming up with UFA and EFPC, so I can share with everyone. Uh, because there we have support from experts on Twitter and communication and so on. But we cannot, I mean, just saying you put out an image and it's passive, you're not answering questions, is a very... 1985 tool, so it, it is not sufficient at this point, particularly for vaccines. For biosimilars, I think looking back to 2015, I think the last meeting I was here was 2015, and there was superb work from the EU, and this is not well understood by HCP. So something very simple, like what they are, what is the difference, you know, for biologics, what the overview is, even the table that uh, Josie mentioned, something very simple perhaps can be produced quickly, and in every language, because one aspect is in these campaigns, I've never seen my national agency come on board or my national organization of public health come on board, share these campaigns or be involved in these campaigns. So it's an English message in the European Union and somebody has to follow up. So if you can engage member states or we can also advocate for that, if you like, it would be very helpful, I think. Thanks. So now, Rosa, you can, I think, go to the toilet in peace. Uh, my bladder is very grateful, <laughs> I think. Okay. My, thanks, thanks for the suggestion, Elena. Uh, anything else? Hopefully not. Okay. <laughs> so now I hand to Juan. Okay. So, um, so we are not uh, breaking for coffee, or yes? No, we can't. Okay. Okay. So maybe ju just then... Maybe as a follow-up action, just to close this, uh, shall we then send a call for expression of interest to participate on this group? Maybe let's, let's pilot with the vaccination uh, immunization day, and then we will more discuss for a longer term. Uh, would be the agreeable, agreeable, so we will send it in the table of actions. So thanks a lot, and we can move to the next topic, and um, we have the pleasure to continue with Monica. 
and Monica will introduce us to the uh, new EMA policy on multilingual um, multilinguism. And this is a topic which has been discussed a lot for many years, so it's good that we can give an update on which is the approach for the coming years. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. And, and as you can see, it's kind of it's almost a, a seamless transition from the last comment to the multilingual uh, policy. So um, we have a new multilingual, uh, so, no, I should say we have a multilingual policy on our website now published since the beginning of uh, January. Um, I would like to really state up front, there is no revolution. So this, what this policy actually does is really is explain what we are doing, um, how we are, um, how we are, uh, you know, what what kind of information we translate, what kind of information we don't translate, what our reasons are for for these various uh, decisions. Uh, it explains what information is available in the in uh, different languages, um, and also defines a little bit what priorities and criteria for translation are. And uh, finally, of course, we are here also um, in the end responding to recommendations from the European Ombudsman. So maybe with that, let's jump into the policy. So um, the policy defines what our pri priorities for translation are. So ultimately decisions on what content we translate are always taken on the basis of the impact and the relevance the information might have for our stakeholders and the public. So that means in practice that priority is always given to information on medicines targeted at patients, healthcare professionals, and the wider public. And then we also have uh, translations of some of the corporate information that's relevant for a broad audience. When we do translate, we do try to provide really equal treatment to all EU languages other than English. Although I have to say, sometimes we might actually give priority to certain languages where we know um, there is, say, less capacity um, in the in the national agencies to provide translations or so. So we we have we have done that that we say have prioritized, uh, say, certain languages in Eastern Europe. Uh, over over other languages, simply because also the the agencies there flagged up to us that it would be good if that they need some support. Good. I uh, can have the next slide, please. Yeah. So information about medicines on the EMA website. There is actually quite a lot of information available. So. I mean, as you know, all the product information for all centrally authorized medicines, including the package leaflet, is available on the website in all EU languages plus uh, Norwegian and Icelandic. Then the lay language overview for every centrally authorized medicine. So that's the that's the overview you see when you first go to the to the medicines page on our website. That's also translated in all EU languages. Um, so our Q and A is about refusals, refusals and withdrawals of applications for marketing authorizations and extensions of indication, and then also for certain major reviews of medicines, so-called referrals. We also have the information translated. Um, just a quick side remark: when it comes to um, information on veterinary medicines in all EU languages, that's no longer on our website, but it's now available on the veterinary medicine information website. That's uh, uh, an innovation that was introduced with the new veterinary uh, legislation. Um, Mumia, can you have the next slide? Great, thank you. Um, we have, so, um, technical information on EMA's work is available in English only. So what do we mean by that? Basically, our working language is, is English, and that means also a large proportion of the content on, of, on our website that's not medicine related, but that's say guidelines, uh, concept papers, etc. Uh, that is available only in English. Uh, we un so the assumption here is the, the working language of the pharmaceutical industry for who these materials really are, uh, are often in, in, in they, these materials are important for the work. So they operate in English. Um, therefore, we think by providing that material only in English, it is sufficient. Um, also, English is the language in which the standard terminology is available and used internationally. So I think we are not really deviating here much. And then also, 
when we published the information in English, and often it's information that's updated uh, very quickly or uh, constantly, but by having it only in English means we are just simply, we are consistent, we are, we are not introducing mistakes through translations. So that's for technical information. Um, Romeo, can I have the next slide? Um, when do we use EU languages in external comms? So, um, for ex we have a policy that all, inquiry, all inquiries to EMA can be received in any EU language, and then will also be responded to in that language in which they were received. Now, um, my team runs the press office. I have to admit that uh, we make a little exception simply because of the uh, uh, of the, the time span. We often have to respond really quickly. So journalists, when they have any urgent questions, they get a response back in English. Uh, then, if they if they really have problem understanding it, we can do something. But but that's that's just simply in order to ensure quick turnaround. Um, when we have public consultations, then in, contributions are always accepted in all EU languages. Um, when possible, we try to translate consultation documents that are not of a technical nature, as just discussed. Um, and then uh, also looking at audiovisual content. Here, we, I mean, especially for when we produce uh, material in lay language, we do try to have uh, at least subtitles in all EU languages uh, and or vo voiceovers, depending on, on, the kind of, uh, uh, on the kind of material. And you would find those both on YouTube, but I think also on our, on our uh, EMA website. Good. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, uh, one kind of... It, uh, one objective with the policy was also to make it more more prominent that we that we have translated information on where it is. So we have now a new web page um, that explains in all languages um, what this policy is about. The policy is translated, uh, and also this page then provides further information on on how we implement the multilingual approach and helps users to access certain translated content on our website via links and and other cues. So um, I would I would invite you to check out uh, that web page. At the moment, you can actually still find it very simply by going to our uh, to our homepage, and then click on the uh, on the slider that says New EMA. Um, new EMA multilingual policy. Great. And then can I have the next slide? So how did we develop this? Um, at the moment, the policy lists really the items that we published in, in official EU languages. But this is not a, I mean, I, I said, even though I started off by saying this is not a revolution, but of course, this is a list that we will update and that we also um, I think where we, in a way, internally, will always challenge each uh, ourselves to say, okay, actually, um, where can we provide more information? Where can we provide more translated information? We are, we are committed to further develop and improve our multilingual approach. Um, also, really, to make sure that information that is relevant not only to to the small set of uh, of technical uh, stakeholders that we have, but is uh, important for a wider public becomes available in in various EU languages. I mean, there are a lot of kind of organizational and administrative difficulties in in uh, dealing with um, with translations. But I mean, nevertheless, this is really it is our ambition, but it is not an ambition that um, will be immediately stepped up as part of the multilingual policy. But it's definitely something where we. Um, we were very willing to, to consider um, developing this further. So, thanks. Can I have the next slide, please? It should be the end. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. So, um, here I have much less questions for you, but I'm very happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica, for that. And, yeah, any questions or comments? Jose? Thank you. Um, I was wondering if the um, heads of medicine agencies 
whether they already have quite a lot of the EMA documents translated in their language to share it with their, their, their country. So I wonder if that already would eliminate a lot of work for you to begin with. Monica, uh, th thanks, Josie. I think first of all, it depends on the uh, it depends on the um, respective member states. So some member states translate a lot; others just simply don't have the capacity because they are often very very small agencies. Um, then we know that the content they normally would translate is is often news. So, for example. Uh, I mean, I can give you as an example, Italy. Italy translates all our uh, press announcements on medicines. So it's it's really, it's it's uh, available for, to Italians in their um, language. I think some, some of the Northern European countries also provide really um, ongoing translations. Then I think Germany does, but but you know, it's, it's still a bit, it's not across the board. Um, and I think in, and if where they do uh, provide translations, again, it is more about uh, medicines-related topics. So the corporate information that is really something I think we need to we need to come to a, a better better approach. Thanks. Any further comment? I think we also need to see this in the context of how everything is changing so fast. Uh, in terms, I mean, I, I already have a lot of features in my inbox that sometimes I receive uh, emails on that in which I'm not very proficient and, and it automatically translates. And I think this is changing a lot, the way that we provide information. And I think th this is factor in the, in the policy as well. Okay, maybe just, um, so if no further questions on this, thank you, Monica, for the update. I think it's important you're aware. Uh, just maybe to refer one of the comments on the chat from Christine Den from the European Heart uh, Network. I think it's, it's regarding the previous topic because basically they say that they realize on their experience that short YouTube clips and podcasts is perfect for patients because sometimes they don't prefer to, they prefer this that uh, rather than to read or uh, they prefer audiovisual. So I think maybe this is part of the discussion that we would like to have with all of you. Monica. Actually, on that note, just a little heads up, we, are, we will be publishing two short videos with Stefan, who has, uh, I think, now rushed off to the airport, uh, two very short one-minute explainers on biosimilars. So uh, we'll put those out soon and also to just simply check how they, how they will work. And Maria tells me that I think we, we will share them in, with this group. So. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for the note. Okay, so I think we can we can close this topic, and I think we are more or less in time. Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, maybe that just before we close, two two announcements. One is that um, um, you know we have a a database or a like a permanent call for expression of interest for patients for individuals to express their interest to be involved and to participate in EMA activities. And very often, even we go back to this database on individuals and pick up experts on, and that afterwards are involved in our work. And uh, we are aware that this was not enabled for healthcare professionals. So it is now enabled for healthcare professionals. So it means that not only patients, now healthcare professionals, even without any affiliation, can express their interest to, to be considered. Of course, there will be a screen afterwards in terms of conflict of interest, etc., and and of course our priorities and their expertise. But uh, it, it means we expand our capacity to get experts in any in any in any field. Ansela. Yes, Juan. Maybe because we received this email about this training, uh, a training on the for the DOI in context of the and I was. I, I signed up, but I don't know exactly what, what it is about. So if you, if you just clarified, because I don't know. Yes, I, I think this is the user testing of the new expert database. So everything here is a database. We have a stakeholder database, which is the one that Juan is uh, explaining about how we have organizations where you are all there as organizations. But for to, to date, we've just had uh, individual patients and carers who have been able to sign up. This has now been expanded to healthcare professionals in academia, and we'll share this link in the post mail. But what you've been asked to do uh, for some of you as uh, as experts here uh, is to do a, a kind of user testing of the new 
expert database, which is where you do your declaration of interest, your nomination form, etc. Because we're hoping that this tool will be ready this year. Um, and um, yeah, so your experience with that will be very helpful. Thank you. So it's two things, because the issue is that you are an expert. You are already in the expert database. And this, this um, what we are going to circulate is, is a feature on the website that anyone can express their interest to be considered to be included in this expert database. So it was only open to patients. Now it will be open to healthcare professionals. Yeah, we can show. In any case, we will send the, the link in the post mail. And maybe while we show, I just wanted to clarify because I think at the beginning of the day, we opened the, um, we called for expression of interest to be a PCWP observer to the healthcare professional working party in view of uh, uh, Kaisa uh, uh, being working with us now. Just to, to confirm that, I mean, there will be two observers. One is already Angela Bradshaw, and in order to support Angela in this position, we would like to have a second observer. Thank you. So we wait for this to be displayed. Ivana? Just to add on this, because I normally use the analogy that this this expert this database where you are now going to see how other healthcare professionals and academics can join is a bit like a waiting room, because you don't have to do a DOI, you don't have to submit the CV, but you are just expressing an interest on the activities of the agency, and by doing so, we will be able to reach out and say we have a particular activity. Would you be interested to become an expert and involved? It's also an opportunity for healthcare professionals and patients to receive information from the EMA. So just to, to give you this analogy that it's a bit of a more user friend in the case that you can get an expression, but you don't actually have to do extra steps for the OIs and so on. You will only do that if you would be then interested in a specific activity. Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. So what we have is, if Rumi, if you can scroll up to the top, just to show you, as you probably all know very well, go a little, all the way up to the top. So when you land on the EMA um, website and you go to Partners and Networks here, if you, you click on the healthcare professionals, as you can see, and then getting involved. So this is where you have all of your details, all of the access to um, registering as an organization. And if you scroll down, you'll see it's got all the, the it has getting involved by as representing an organization. And if you keep scrolling down, you'll get to the part that says getting involved as an individual expert. And now we have this form here that's bulleted involvement in EMA activities. And if you click on there, it opens up a registration form and you just click now healthcare professional uh, or academia. I think multiple options are possible. And if you, as you are eligible organization, you can click underneath the box saying organization as an eligible organization, and you have a drop down list to select. So this has been available to the patients for four or five years now. And uh, now it's currently available to you all as well. So we will put this in the in the post mail. Thank you. Yes, to just to clarify also that, I mean, we, we ask the member an affiliation, but it's not mandatory in order to be here. So it, it actually opens more. And, and one of the reasons why we have done that is because it, offer, it offers equal opportunities for participation for anyone uh, in the sense that, of course, we have direct access to cardiologists or uh, uh, different, different specialities because we have the networks and we have you. But in addition to that, we also want to open to everyone. So hopefully like that, we will have a more diverse representation of experts. Ivana. Just to add that, it's obvious, but just to state it, because sometimes the obvious is not so obvious, you don't yourselves have to go know into these forms and do it because you're already in the system. But it's you as amplifiers within your networks that you can let your members know that this is a possibility. Sorry if it's obvious, but I think it's just to clarify. Thank you. Yes, Jose. I just have a, um, a quick question. You know, when you fill in your declaration of interest, I just wondered if there could be 
included in that page somewhere or a link to it to to ask you which committees you are already involved in because um, I'm with Imprima and I kept getting letters saying you have to declare your declaration of interest as an Imprima member and I said I've already done it. So I just wondered if there would be sort of something that could connect to each other. Maria. Oh, we're hoping with the new expert database that all of these things will be, because currently we have, uh, it, it, there's quite a few different um, pieces of software that, that have to talk to each other. And now with a new database, it should be linking all of these things together, even including the travel, et cetera. So, um, so we're, hoping, we're hoping that the new database will uh, eliminate some of this duplication. But that is a very, yeah, I say it's a very relevant feedback and we will pass to colleagues. So hopefully, as Maria says, it can be addressed. Okay, so I think, uh, yeah, we are very much in time. We're yeah. very, very efficient. <laughs> Thanks that we didn't have a break. <laughs> so, sorry? Ah, yes, Christine, please. Yes, hello, thank you. A very quick question. Um, I was wondering if we um, advertise a bit for these um, personal patient groups or academic um, to fill in the, this form, um, what kind of uh, inquiries will they receive? Do they have to evaluate things? Do they have to fill in forms? Is it pretty much the same that we as uh, um, associations have to do? Could you say something on that, please? They will not, uh, actually, they, it's very easy to fill in the form. They, it's just very basic information about their personal details, contact details, and their area of expertise. And then, if we you are know, looking expertise in this area, then we will come back to them more in detail. But in principle, it's quite easy to register. No, that's, that was not the question, Juan. Uh, the question is, what kind of inquiries will they receive from you after they have registered? Any so kind of involvement. Um, any kind of involvement. They can be considered okay. as an expert for a discussion at the committee, or for a guidelines, for a SACS, for, for anything. And also they have the opportunity as well, as well to express their interest to receive our newsletters. I mean, there is a little bit of a, a all kind of activities. I mean, what okay. we want to say is that we want to be open to everyone, not just a selected club. Of course, we discuss more with you because we need to structure our work. But anyone can express the participation. The only thing is that, of course, when you are considered, then you will need to go through declaration of interest, etc. We, we have our process to ensure that the experts are first the expertise which is required, and then there is no conflict, and etc. etc. So I hope yes. I'm clear. Mm. It's open to anything. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Because this is something they are going to ask us. So what they can expect if they um, express the interest. Thank you. No, thanks a lot. The only thing, Christine, I think what we need to clarify is that the number of uh, the pool of experts is increasing so much that uh, we can. there is no guarantee that they will be involved. Some of them maybe are there and have not been involved. Others have. I mean, we have a little bit. For example, every year, just to give an example, on the training, we always go back to the to this database and we invite these people to come to our training. So uh, as much as possible, we involved, even if we, of course, uh, maintain a specific, a specific and special relation with the organization. Okay. So anything else? Okay. So just to remind you, uh, you know, every two years we do the satisfaction survey and this has been sent out, we will send a reminder in the table of actions and we encourage as much as possible for you to fill it in because it gives us some feedback in order to, to adapt our practices. And the last point, Ivana. The final request, You've, you have on your mailboxes today a nice email about the ICH drafting group work. So you have now two weeks to comment on the work of the drafting group and to provide your input on what you think about the principles, the ICH principles. So please have a look. Thank you. And, and also we wanted to update you. We are in discussions with the European Commission, which uh, we have agreed to uh, establish like a some kind of session webinar uh, immediately after that they publish their proposal for a 
revision of the pharmaceutical legislation in order to start discussing what implications it will have and how are the follow-ups. So I think we are just waiting to close the date because you know it has been postponed. So we had already agreed the date, but now the date is moving. So as soon as we have a date, we will let you know so that you can block your calendars. And I think what we are thinking is about two, three hour webinar. Yeah. And we will come back to you on that. Okay, so uh, Marco, Rosa, anything that you would like to say before we close? No, I think as it has been a very interesting uh, <clears throat> and intense uh, uh, meeting today preceded by the workshop yesterday. Personally, I'm very happy about the topic that we discussed and the level of discussion. My bladder is even happier now <laughs> because this <laughs> So really, really happy. Marco. Uh, just thank you very much. Safe travels to, to all of you and hopefully see you soon back again. Excellent. So, yeah. Answer. A comment. I want to say I really like this room. It feels cozier than the other one, mm -hmm. but okay. I don't know. It's a per maybe other people have other opinions, but I, I it feels cozier in a way. Yeah. No. We 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 definitely chose this room because considering that some colleagues are online, but even if they were not, I think we would be able to yes. accommodate almost everyone. So we take note of this. We'd like to thank you, everyone. I think it has been really useful and has been a little bit of a marathon after the, the shortages discussion. And we look forward to seeing you physically again in June. No.